Section 15 of Korea and Her Neighbors by Isabella L. Bird. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in April 2021. Chapter 13 Impending War Excitement at Chemul Po. Having heard nothing at all of public events during my long inland journey, and only a few rumours of unlocalised collisions between the Tonghaks, rebels, and the royal troops, the atmosphere of canards at Wonsan was somewhat stimulating, though I had already been long enough in Korea not to attach much importance to the stories with which the air was thick. One day it was said that the Tonghaks had gained great successes and had taken Gatling guns from the royal army, another that they had been crushed and their mysterious and ubiquitous leader beheaded, while the latest rumour before my departure was that they were marching in great force on Husan. Judging from the proclamation which they circulated, and which, while stating that they rose against corrupt officials and traitorous advisers, professed unswerving loyalty to the throne, it seemed credible that, if there were a throb of patriotism anywhere in Korea, it was in the breasts of these peasants. Their risings appeared to be free from excesses and useless bloodshed, and they confined themselves to the attempt to carry out their program of reform. Some foreign sympathy was bestowed upon them, because it was thought that the iniquities of misrule could go no further, and that the time was ripe for an armed protest on a larger scale than the ordinary peasant risings against intolerable exactions. But at the very moment when these matters were being discussed in one sun with not more than a languid interest, a formidable menace to the established order of things was taking shape, destined in a few days to cast the tonghaks into the shade, and concentrate the attention of the world on this insignificant peninsula. Leaving Wonsan by steamer on 17th June and arriving at Fusan on the 19th, I was not surprised to find a Japanese gunboat in the harbour, and that 220 Japanese soldiers had been landed from the Higomaru that morning and were quartered in the Buddhist temples on the hill, and that the rebels had cut the telegraph wires between Fusan and Seoul. Among the few Europeans at Fusan there was no uneasiness. The Japanese, with their large mercantile colony there, have considerable interests to safeguard, and nothing seemed more natural than the course they took. A rumour that Japanese troops had been landed at Chemulpo was quite disregarded. On arriving at Chemulpo, however, early on the morning of the 21st, a very exciting state of matters revealed itself. A large fleet, six Japanese ships of war, the American flagship, two French, one Russian and two Chinese, were lying in the outer harbour. The limited accommodation of the inner harbour was taxed to its utmost capacity. Japanese transports were landing troops, horses and war material in steam launches. Junks were discharging rice and other stores for the commissariat department. Coolies were stacking it on the beach, and the movement by sea and land was ceaseless. Visitors from the shore, excited and agitated, brought a budget of astounding rumours, but confessed to being mainly in the dark. On landing, I found the deadly dull port transformed. The streets resounded to the tread of Japanese troops in heavy marching order. Trains of mat and forage carts blocked the road. Every house in the main street of the Japanese settlement was turned into a barrack and crowded with troops. Rifles and accoutrements gleamed in the balconies. Crowds of Koreans, limp and dazed, lounged in the streets or sat on the knolls, gazing vacantly at the transformation of their port into a foreign camp. Only two hours had passed since the first of the troops landed, and when I visited the camp with a young Russian officer, there were 1,200 men under canvas in well-ventilated bell tents, 
holding twenty each, with matted floors and drainage trenches, and dinner was being served in lacquer boxes. Stables had been run up, and the cavalry and mountain guns were in the centre. The horses of the mountain battery train, serviceable animals, fourteen hands high, were in excellent condition, and were equipped with pack saddles of the latest Indian pattern. They were removing shot and shell for Seoul from the Japanese consulate with two hundred men and one hundred horses, and it was done almost soundlessly. The camp, with its neat streets, was orderly, trim, and quiet. In the town, sentries challenged passers-by. Every man looked as if he knew his duty and meant to do it. There was no swagger. The mannequins, well armed and serviceably dressed, were obviously in Korea for a purpose which they meant to accomplish. What that purpose was, was well concealed under color of giving efficient protection to Japanese subjects in Korea, who were said to be imperiled by the successes of the Tonghaks. The rebellion in southern Korea was exciting much alarm in the capital. Such movements, though on a smaller scale, are annual spring events in the peninsula, when in one or other of the provinces the peasantry, driven to exasperation by official extortions, rise, and with more or less violence, occasionally fatal, drive out the offending Mandarin. Punishment rarely ensues. The king sends a new official, who squeezes and extorts in his turn with more or less vigour, until, if he also passes bearable limits, he is forcibly expelled, and things settle down once more. This Tonghak, Oriental or National movement, though lost sight of in presence of more important issues, was of greater moment, as being organized on a broader basis, so as to include a great number of adherents in Seoul and the other cities, and with such definite and reasonable objects that at first I was inclined to call its leaders armed reformers rather than rebels. At that time there was no question as to the royal authority. The Tonghak proclamation began by declaring in respectful language loyal allegiance to the king, and went on to state the grievances in very moderate terms. The Tonghaks asserted, and with undoubted truth, that officials in Korea, for their own purposes, closed the eyes and ears of the king to all news and reports of the wrongs inflicted on his people. That ministers of state, governors and magistrates were all indifferent to the welfare of their country and were bent only on enriching themselves, and that there were no checks on their rapacity. That examinations, the only avenues to official life, were nothing more than scenes of bribery, barter and sale, and were no longer tests of fitness for civil appointment. That officials cared not for the debt into which the country was fast sinking. That they were proud, vainglorious, adulterous, avaricious. That many officials receiving appointments in the country lived in Seoul. That they flatter and fawn in peace, and desert and betray in times of trouble. The necessity for reform was strongly urged. There were no expressions of hostility to foreigners, and the manifesto did not appear to take any account of them. The leader, whose individuality was never definitely ascertained, was credited with ubiquity and supernatural powers by the common people, as well as with the ability to speak both Japanese and Chinese, and it was evident from his measures, forethought, the disposition of his forces, and some touches of Western strategic skill, that he had some acquaintance with the modern art of war. His followers, armed at first with only old swords and halberds, had come to possess rifles, taken from the official armories and the defeated royal troops. For in the midst of the thousand wild rumours which were afloat, it appeared certain that the king sent several hundred soldiers against the Tonghaks under a general who, on his way to attack their camp, raised and armed three hundred levies, 
who, in the engagement which followed, joined the rebels and turned upon the king's troops, that three hundred of the latter were killed and that the general was missing. This, following other successes, the deposition of several important officials and the rumoured march on Seoul had created great alarm, and the king was supposed to be prepared for flight. But the events of the two or three days before I landed at Chemulpo threw the local disturbance into the shade, and it is only with the object of showing with what an excellent pretext for interference the Tonghaks had furnished the Japanese, and I recall this petty chapter of what is now ancient history. The questions vital to Korea and of paramount diplomatic importance were, what is the object of Japan? Is this an invasion? Is she here as an enemy or a friend? Six thousand troops provisioned for three months had been landed. Fifteen of the Nippon Yuzen Kaisha's steamers had been withdrawn from their routes to act as transports. The Japanese had occupied the Gap, a pass on the Seoul Road, and Mapu, the river port of the capital, and with guns and in considerable force had established themselves on Nam Han, a wooded hill above Seoul, from which position they commanded both the palace and capital. All these movements were carried out with a suddenness, celerity, and freedom from hitch, which in their military aspects were worthy of the highest praise. To any student of Far Eastern politics it must have been apparent that this skilful and extraordinary move on the part of Japan was not made for the protection of her colonies in Chemulpo and Seoul, nor yet against Korea. It has been said in various quarters, and believed, that the Japanese ministry was shaky and had to choose between its own downfall and a foreign war. This is a complete sophism. There can be no question that Japan had been planning such a movement for years. She had made accurate maps of Korea and had secured reports of forage and provisions, measurements of the width of rivers and the depth of fords, and had been buying up rice in Korea for three months previously, while even as far as the Tibetan frontier, Japanese officers in disguise had gauged the strength and weakness of China, reporting on her armies on paper, and, in fact, on her dummy guns, and antique honeycombed carronades, and knew better than the Chinese themselves how many men each province could put into the field, how drilled and how armed, and they were acquainted with the infinite corruption and dishonesty, combined with a total lack of patriotism, which nullified even such commissariat arrangements as existed on paper, and rendered it absolutely impossible for China to send an army efficiently into the field, far less sustain it during a campaign. To all appearance, Japan had completely outwitted China in Korea, and a panic prevailed among the Chinese. Thirty ladies of the households of the Chinese resident and consul embarked for China on the appearance of the Japanese in Seoul, and eight hundred Chinamen left Chemulpo on the day I arrived, the consternation in the Chinese colony being so great that even the market gardeners, who have a monopoly of a most thriving trade, fled. I never before saw the Chinamen otherwise than aggravatingly cool, collected, and master of the situation, but on that June day he lost his head, and, frenzied by race hatred and pecuniary loss, was transformed into a shouting barbarian, not knowing what he would be at. The Chinese inn where I spent the day was one centre of the excitement, and each time that I came in from a walk or received a European visitor, a number of the employees, usually most quiet and reticent, huddled into my room with faces distorted by anxiety, asking what I had heard, what was going to be, whether the Chinese army would be there that night, whether the British fleet was coming to help them, etc., 
and even my Chinese servant, a most excellent fellow, was beside himself, muttering in English through clenched teeth, I must kill, kill, kill. Meanwhile, the dwarf battalions, a miracle of rigid discipline and good behavior, were steadily tramping to Seoul, where matters then, and for some time afterwards, stood thus. The king was in his secluded palace, and that which still posed as a government had really collapsed. Mr. Hillier, the English consul-general, was in England on leave, and the acting consul-general, Mr. Gardner, CMG, had only been in Korea for three months. The American minister was a newer man still. The French and German consuls need hardly be taken into account, as they had few, if any, interests to safeguard. Mr. Weber, the able and cautious diplomatist who had represented Russia for nine years and had the confidence of the whole foreign community, had been appointed chargé d'affaires at Peking and had left Seoul in the previous week. There remained, therefore, facing each other, Otori-san, the Japanese ambassador to Peking, who was in Korea on a temporary mission, and Yuan, a military mandarin who had been for some years Chinese resident in Seoul, a man entrusted by the Chinese emperor with large powers, who was credited by foreigners with great force, tact, and ability, and who was generally regarded as the power behind the throne. I had frequently seen Otori-san in the early months of the year, a Japanese of average height, speaking English well, wearing European dress as though born to it, and sporting white shoulder-of-mutton whiskers. He lounged in drawing-rooms, making trivial remarks to ladies, and was remarkable only for his insignificance. I believe he made the same impression, or want of impression, at Peking. But circumstances, or stringent orders from Tokyo, had transformed Mr. Otori. Whether he had worn a mask previously, I know not, but he showed himself rough, vigorous, capable, a man of action, unscrupulous, and not only clever enough to outwit Yuan in a difficult and hazardous game, but everybody else. In the afternoon of that memorable day at Chemulpo, the vice-consul called on me and warned me that I must leave Korea that night, and the urgency and seriousness of his manner left me no doubt that he was acting on information which he was not at liberty to divulge. I had left my travelling gear at Wonsan in readiness for an autumn journey, and was going to Seoul that night for a week to get my money and civilised luggage before going for the summer to Japan. It was a serious blow. Other Europeans advised me not to be deported, but it is one of my travelling rules never to be a source of embarrassment to British officials, and, supposing the crisis to be an acute one, I reluctantly yielded, and that night, with two English fellow sufferers, left Chemulpo in the Japanese steamer Higomaru, bound for ports in the Gulf of Pechili, which cul-de-sac would have proved a veritable lion's mouth to her had hostilities been as imminent as the vice-consul believed them to be. I had nothing but the clothing I wore, a heavy tweed suit, and the mercury was eighty degrees, and after paying my passage to Chefu, the first port of call, I had only four cents left. It was four months before I obtained either my clothes or my money. End of section 15、section 16 of Korea and Her Neighbors by Isabella L. Bird. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in April 2021. Chapter 14 Deported to Manchuria. Though I landed at Chefu in heavy tweed clothing, I was obliged to walk up the steep hill to the British consulate, though the mercury was 84 degrees in the shade, because I had no money with which to pay for a jinrikisha. 
my reflections were anything but pleasant. My passport and letters of introduction, both private and official, were in Seoul. My travelling dress was distinctly shabby, and I feared that an impecunious person without introductions, and unable to prove her identity, might meet with a very cool reception. I experienced something of the anxiety and timidity which are the everyday lot of thousands, and I have felt a far tenderer sympathy with the penniless, especially the educated penniless, ever since. I was so extremely uncomfortable that I hung about the gate of the British consulate for some minutes before I could summon up courage to go to the door and send in a torn address of a letter which was my only visiting card. I thought, but it may have been fancy, that the Chinese who took it eyed me suspiciously and contemptuously. The sudden revulsion of feeling which followed I cannot easily forget. Mr. Clement Allen, our justly popular consul, met me with a warm welcome. I needed no proof of identity or anything else. He only desired to know what he could do for me. My anxiety was not quite over, for I had to make the humiliating confession that I needed money, and immediately he took me to Messrs. Ferguson and Co., who transact banking business, and asked them to let me have as much as I wanted. An invitation to Tiffin followed, and Lady O'Connor, and the wife of the Spanish minister at Peking, who was staying at the consulate, made up a bundle of summer clothing for me, and my deportation enriched me with valued friendships. Returning in a very different frame of mind to the Higomaru, I went on in her in severe heat to the mouth of the Peho River in sight of the Taku Forts, and after rolling on its muddy surges for two days, proceeded to Nuchwang in Manchuria, reaching the mouth of the Liao River in five days from Chemulpo. Rain was falling, and a more hideous and disastrous-looking country than the voyage of two hours up to the port revealed I never saw. The Liao, which has a tremendous tide and strong current, and is thick with yellow mud, is a high water nearly on a level with the adjacent flats, of which one sees little, except some mud forts on the left bank of the river, which are said to be heavily armed with crop guns, and an expanse of mud and reeds. Of the mud-built Chinese city of Ying Tzu, a military camp known as New Chuang, though the real New Chuang is a derelict port thirty miles up the Liao, nothing can be seen above the mud bank but the curved, tile roofs of yamens and temples, though it is a city of sixty thousand souls, the growth of its population having kept pace with its rapid advance in commercial importance since it was opened to foreign trade in 1860. Several British steamers with big Chinese characters on their sides were at anchor in the tideway, and the river sides were closely fringed with upriver boats and sea-going junks, of various picturesque builds and colours from southern China, steamers and junks alike waiting not only for cargoes of the small beans for which Manchuria is famous, but for the pressed bean cake, which is exported in enormous quantities to fertilise the sugar plantations and hungry fields of South China. There is a bund, and along and behind it is the foreign settlement, occupied by about forty Europeans. The white buildings of the Chinese imperial maritime customs, the houses of the staff, the hongs of two or three foreign merchants, and the British consular buildings may be said to constitute the settlement. It has the reputation of being one of the kindliest and friendliest in the Far East, and the fact that the river closes annually about the 20th of November for about four months, and that the residents are thrown entirely on their own resources and on each other, only serves to increase that interdependence which binds this and similarly isolated communities so strongly together. I was most kindly welcomed at the English consulate, then and on my return, and have most pleasant remembrances of Nuchwang, its cordial kindness and cheerful bond, 
and breezy blue skies but at first sight it is a dreary solitary looking place of mud and muddy waters forever swallowing large slices of the land and threatening to engulf it altogether peas really beans are its chief raison d'etre and their ups and downs in price its mild sensations pea boats long and narrow with matting roofs and one huge sail bring down the beans from the interior and mills working night and day express their oil which is as good for cooking as for burning the viceroyalty of manchuria in which i spent the next two months is interesting as in some ways distinct from china besides having a prospective interest in connection with russia lying outside of the great wall it has a population of several distinct and mixed races manchus tartars gilyaks tungusi solons dors and chinese along with these must be mentioned about thirty thousand korean families the majority of whom have left korea since eighteen sixty eight in consequence of political disturbance and official exactions the facts that the dynasty which has ruled china by right of conquest since sixteen forty four is a manchu dynasty and that it imposed the shaven forehead and the pigtail on all chinese men successfully while it absolutely failed to prevent the women from crippling their feet though up to this day no woman with golden lilies crushed feet is allowed to enter the imperial palace naturally turn attention to this viceroyalty which in point of its area of three hundred eighty thousand square miles is larger than austria and great britain and ireland put together while its population is estimated at from eighteen to twenty million only thus it offers a vast field for emigration from the congested provinces of northern china and chinese immigrants are steadily flocking in from shantung chili and shenxi so that southern manchuria at this time is little behind the inner provinces of china in density of population it is different in the northern province where a cold climate and vast stretches of forest render agriculture more difficult if it had not been for the war and its attendant complications i had purposed to travel through it from northern korea but it is unsettled at all times the majority of its immigrants consists of convicts fugitive criminals soldiers who have left the colors and gold and ginseng hunters there is something almost comical about some of the doings of this unpromising community it comprises large organized bands of mounted brigands well led and armed who do not hesitate to come into collision with the imperial troops frequently coming of victors and at times as when i was in mukden wresting forts from their hands during the taiping rebellion when the chinese troops were withdrawn from manchuria these bands carried havoc and terror everywhere and seizing upon towns and villages ruled them by right of conquest in recent years the government has decided to let voluntary colonists settle in the northern provinces and has even furnished them with material assistance still things are bad and the brigands have come to be regarded as a necessary evil and are arranged with they are not scrupulous as to human life and when they catch a rich merchant from the south they send an envoy to his guild with a claim for ransom strengthened by the threat that if it is not forthcoming in so many days the captive's head will be cut off winter when the mud is frozen hard is the only time for the transit of goods by land and long trains of mule carts may then be seen a hundred or more together starting from Nuchwang, mukden and other southern cities each carrying a small flag which denotes that a suitable blackmail has been paid to an agent of the brigand chiefs and that they will not be robbed on the journey later when i was on the siberian frontier of manchuria the brigands were in great force and having been joined by half-starved deserters from the chinese army were harrying the country 
and the peasants were flying in terror from their farms. Among the curious features of Manchurian brigandage is that its virulence rises or falls with good or bad harvests, inundations, etc. For many of the usually respectable peasant farmers, in times of flood and scanty crops, join the robber bands, returning to their honest avocations the next season. In spite, however, of this terrorism in the northeast, Manchuria is one of the most prosperous of the Chinese viceroyalties, and its foreign trade is assuming annually increasing importance. Footnote. Taking the port of Nuchwang, through which, with certain exceptions, all exports of native produce and imports of foreign merchandise and Chinese productions pass, in 1871, 16 steamers and 203 sailing vessels entered the port, with a total tonnage of 65,933 tons. In 1881, 114 steamers and 218 sailing vessels, with a tonnage of 159,098 tons. And in 1891, 372 steamers and 61 sailing vessels, with a total tonnage of 334,709 tons. In the same period, British tonnage had increased from 38.6 of the whole to 58% of the whole. In 1871, German tonnage nearly equaled British, being 37.6 of the whole, but it had declined in 1891 to 28% of the whole. End footnote. I was disappointed to find that the Manchus, or Tartars, differ little in appearance from the race which they have subdued. The women, however, are taller, comelier, and more robust in appearance, as may be expected from their retaining the natural size and shape of their feet, and not only their coiffure, but their costume is different, the Manchu women wearing sleeveless dresses from the throat to the feet, over underdresses with wide embroidered sleeves. With some exceptions, they are less secluded than their Chinese sisters and have an air of far greater freedom. Most of the Manchu customs have disappeared along with the language, which is only spoken in a few remote valleys and is apparently only artificially preserved because the ruling dynasty is Manchu. It is only those students who are aspirants for literary degrees and high office in the viceroyalty who are obliged to learn it. People of pure Manchu race are chiefly met with in the north. Manchus, as kinsmen of the present imperial dynasty, enjoy various privileges. Every male adult, as soon as he can string a short and remarkably inflexible bow, no easy task, becomes a banner man, that is, he is enrolled in one of eight bodies of irregulars called banners from their distinctive flags, and from that time receives one tail, now about three shillings, per month, increased to from five to seven tails a month when on active service. These banner men, as a rule, are not specially reputable characters. They gamble, hang about yamens for odd bits of work, in hope of permanent official employment, and generally sublet to the Chinese the lands which they receive from the government. It is a singular anomaly that bows and arrows are relied upon as a means of defense in an empire which buys rifles and Krupp guns. Later, in Peking, which was supposed to be threatened by the Japanese armies, it was intended to post bannermen with bows and arrows at the embrasures of the wall, and on the Peking and Tung Cho road I met twenty carts carrying up loads of these primitive weapons for the defense of the capital. Bow and arrow drill is one of the most amusing of the many military medieval sites of China. The Chinese bannermen are descendants of those Chinese who, in the 17th century, espoused the cause of the Manchu conquerors of China. The whole military force of the three provinces of the Viceroyalty is 280,000 men. 
Tartar garrisons and Tartar cities exist in many of the great provincial cities of China, and as the interests of these troops are closely bound up with those of the present Tartar dynasty, their faithfulness is relied upon as the backbone of imperial security. From its history and its audacious and permanent conquest of its gigantic neighbor, its mixed population and numerous aboriginal tribes, its mineral and agricultural wealth, and a certain freedom and breeziness which constitute a distinctive feature, Manchuria is a very interesting viceroyalty, and the two months which I spent in it gave it a strong hold upon me. Mud is a great feature of New Chuang, perhaps the leading feature for some months of the year, during which no traffic by road is possible, and the Bund is the only practicable walk. The night I arrived, rain began, and continued with one hour's cessation for five days and nights, for much of the time coming down like a continuous thunder shower. The atmosphere was steamy and hazy, and the mercury by day and night was pretty stationary at 78 degrees. About 8.46 inches of rain fell on those days. The barometer varied from 29 degrees to 29.3 degrees. Afterwards, when the rain ceased for a day, the heat was nearly unbearable. Of course, no boat's crew would start under such circumstances. Rumours of an extensive inundation came down the river, but these and all others of purely local interest gave place to an intense anxiety as to whether war would be declared and what the effect of war would be on the great trading port of New Chuang. End of section 16、section、seventeen of Korea and Her Neighbors by Isabella L. Bird This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Awaii in May 2021. Chapter 15 A Manchurian Deluge, A Passenger Cart, An Accident it surprised me much to find that only one foreign resident had visited Mukden, which is only 120 miles distant by a road which is traversable in winter and is accessible by river during the summer and autumn in from 8 to 10 days. I left New Chuang on the 3rd of July, and though various circumstances were unpropitious, reached Mukden in 8 days being able to avoid many of the windings of the Liao by sailing over an inundation. The kindly foreign community lent me necessaries for the journey, but even with these the hold of a pea-boat was not luxurious. My camp-bed took up the greater part of it, and the roof was not much above my head. The descent into the hold and the ascent were difficult, and when wind and rain obliged me to close the front, it was quite dark, cockroaches swarmed, and the smell of the bilge water was horrible. I was very far from well when I started, and in two days was really ill, yet I would not have missed the special interest of that journey for anything, or its solitude, for Wang's limited English counted for nothing and involved no conversational effort. For some distance above New Chuang or Ying Tzu, as far as the real New Chuang, there is a complication of muddy rivers hurrying through vast reed beds, the resort of wild fowl, with here and there a mud bank with a mud hovel or two upon it. At that time, reed beds and partially inundated swamps stretched away nearly to the horizon, which is limited in the far distance by the wavy blue outline of some low hills. We ran up the river till the evening of the second day before a fair wind, and then were becalmed on a reedy expanse swarming with mosquitoes. The mercury was at 89 degrees in the hold that night. I had severe fever, with racking pains in my head, back, and limbs, and in the morning the stamping of the junkmen to and fro, along the narrow strip of deck outside the roof, was hardly bearable. Wong had used up the ample supply of water, 
and there was nothing wherewith to quench thirst but the brown thick water of the liao the tea made with which resembled pea soup on the morning of the third day it began to rain and blow and for the next awful four days the wind and rain never ceased the oiled paper which had been tacked over the roof of the boat was torn into strips by the violence of the winds which forced the rain through every chink i lay down that night with the mercury at eighty degrees woke feeling very cold but though surprised fell asleep again woke again much colder feeling as if my feet were bandaged together extricated myself with difficulty struck a light and got up into six inches of a mixture of bilge water and rain water with an overpowering stench in or on which all things were sunk or floating wondered again at being so very cold found the temperature at eighty four degrees and that i had been sleeping under a ringing sheet in soaked clothing and on soaked sacking under a soaked mosquito net and that there was not a dry article in the hold for the next three days and nights things remained in the same condition and though i was really ill i had to live in wet clothing and drink the liquid cholera of the flood all the wells being submerged telegrams later in the english papers announced great floods in manchuria but of the magnitude of the inundation which destroyed for that season the magnificent crops of the great fertile plain of the liao and swept away many of its countless farming villages only the experience of sailing over it could give any idea in that miserable night there were barkings of dogs shouts of men mewings of cats and general noises of unrest and in the morning of the village of pieng do opposite to which we had moored the evening before only one house and a barn remained which were shortly carried away many of the people had escaped in boats and the remainder with their fowls dogs and cats were in the spreading branches of a large tree although the mast of my boat was considerably in the way and it was difficult to make fast i succeeded in rescuing the whole menagerie and in transferring it in two trips to a village on the other side which was then five feet above the water we had reached the most prosperous region of manchuria a plain sixty miles in length of deep rich alluvial soil bearing splendid crops the most lucrative of which are the bean the oil from which is the staple export of the country the opium poppy and tobacco the great and small millet wheat barley melons and cucumbers cover the ground mulberry trees for the silkworm surround the farmhouses and the great plain is an idyll of bounteousness and fertility of all this not a trace remained except in a few instances the tops of the eight feet millet which supplies the people not only with food but with fuel and fodder for their animals the river bank burst during the night and the waters were raging into the plain from which i missed many a brown-roofed village which the evening before stood among its willow and poplar trees at eleven a fair wind sprang up junks began to move and my boatmen who had talked of returning untied and moved too after an exciting scene at a bend where the river leaping like a rapid thumped the junks against the opposite shore we passed one wrecked village after another bits of walls of houses alone standing the people and their fowls were in the trees the women clung to their fowls as much as to their babies dugouts scows and a few junks mine among them were busy saving life and we took three families and their fowls to showa ku a large junk port where a number of houses were still standing these families had lost all their household goods and gods as well as mules pigs and dogs on our way we sailed into a farmyard to try to get some eggs and the junk not replying to her helm thumped one of the undermined walls down it was a large farmhouse and full of refugees 
the water was three feet deep in the rooms naked children were floating about in tubs and the women looking resigned sat on the tables the men said that it was the last of four houses and that they might as well be dead for they had lost all their crops and their beasts a fearful sight presented itself at showaku there the river indefinite as it had previously been disappeared altogether and the whole country was a turbulent muddy sea bounded on the east by a range of hills and to the north and south limitless under it lay all the fruits of the tireless industry and garden cultivation of a large and prosperous population and the remorseless waters under the influence of a gale were rolling in muddy surges crested with tawny foam over the fast dissolving homes on this vast flood we embarked to shorten the distance and sailed with three reefs in the sail for thirteen miles over it till we were brought up by an insurmountable obstacle in the shape of a tremendous rush of water where a bank had given way there we were compelled to let go two anchors in the early afternoon the wind had become foul and the rain which fell in torrents was driven almost horizontally nothing that suggested human life was in sight it might have been the deluge for the windows of heaven were opened there were a muddy rolling sea and a black sky dark with tremendous rain and the foliage of trees with submerged trunks was alone suggestive of even vegetable life and of the villages which had been destroyed by the devouring waters in thirteen miles just one habitation remained standing a large handsome brick house with entrance arch quadrangle curved roofs large farm buildings and many servants houses some of which were toppling and others were submerged up to their roofs there was a lookout on the principal roof and he hailed us but as there were several scows about enough to save life i disregarded him and we sailed on into the tempestuous solitude where we anchored the day darkened slowly into night the junk rolled with short plunging rolls the rain fell more tremendously than ever and the strong wind sweeping through the rigging with a desolate screech only just overpowered the clatter on the roof i was ill the seas we shipped drowned the charcoal and it was impossible to make tea or arrowroot the rain dripped everywhere through the roof my lamp spluttered and went out and could not be relighted bedding and clothing were soaked my bed stood in the water the noise was deafening never in all my journeys have i felt so solitary i realized that no other foreigner was traveling in manchuria that there was no help in illness and that there was nothing to be done but lie there in saturated clothes till things took a turn for the better and so they did by eight the next morning the scene was changed the sky was blue and cloudless there was a cool north wind and the waste of water dimpled and glittered the broken sparkle of its mimic waves suggesting the ocean after a destructive storm has become a calm after sailing over broad blue water all day and passing islands on which the luckier villages were still standing towards evening we sailed into a village of large farmhouses and made fast to the window bars of one of them which being of brick had not suffered greatly eleven of the farms had disappeared and others were in process of disappearing the gardens farmyards and open spaces were under five feet of water the surface of which was covered by a bubbly scum the horses and cattle were in the rooms of the brick houses where many human beings had taken refuge a raft made of farming implements ferried the people among the few remaining dwellings at that farm the skipper brought a quantity of rice for his family and by a lovely moonlight we sailed over the drowned country to his village the flood currents were strong and when we got there we were driven against two undermined houses and knocked them down 
afterwards drifting into a road with fine trees which entangled the mast and sail, and our stern bumped down the wall of the road, and the current carried us into a square of semi-submerged houses, and eventually we got into the skipper's garden, and saw his family mounted on tables and chairs on the top of the kang. Two uneventful days followed. The boatmen were in ceaseless dread of pirates, and I was so ill that I felt I would rather die than make another effort. Arriving within three miles of Mukden, Wong engaged a passenger cart, a conveyance of the roughest description, which is only rendered tolerable by having its back, sides and bottom padded with mattresses, and I was destitute of everything. Nothing can exaggerate the horrors of an unameliorated Chinese cart on an infamous road. Down into ruts two feet deep, out of which three fine mules could scarcely extricate us, over hillocks and big gnarled roots of trees, through quagmires and banked ditches, where, in dread of the awful jerk produced by the mules making a non-simultaneous jump up the farther side, I said to myself, this is my last hour, getting a blow on my head which made me see a shower of sparks, so I entered the gate of the outer wall of beaten clay, one and a half miles in circuit, which surrounds the second city of the empire. Then, through a quagmire out of which we were dragged by seven mules, I bruised, breathless, and in great pain, and up a bank where the cart turned over, pulled the mules over with it, and rolled down a slight declivity, I found myself in the roof with the cameras on the top of me and my right arm twisted under me, a Chinese crowd curious to see the foreign devil a vague impress of disaster in my somewhat dazed brain, and Wong raging at large. Then followed a shady compound ablaze with flowers, a hearty welcome at the house of Dr. Ross, the senior missionary of the Scotch U.P. Church, sweet home-like rooms in a metamorphosed Chinese house, a large shady bedroom replete with comforts, the immediate arrival of Dr. Christie, the medical missionary, who pronounced my arm-bone splintered and the tendons severely torn and placed the limb in splints, and a time of kind and skilled nursing by Mrs. Ross, and of dreamy restfulness, in which the horrors of the hold of the pea-boat and of the dark and wind-driven flood only served to emphasize the comfort and propitiousness of my surroundings. End of section 17 Section 18 of Korea and Her Neighbors by Isabella L. Bird. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in May 2021. Chapter 16 Mukden and its Missions. Mukden stands at an altitude of 160 feet above the sea, in latitude 41 degrees 51 minutes north and longitude 123 degrees 37 minutes east, in the centre of an immense alluvial plain, bearing superb crops and liberally sprinkled with farming villages embowered in wood, a wavy line of low blue hills at a great distance limiting the horizon. It is three miles from the Hun Ho, a tributary of the Liao, and within its outer wall idles along the silvery Xiao Ho, or small river, with a long bund affording a delightful promenade and an airy position for a number of handsome houses, the residences of missionaries and mandarins, with stately outer and inner gates, through which glimpses are obtained of gardens and flowering plants and pots. This city of 260,000 inhabitants, owing to its connection with the reigning dynasty, is the second city officially in the empire, and the Peking boards, with one exception, are nominally duplicated here. Hence, it not only has an army of Chinese and Tartar officials of all grades, but a large resident population of retired and expectant mandarins, 
living in handsome houses and making a great display in the streets. There is an incessant movement of mule carts, the cabs of Mukden, with their superb animals and their blue canopies covering both mule and driver, official mule carts driven at a trot, with four or more outriders with white hats and red plumes, private carts belonging to young Mandarin swells, who give daily entertainments at a restaurant on the Bund, Mandarins on horseback with runners clearing the way, carts waiting for lotus viewers, tall, big-footed women promenading with their children, their hair arranged in loops on silver frames and decorated with flowers, hospital patients on stretchers and in chairs, men selling melons and candies, and beggars who by blowing through a leaf imitate the cry of nearly every bird. Then, in the summer evenings, when the mercury has fallen to eighty degrees, the servants of rich men bring out splendid ponies and mules and walk them on the bund, and there come the crowds to stare at the foreigners and hang round their gates. The presence of well-dressed women is a feature rare in the East. Up to the war, people were polite and friendly, but progress was difficult and the smell of garlic strong. At night the dogs bark, guns are fired, drums and gongs are beaten, and the clappers of the watchman rival each other in making night hideous. All this life lies between the outer wall and the lofty quadrangular inner wall, three miles in circuit, built of brick, flanked by lofty towers, and pierced by eight gates protected by lofty brick bastions. This wall, on which three carriages could drive abreast, protects the commercial and official part of the city, which is densely crowded. Mukden, besides being a great grain emporium, being the centre of the Chinese fur trade, which attracts buyers from all parts of the world. Fine streets, though full of humps and quagmires, divide the city into nine wards or quarters, the central quarter being imperial property and containing a fine palace with much decorative yellow tiling, the examination hall, and a number of palaces and yamens, all solidly built. To my thinking, no Chinese city is so agreeable as Mukden. The Tartar capital is free from that atmosphere of decay which broods over Peking. Its wide streets are comparatively clean. It is regularly built, and its fine residences are well kept up. It is a busy place, and does a large and lucrative trade, especially in grains, beans, and furs. It has various industries, which include the tanning and dressing of furs and the weaving of silk stuffs. Its bankers and merchants are rich, and it has great commercial as well as some political importance. As the old capital of Manchuria and the abode of the prince ancestors of the family which was placed on the Chinese throne in 1644, it has special privileges, among which are ministre de parade, nominally holding the same rank as the actual ministers in Peking. Near it are the superb tombs of the ancestors of the present emperor, on which grand avenues of trees converge, bordered by colossal stone animals after the fashion of those at the Ming tombs near Peking. Formerly, the Manchu emperors made pilgrimages to these tombs and the sacred city of their dynasty, but since the second decade of this century, the Chinese emperor's portrait only has been sent at intervals in solemn procession, the Peking road being in the meantime closed to ordinary traffic. The governor-general of Manchuria resides in Mukden, as well as the military governor, who is assisted by a civil administrator and by the presidents of five boards. The great offices of state are filled in duplicate by Chinese and Manchus, and criminals of the two races are tried in separate courts. The favorable reception given to Christianity is one of the features of Mukden. The fine pagoda of the Christian church is en évidence everywhere. The Scotch UP missionaries, who have been established there for 25 years, are on friendly terms with the people, 
and specially with many of the mandarins and high officials who show them tokens of regard publicly and privately on all occasions dr christie the medical missionary is the trusted friend as well as the medical adviser of many of the leading officials and their wives who with every circumstance of ceremonial pomp have presented complimentary tablets to the hospital and altogether the relations between the chinese and the missionaries are unique i attribute these special relations with the upper class partly to the fact that dr ross the senior missionary and dr christie and those who have joined them subsequently have studied chinese custom and etiquette very closely and are careful to conform to both as far as is possible while they are not only keen-sighted for the good that is in the chinese but bring the best out of them thus christianity divested of the nonchalant or contemptuous insularity by which it is often rendered repulsive has made considerable progress not only in the capital but in the province and until the roads became unsafe there was scarcely a day during my long visit in which there were not deputations from distant villages asking for christian workers representing numerous bands of rural worshippers who having received some knowledge of christianity from converts colporteurs or catechists had renounced many idolatrous practices and desired further instruction of the professing christians dr ross said that it was only a very small percentage who had learned the gospel from europeans four thousand were already baptized and nearly as many again were inquirers with a view to baptism it was most curious to see men coming daily from remote regions asking for someone to go and instruct them in the jesus doctrine for they had learned as much as they could without a teacher in many parts of manchuria there are now christian communities carrying on their own worship and discipline and it is noteworthy that very many of the converts are members of those secret societies whose strongest bond of union is the search after righteousness the mission hospital is one of the largest and best equipped in the far east and besides doing a great medical and surgical work is a medical school in which students pass through a four years curriculum there also dr christie gives illustrated popular scientific lectures in the winter which are attended among others by a number of sons of mandarins donations both of money and food are contributed to this hospital both by officials and merchants and general tso a most charitable man and beloved by the poor only the night before he started for korea sent a bag of tickets for ice so that the hospital might not suffer for the lack of it during his absence only a few months before he presented it with a handsome tablet and subscription footnote general tso's cavalry brigade was perhaps the best disciplined in the chinese army and he was a severe disciplinarian but he was also an earnest philanthropist and though a strict mussulman always showed himself friendly to the christian religion especially in its benevolent aspects his soup kitchens saved many a family from starvation he established and was the chief support of a foundling hospital during the terrible inundation of 1888, he distributed food among the famished with his own hands. His friendly help could always be relied on by the missionaries, who joined in the sorrow with which Manchuria mourned for his premature death at Pyongyang in Korea. The benevolence of rich Chinese ought not to be overlooked. The charities of China are on a gigantic scale and many of them are admirably administered by men who expend much self-sacrificing effort on their administration End footnote. even in so civilized a city as mukden with its schools and literary examinations its thousands of literary aspirants to official position its streets full of a busy and splendid officialism its enormous trades 
its banks and yamens its twenty thousand mussulmans with their many mosques and hatred of the pig and the slow interpenetration of enlightened western ideas chinese superstitions of the usual order well known by every reader prevail the system of medicine though it contains the knowledge and use of some valuable native drugs among the sixty which are exported is in many respects extremely barbarous the doctors have no operative surgery and cannot even tie an artery they use cupping the cautery and acupuncture hot or cold with long coarse uncleanly needles with which they pierce the liver joints and stomach for pains sprains and rheumatism they close all abscesses wounds and ulcers with a black impervious plaster which doctors are resorted to in cases of hysteria or mental derangement. Vaccination is now to some extent adopted with calf or transferred lymph, the puncture being made in the nostrils. In order to ascertain whether a sick person is likely to live, they plunge long needles into the body and give up the case as hopeless if blood does not flow. When death is near, the friends dress the patient in the best clothes they can afford and remove him from the kang, the usual elevated sleeping place, to the floor, or lay him on ashes. As the spirit departs, they cry loudly in the ear. In connection with death, it may be mentioned that some of the most striking shops in Mukden, after the coffin shops, are those in which are manufactured and sold admirable life-size representations of horses, men, asses, elephants, carts, and all the articles of luxury of this life, which are carried in procession and are burned at the grave, sometimes to the value of one thousand dollars. Few children under nine years old are buried, and those only among the richest class. When death occurs, the mother, wailing bitterly, wraps the body in matting and throws it away, that is, she places it where the dogs can get at it. This ghastly burden must not be carried out of a door or window, but through a new or disused opening, in order that the evil spirit which causes the disease may not enter. The belief is that the heavenly dog which eats the sun at the time of an eclipse demands the bodies of children, and that if they are denied to him, he will bring certain calamity on the household. I have mentioned the Kang, which is a marked feature of the houses and inns of Manchuria, which for its latitude has the coldest winter in the world, the mercury often reaching 17 degrees Fahrenheit below zero. The Kang is a brick platform covered with matting and heated economically by flues, and is at once sleeping and sitting place. The stalks of the Holkas sorghum are used for fuel. In winter, when the external temperature may be a little above and much below zero for a month at a time, the Chinaman, unable to heat his whole room, drops his shoes, mounts his kang, sits cross-legged on the warm mat, covers his padded socks with his padded robe, and there takes his meals and receives his friends in comfort. When I was invited to climb the Kang, I felt myself a persona grata. The pawn shops of Mukden, with their high outer walls, lofty gateways, two or three well-kept courts, fine buildings and tall stone columns at the outer gate, with the sign of the business upon them, their scrupulous cleanliness and their armies of polite, intelligent clerks, are as respectable as banks with us. They demand for every sum borrowed movable property to double its amount. If the pledge be not redeemed within two years, it falls to the pawnbroker. Government fixes the interest. The proprietor takes the same position as a capitalist owning a bank in the West, and a sumshoe distiller takes an equal place in local esteem. The prevalence of suicide is a feature of Mukden as of most Chinese cities. Certain peculiarities of Chinese justice render it a favorite way of wreaking spite upon an employer or neighbor who is haunted besides by the spirit of the self-murderer. Hence, servants angry with their masters 
shopmen with their employers, wives with their husbands, and above all, daughters-in-law with their mothers-in-law, show their spite by dying on their premises, usually by opium or eating the tops of lucifer matches. It is quite a common thing for a person who has a grudge against another to go and poison himself in his courtyard, securing revenge first by the mandarin's inquiry, and next by the haunting terrors of his malevolent spirit. Young girls were daily poisoning themselves with lucifer matches to escape from the tyranny of mothers-in-law and leave unpleasantness behind them. But it is not the seamy side which is uppermost in Mukden. End of section 18「Section 19 of Korea and her neighbors by Isabella L. Bird. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Abai in May 2021. Chapter 17 Chinese Troops on the March. The weeks which I spent in Mukden were full of rumors and excitement. A few words on the origin of the war with Japan may make the situation intelligible. The Tonghaks, as was mentioned in Chapter 13, had on several occasions defeated the Royal Korean troops, and after much hesitation, the Korean king invoked the help of China. China replied promptly by giving Japan notice of her intention to send troops to Korea on 7th June 1894 both countries under the treaty of tientsin having equal rights to do so under such circumstances as had then arisen on the same day japan announced to china a similar intention the chinese general yi landed at asan with three thousand men and the japanese occupied jemulpo and seoul in force in the chinese dispatch korea was twice referred to as our tributary state. Japan replied that the imperial government had never recognized Korea as a tributary state of China. Then came three proposals from Japan for the administration of Korea to be carried out jointly by herself and China. These were 1. Examination of the financial administration. 2. Selection of the central and local officials. 3 the establishment of a disciplined army for national defense and the preservation of the peace of the land. To these proposals China replied that Korea must be left to reform herself, and that the withdrawal of the Japanese troops must precede any negotiations, a suggestion rejected by Japan, who informed China on 14th July that she should regard the dispatch of any more troops to Japan as a belligerent act. On 20th July, Japan demanded that the King of Korea should order the Chinese troops to leave the country, threatening decisive measures, if this course were not adopted. Meanwhile, at the request of the King, the representatives of the treaty powers were endeavoring to maintain peace, suggesting the simultaneous withdrawal of the troops of both countries. To this, China agreed, but Japan demanded delay and on 23rd July took the decisive measure she had threatened, assaulted and captured the palace, and practically made the king a prisoner. His father, the Taiwan Kun, at his request, but undoubtedly at Japanese instigation, taking nominally the helm of affairs. After this, events marched with great rapidity. On 25th July, the transport Kao Xing, flying the British flag and carrying 1,200 Chinese troops, was sunk with great loss of life by the Japanese cruiser Naniwa, and four days later the Japanese won the Battle of Asan and dispersed the Chinese army. Before 30th July, Korea gave notice of the renunciation of the conventions between herself and China, which was equivalent to renouncing Chinese sovereignty. On 1st August, war was declared. Of the sequence of these events, and even of the events themselves, we knew little or nothing, and up to the middle of July Mukden kept the even tenor of its way. 
Manchuria is far less hostile to foreigners than the rest of China, and the name devil may even be used as a polite address with the prefix of honorable. No European women had previously passed through the gate of the inner wall and through the city on foot, but I not only was able to do so without molestation, though several times only attended by my servant, but actually was able to photograph in the quieter streets, the curiosity of the crowd being quite friendly. The Scotch missionaries had then been established in Mukden for twenty-two years, were on friendly terms with the people, there was much social intercourse, and altogether their relations with the Chinese were unique. Before the end of July, however, the many wild rumours which were afloat, and the continual passage of troops on their way to Korea, war being a foregone conclusion before it was declared, produced a general ferment. I had to abandon peregrinations in the city, and also photography, a hostile crowd having mobbed me as I was taking the gate of victory, in the belief that I kept a black devil in the camera, with such a baleful cyclopean eye that whatever living thing it looked on would die within a year, and any building or wall would crumble away. After war was declared on 1st August 1894, things grew worse rapidly. As Japan had full command of the sea, all Chinese troops sent to Korea were compelled to march through Manchuria, and undisciplined hordes of Manchu soldiers from Kirin, Tsitsihar, and other northern cities poured through Mukden at the rate of 1,000 a day, having distinguished themselves on the southern march by seizing on whatever they could get hold of, riotously occupying inns without payment, beating the innkeepers, and wrecking Christian chapels, not from anti-Christian, but from anti-foreign feeling. Their hatred of foreigners culminated at Liaoyang, 40 miles from Mukden, when Manchu soldiers, after wrecking the Christian chapel, beat Mr. Wiley, a Scotch missionary, to death, and attacked the chief magistrate for his friendliness to the foreign devils. Anti-foreign feeling rose rapidly in Mukden. The servants of foreigners, and even the hospital assistants, were insulted in the town, and the wildest rumours concerning foreigners were spread and believed. The friendly authorities, who took the safety of the three mission families into serious consideration, requested them to give up their usual journeys into the interior and to avoid going into the city or outside the walls. Next, the street chapels were closed, the native Christians, a large body, being very apprehensive for their own safety, being regarded as one with the foreigners who, unfortunately, were generally supposed to be the same as the Japanese. The perils of the roads increased. Not a cart or animal was to be seen near them. The great inns were closed or had their shutters wrecked, and the villages and farms were deserted. All tracks converging on Mukden were thronged with troops, not marching, but straggling along anyhow, every tenth man carrying a great silk banner, but few were armed with modern weapons. I saw several regiments of fine physique without a rifle among them. In some, jingals were carried by two men each, others were armed with antique muzzle-loading muskets, very rusty, or with long matchlocks, and some carried only spears or bayonets fixed on red poles. All were equipped with such umbrellas and fans as I saw some time later in the ditches of the bloody field of Pyongyang. It was nothing but murder to send thousands of men so armed to meet the Japanese with their deadly Murata rifles, and the men knew it, for when they happened to see a foreigner they made such remarks as, This is one of the devils for whom we are going to be shot and when a large party of them, in attempting to make a forcible entry into the governor-general's palace, were threatened by the guard with being shot, the reply was, We are going to be shot in Korea. We may as well be shot here. The nominal pay of soldiers is higher than that of laborers, and it was only after the defeat and the great slaughter at Asan that there was any unwillingness to enter the ranks. 
the uniform is easy but unfit for hard wear and very stagy a short loose sleeved red cloak bordered with black velvet loose blue black or apricot trousers and long boots of black cotton cloth with thick soles of quilted rag the discipline may be inferred from the fact that some regiments of fine physique straggled through mukden for the seat of war carrying rusty muskets in one hand and in the other poles with perches on which singing birds were loosely tethered the men fell out of the ranks as they pleased to buy fruit or tobacco or to speak to friends yet they made a goodly scenic display in their brilliant colouring with their countless long banners of crimson silk undulating in the breezy sunshine and their officers with sable-tailed hats and yellow jackets riding beside them those who had rifles and modern weapons at all had them of all makes so cartridges of twenty different sorts and sizes were huddled together without any attempt at classification and in one open space all sorts were heaped on the ground and the soldiers were fitting them to their arms sometimes trying eight or ten before finding one to suit the weapon and throwing them back on the heap there were neither medical arrangements nor an ambulance corps chinese custom being to strip the wounded and leave them wounded men being of no use the commissariat was not only totally inefficient but grossly dishonest and where stores had accumulated the contractors sold them for their own benefit thus there was little provision of food or fodder in advance and in a very short time the soldiers were robbing at large and eating the horses and transport mules the chinese soldiers bad as their drill and discipline are are regarded by european officials as excellent material but the manchus of the north tartars are a shambling disorderly insubordinate horde dreaded by peaceable citizens presuming on their imperial relationship and in disturbed times little better than licensed brigands among the first troops to leave the city was the feng tian chinese brigade of cavalry five thousand strong under general tso a brave and experienced officer who was at once feared and trusted so that when he fell with his face to the foe at pyongyang his loss demoralized the army and the japanese showed their appreciation of him by erecting an obelisk to his memory his brigade was in a state of strict discipline admirably drilled and on the whole well armed the troopers were mounted on active well-built ponies a little over thirteen hands high up to great weight after leaving mukden they were entangled in a quagmire which extended for one hundred miles and the telegrams of disaster were ominous on the first day their commander beheaded six men for taking melons without payment and on the second fourteen were decapitated for desertion after general tso's departure with his disciplined force the disorder increased and the high officials being left with few reliable soldiers became alarmed for their own positions the hatred and jealousy between the chinese and manchu troops not only constituting one of the great difficulties of the war but threatening official safety rumors of disaster soon began to circulate and with each one the ferment increased and an imperial proclamation sent by courier from peking in the interests of foreigners declaring that the emperor was only at war with the rebel wu jen dwarfs and was at peace with all other nations did little to allay it the able-bodied beggars and unemployed coolies in the city were swept into the army and were sent off after three weeks drill the mule carts of mukden and the neighbourhood were requisitioned for transport paralysing much of the trade of the city later many of these carts were burned as fuel to cook the mules for the starving troops as manchu soldiers continued to pour in the shops were closed and the streets deserted at their approach and many of the merchants fled to the hills a japanese occupation ensuring security and order came to be hoped for by many sufferers 
the price of provisions rose because the country people had either been robbed of all or did not dare to bring them in and even the hospital and dispensary for the same reason began to be scantily attended after mr wiley's murder things became increasingly serious and by the end of august it became apparent to the authorities that the safety of foreigners would be jeopardized by remaining much longer in mukden somewhat later they left dr ross and dr christie remaining behind for a short time at the special request of the governor i left on twentieth august and though my friends were very anxious about my safety i reached new chuang five days later having encountered no worse risk than that of an attack by pirates who captured some junks with some loss of life after i had eluded them by travelling at night End of section 19section twenty of korea and her neighbors by isabella l bird this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by avai in may two thousand twenty one chapter eighteen nagasaki vladivostok after the collapse of the rumor regarding the landing of the japanese in force on the shores of the gulf of pechili which obtained credence for nearly a fortnight in the far east fluttered every cabinet in europe forced even so cool and well informed a man as sir robert hart into hasty action and produced a hurried exodus of europeans from peking and a scare generally among the foreign residents in north china i returned from peking to che fu to await the course of events the war its requirements and its uncertainties disarranged the means of ocean transit so effectually that after hanging on for some weeks in the midst of daily rumors of great naval engagements for a steamer of vladivostok i only succeeded in getting a passage in a small german boat which reluctantly carried one passenger and in which i spent a very comfortless five days in stormy weather varied by the pleasant interlude of a day at nagasaki then in the full glory of the chrysanthemum season and aflame with scarlet maples lighted cleaned and policed to perfection without a hole or a heap this trim city of dwarfs and dolls contrasts agreeably with the filth squalor loathsomeness and general abominableness which are found in nearly all chinese cities outside the foreign settlements chinese moved about the streets with an air as of a ruling race and worked at their trades and pursued the important calling of compradores with perfect freedom from annoyance the only formality required of them being registration while from china all the japanese had fled by the desire of their consuls not always unmolested in person and property, and any stray dwarf then found in a Chinese city would have been all but certain to lose his life. The enthusiasm for the war was still at a white heat. Gifts in money and kind fell in a continual shower on the Nagasaki authorities. Nothing was talked of but military successes, and a theatre holding three thousand was giving the profits of two daily performances to crowded audiences in aid of the war fund the fact that ships were only allowed to enter the port by daylight and were then piloted by a government steam launch in charge of a torpedo pilot was the only indication in the harbour of an exceptional state of things it was warm autumn weather at nagasaki but when i reached vladivostok the hills which surround its superb harbour were powdered with the first snows of winter and a snowstorm two days later covered the country to a depth of eighteen inches wooded islands wooden bays wooded hills deep sheltered channels and inlets wooded to the water's edge bewilder a stranger and then comes fort godobin and by a sharp turn the harbour is entered one of the finest in the world two and a half miles long by nearly one wide with deep water everywhere so deep that ships drawing twenty-five feet lie within a stone's throw of the wharves 
and Moore at the government pier. The first view of Vladivostok, possession of the east, is very striking, although the vandalism of its builders has deprived it of its naturally artistic background of wood. Otherwise, the purple tone of the land and the blue crystal of the water reminded me of some of our Nova Scotian harbors. There is nothing Asiatic about the aspect of this Pacific capital, and indeed it is rather transatlantic than European. Seated on a deeply embayed and apparently landlocked harbor, along the shores of which it straggles for more than three miles, climbing audaciously up the barren sides of denuded hills, irregular, treeless, lofty buildings with bold fronts, government house, Kunz and Albers, the glittering domes of a Greek cathedral, a Lutheran church, government administrative offices, the admiralty, the arsenal, the cadet school, the naval club, an emigrant home, and the grand and solid terminus and offices of the Siberian railway, rising out of an irregularity which is not picturesque, attract and hold the voyager's attention. Requesting to be taken at once to the customs, the bewildered air of astonishment with which my request was met, informed me that Vladivostok had up to that time been a free port, and that I was at liberty to land unquestioned. After thumping about for some time among a number of stout sampans in the midst of an unspeakable babel, I was hauled on shore by a number of laughing, shouting, dirty Korean youths, who, after exchanging pretty hard blows with each other for my coveted possessions, shouldered them and ran off with them in different directions, leaving me stranded with the tripod of my camera, to which I had clung desperately in the melee. There were droskies not far off, and four or five Koreans got hold of me, one dragging me towards one vehicle, others to another, yelling Korean into my ears, till a Cossack policeman came and thumped them into order. There were hundreds of them on the wharf, and except that they were noisier and more aggressive, it was like landing at Chemulpo. Getting into a droski, I said, Golden Horn Hotel, in my most distinct English, then Hotel Corn d'Or, in my most distinct French. The moujik nodded and grinned out of his fur hood and started at a gallop in the opposite direction. I clutched him and made emphatic signs, speech being useless, and he turned and galloped in a right direction, but stopped at the disreputable doorway of one of the lowest of the many drinking saloons with which Vladivostok is infected. There all my Koreans reappeared, vociferating and excited. I started the mujik off again at a gallop, the droski jumping ruts and bounding out of holes with an energy of elasticity which took my breath away, the Koreans racing. More gallops, more stoppages at pothouses, and in this fashion I reached at last the Golden Horn Hotel, a long, rambling, disjuskit building, with a shady air of disreputableness hanging about it, the escort of Koreans still good-natured and vociferous. The landlady emerged. I tried her in English and French, but she knew neither. The mujik shouted at us both in Russian. A little crowd assembled, each man trying to put matters straight, and when every moment made them more entangled, and the mujik was gathering up his reins to gallop off on a further request, a Russian officer came up and in excellent English asked if he could help me, interpreted my needs to the lady, lent me some kopecks with which to appease the Koreans and the mujik, and gave me the enjoyment of listening to my own blessed tongue, which I had not heard for five days. By a long flight of stairs, past the great bar and dining room, where vodka was much on evidence, even in the forenoon, past the billiard room, occupied even at that early hour, and through a large, dark, and dusty theatre, I attained my rooms, a parlour and bedroom en suite, opening on and looking out upon a yard with pigsties. There were five doors, none of which would lock. The rooms were furnished in Louis XIV style, 
much gilding and velvet, all ancient and dusty. They looked as if they had known tragedies and might know them again. The barrier of language was impassable, and I must be unskilled in the use of signs, for I quite failed to make anyone understand that I wanted food. I went out, cashed a circular note at the great German house of Kunz and Albers, the white lees of eastern Siberia, where all the information that I then needed was given in the most polite way, found it impossible anywhere else to make myself understood in English or French, failed in an attempt to buy postage stamps or to get food, delivered the single letter of introduction which I had somewhat ungraciously accepted, and returned to my melodramatic domicile to consider the possibilities of travel, which at that moment were not encouraging. Before long, Mr. Charles Smith, the oldest foreign resident in Vladivostok, to whom my letter was addressed, called, a kindly and genial presence, and, as I afterwards found, full of good deeds and benevolence. He took me at once to call on General Unterberger, the governor of the maritime province. I think I never saw so gigantic a man, military too, from his spurs to his coat collar. As he rose to receive me, he looked as if his head might eventually touch the lofty ceiling. Mr. Smith is a persona grata in Vladivostok, and very much so with the governor, who consequently received me with much friendliness, and asked me to let him know my plans. I explained what I wanted to do, subject to his approval, and presented my credentials, which were of the best. He said that he quite approved of my project, and would do anything he could to help me, and wrote on the spot a letter to the frontier commissioner, but he added that the disorganized and undisciplined state of the Chinese army near the frontier might render some modification of my plan necessary, as I afterwards found. The governor and his wife speak excellent English, and the social intercourse which I had with them afterwards was most agreeable and instructive. During the afternoon Mr. Smith returned, and saying that he and his wife could not endure my staying in that hotel, took me away to his home, high up on a steep hillside, with a glorious view of the city and harbour, and of which it is difficult to say whether the sunshine were brighter within or without. Under such propitious circumstances my two visits became full of sunny memories, and I may be pardoned if I see Vladivostok a little couleur de rose, for the extraordinary kindness which dogs and shadows the traveller in the far east were met with there in perfection, and where I was received by strangers I left highly valued friends. After a snowstorm splendid weather set in. The snow prevented dust blasts, the ordinary drawback of an eastern Siberian winter. The skies were brilliant and unclouded, the sunsets carnivals of colour, the air exhilarating, the mercury at night averaging twenty degrees. There was light without heat, the main road was full of sleighs going at a gallop, their bells making low music, all that is unsightly was hidden, and this weather continued for five weeks. The possession of the East is nothing if not military and naval. Forts, earthworks, at which it is prudent not to look too long or intently, great military hospitals, huge red brick barracks in every direction, offices of military administration, squads of soldiers in brown ulsters and peaked pshaliks, carrying pickaxes or spades on their shoulders, sappers with their tools in small parties, Officers, mostly with portfolios or dispatch boxes under their arms, dashing about in sleighs, and the prohibition of photography, all indicate its fortress character. Footnote. The Russian soldier does a great amount of day labor. Far from disporting himself in brilliant uniform before the admiring eyes of boys and servant girls, he digs, builds, carpenters, makes shoes and harness, and does a good civil day's work in addition to his military duties, and is paid for this as piecework on a fixed scale, 
his daily earnings being duly entered in a book. When he has served his time, these are handed over to him, and a steady, industrious man makes enough to set himself up in a small business or on a farm. Vodka and schnapps are the Russian soldiers' great enemies. End footnote. Certainly two out of every three people in the streets are in uniform, and the Cossack police, who abound, are practically soldiers. Naval it is also. There are ships of war in and out of commission, a brand new admiralty, a navy yard, a floating dock, a magnificent dry dock, only just completed, and a naval clubhouse, which is one of the finest buildings in Vladivostok. No matter that nature closes the harbour from Christmas to the end of March. Science has won the victory, and the port has been kept open for the last two winters by means of a powerful icebreaker and the services of the troops in towing the blocks of ice out to sea. Large steamers of the volunteer fleet leave Odessa and Vladivostok monthly or fortnightly. As the eastern terminus of the Trans-Siberian Railway, Vladivostok aspires to be what she surely will be, at once the Gibraltar and Odessa of the Far East, one of the most important of commercial emporiums, as the distributing point for the commerce of that vast area of prolific country which lies south of the Amur. Possibly a branch line to Port Chestakov in Hamgyong-do may enable the government to dispense with the services of the icebreaker. The progress of the city is remarkable. The site, then a forest, was only surveyed in 1860. In 1863, many of the trees were felled and some shanties were erected. Later than that, a tiger was shot on the site of the new government house, and a man leaving two horses to be shod outside the smithy had them both devoured by tigers. Gradually, the big oaks and pines were cleared away, and wooden houses were slowly added, until 1872, when the removal of the naval establishment of 60 men from Nikolaev on the Amur to the new settlement gave it a decided start. In 1878, it had a population of 1,400. In 1897, its estimated civil population was 25,000, including 3,000 Koreans who have their own settlement a mile from the city and are its draymen and porters, and 2,000 Chinese. The latter keep most of the shops and have obtained a monopoly of the business in meat, fish, game, fruit, vegetables, and other perishable commodities, their guild being strong enough to squeeze the Russians out of the trade in these articles, which are sold in four large wooden buildings by the harbour, known as the bazaar. There are some good Japanese shops, but the Japanese are usually domestic servants at high wages, and after a few years return to enjoy their savings in their own country. A naturalised German is the only British subject, and my host and his family are the only Americans. The capital has two subsidized and two independent lines of steamers. 700 families of Russian-assisted emigrants enter Primorsk annually, each head of a household being required to be the possessor of 600 rubles, 60 pounds, and from 8,000 to 10,000 Chinese from the Shantung province arrive every spring to fulfill labor contracts, returning to China in December, carrying out of the country from $25 to $50 each. Convict labor from the penal settlement of Sahalin having been abandoned as impracticable. The Chinese shops, which are a feature of Vladivostok, undersell both Russians and Germans and have an increasing trade. Kunz and Albers, a Hamburg firm of importers, bankers, shipping agents, and Whiteleyism in general, with 60 clerks, mostly German, with a few Russians, Danes and Koreans, conduct an enormous wholesale and retail business in a palatial pile of brick and stone buildings and has 16 branch houses in eastern Siberia, and the German firm of Langa Lutje runs them very closely. 
the railway station and offices are solid and handsome an admirably built railroad open to the usuri bridge 186 miles and progressing towards the amur with great rapidity points to a new commercial future streets of shops and dwelling houses in which brick and stone are fast replacing wood are extending to the north east and west and along the gulf of peter the great for fully three miles and new and handsome official and private edifices of much pretension were being rapidly completed one broad road with houses sometimes on one sometimes on both sides running along the hillside for two miles at a considerable height is the main street or high street of vladivostok along it are built most of the public buildings and the great shops and mercantile offices it is crossed by painfully steep roads climbing up the hill and descending with equal steepness to the sea there are two or three parallel roads of small importance the builder was at work in all quarters and the clink of the mason's trowel and the ring of the carpenter's hammer were only silent for a few hours during the night several of government buildings were barely finished and were occupied before they were painted and stuccoed building up and pulling down were going on simultaneously roads were being graded culverts and retaining walls built and wooden houses showed signs of disappearing from the principal thoroughfare there was a boom in real property the value of land has risen fabulously lots which were bought in 1864 for 600 and 3000 rubles are now worth 12000 and 20000 and in the center of the town land is not to be bought at any price newness progress hopefulness are characteristics of civil vladivostok it has the aspect of a growing city in the american far east few things are finished and all are going ahead the sidewalks are mostly narrow and composed of rough planks with a tendency to tip up or down but here and there is a fine piece of granite flagging ten feet wide the hotels have more of the shady character of saloons or bar rooms than of anything reputable or established handsome houses of brick and stone shoulder wooden shanties fashionable carriages or sleighs bounce over ungraded streets the antediluvian ox cart with its korean driver bumps and creaks through the streets alongside of the troika with its three galloping horses in showy harness and its occupants in the latest and daintiest of parisian costumes but the all-pervading flavor of militarism overpowers the suggestion of the american far east the first buildings on the barren coast are military hospitals and barracks and barracks thicken as the city is approached the female element is in a remarkable minority the dull roll of artillery and commissariat wagons the tramp morning and night of brown battalions and the continual throb of drum and blare of trumpet and bugle recall one to the fact that this is the capital of russia's vast growing aspiring pacific empire theatricals concerts and balls fill up the winter season except on the few days on which snow falls the skies are cloudless the temperature is not seriously below zero and the dryness of the air is very invigorating in winters happily somewhat exceptional in which there is no snowfall and the strong winds create dust storms the climate is less agreeable spring is abrupt and pleasant and autumn is a fine season but summer is hot damp and misty a fine greek cathedral with many domes and lofty gilded crosses which gleam mysteriously in the sunset when the gloom of twilight has wrapped all else a prominent lutheran church and a chinese joss house provide for the religious needs of the population the governor of the maritime province several of the leading and many of the lower officials are of german origin from the baltic provinces lutherans and possibly imbued with a few liberal ideas 
but among the kindly cultured and agreeable people whose acquaintance i made in vladivostok one peculiarity impressed me forcibly the absolute stagnation of thought or the expression of it on politics and all matters connected with them the administration of government religion the orthodox church descent home and foreign policy etc it is true that certain subjects and these among the most interesting are carefully eliminated from conversation and that to introduce any one of them might subject the offender to social ostracism End of section 20. Section 21 of Korea and Her Neighbors by Isabella L. Bird. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in May 2021. Chapter 19 Korean Settlers in Siberia. The chief object of my visit to Russian Manchuria was to settle for myself, by personal investigation, the vexed question of the condition of those Koreans who have found shelter under the Russian flag, a number estimated in Seoul at 20,000. It was there persistently said that Russia was banishing them in large numbers, and that several thousands of them had already recrossed the two men and were in such poverty that the king of korea had sent agents to the north who were to settle them on lands in Hamgyongdo. but in vladivostok the servant interpreter difficulty was absolutely insurmountable no efforts on the part of my friends could obtain what did not exist and i was on the verge of giving up what proved a very interesting journey when the director of the Siberian telegraph lines very kindly liberated the senior official in his department, who had not had a holiday for many years, to go with me. Mr. Heidemann, a German from the Baltic provinces, spoke German, Russian and English with nearly equal ease, and as a Russian official was able to make things smoother than they might otherwise have been in a very rough part of Primorsk. He was tall, good-looking, and verging on middle age, very gentlemanly, never failed in any courtesy, understood how to manage mujiks, and was a capable and willing interpreter. But he was official, reticent, and uninterested, and gave me the impression of being frozen into his uniform. Fortified as to my project by the cordial approval of the governor, the courtesy of the telegraph department and the singular splendor of the weather i left vladivostok by a red sunrise in a small steamer which accomplished the sixty miles to posiet bay in seven hours landing us in a deep inlet of clear water and white sand soon to be closed by ice at the foot of low and absolutely barren hills fringing off into sandy knolls where Koreans with their ox carts awaited the steamer. A well spread tea table at the house of the Russian postmaster was very welcome. Such a strong looking family I had seldom seen, but afterwards I found that size and strength are characteristic of the Russian settlers in Primorsk. Posiet Bay is a large military station of fine barracks and storehouses. It scarcely seemed to possess a civil population, but there are Korean settlements at no great distance, from which much of the beef supply of Vladivostok is derived. We met a number of strong, thriving-looking Koreans driving sixty fine fat cattle down to the steamer. The post-wagon, in which we were cramped, up, among, and under the mail-bags, took us at a two-hour's gallop along frozen inlets of the sea, and across frozen rivers, over grassy, hilly country, scarcely enlivened by Korean farms in the valleys, to Novokievsk, which we reached after nightfall, and were hospitably received by the representative of Messrs. Kuntz and Albers, whose large brick and stone establishment is the prominent object in the settlement. Novokievsk is a great military post, to which one thousand civilians, chiefly korean and chinese 
have been attracted by the prospect of gain. Koreans indeed form the bulk of this population, and do all the hauling of goods and fuel with their ox teams. The centre of the town is a great dusty slope, intersected by dusty and glaring roads, which resound at intervals from early morning till sunset with the steady tramp of brown ulstered battalions. Between Posied Bay and Novokievsk there were ten thousand infantry and artillery, and at a later post eight pieces of field artillery and twenty-four two-wheeled ammunition wagons. Barracks for ten thousand more men were in the course of rapid construction. Long wooden sheds shelter the artillery ponies, and villages of low mud houses of two rooms each, with windows consisting of a single small pane of glass, the families of soldiers. There are great drill and parade grounds, and an imposing Greek church of the usual pattern. With its great open spaces and wide streets, Novokievsk looks laid out for futurity, straggling along a treeless and bushless hill slope for two miles. In addition to Kunz and Albers, with their polyglot staff of clerks, among whom a young Korean in European dress was conspicuous for his gentlemanliness and alacrity, there is another German house, and there are forty small shops, chiefly kept by Chinese, at all of which schnapps and vodka are sold. I was detained there for three days while arrangements for my southern journey were being made, and during that time the chief of police, who spoke French, took me to several Korean villages. So far as I saw and heard, the whole agricultural population of the neighborhood is Korean, and is in a very prosperous condition. There, and down to the Korean frontier, most of these settlers are doing well, and some of them are growing rich as contractors for the supply of meat and grain to the Russian forces. At this they have beaten their Chinese neighbors, and they actually go into Chinese Manchuria, buy up lean cattle, and fatten them for beef. To those who have only seen the Koreans in Korea, such a statement will be hardly credible. Yet it does not stand alone, for I have it on the best authority that the Korean settlers near Kabarovka have competed so successfully with the Chinese in market gardening that the supplying that city with vegetables is now entirely in their hands. The Russian Tarantas is one of the most uncouth of civilized vehicles. All that can be said of it is that it suits the roads, which in that region are execrable. On two sets of stout wheels and axles, attached to each other by long solid timbers, a long shallow box is secured, with one, two, or even three boards, cushioned or not, roped across it for seats. It may be drawn by either two or three horses abreast, one in the shafts and one or two outside, each with the most slender attachment to the vehicle, and his head held down and inwards by a tight strap. This outer animal is trained to a showy gallop, which never slackens even though the shaft horse may keep up a decorous trot. The Tarantas has no springs, and, going at a gallop, bumps and bounces over all obstacles, holes, hillocks, ruts and streams being alike to it. The Tarantas of the chief of police made nothing of the obstacles on the road to Yanchihe, where we were to hear of a Korean interpreter. The level country, narrowing into a valley bordered by fine mountains, is of deep, rich, black soil, and grows almost all cereals and roots. All the crops were gathered in, and the land was neatly ploughed. Korean hamlets with houses of a very superior class to those in Korea were sprinkled over the country. At one of the largest villages, where 140 families were settled on 750 acres of rich land, we called at several of the peasant farmers' houses, and were made very welcome, even the women coming out to welcome the official with an air of decided pleasure. The farmers had changed the timid, suspicious, or cringing manner, which is characteristic of them to a great extent at home, for an air of frankness and manly independence which was most pleasing. 
the chief of police was a welcome visitor. The Koreans had nothing to fear, unless his quick scent discerned an insanitary odor or his eye an unwarrantable garbage heap. The farmyards were clean and well swept, and the domestic animals were lodged in neat sheds. The houses, of strictly Korean architecture, were large, with five or six rooms, carefully thatched and very neat within, abounding in such comforts and plenishings as would only be dreamed of by mandarins at home. It is insisted on, however, that, instead of the flues which heat the floors, vomiting forth their smoke through many blackened apertures in the walls, they shall unite in sending it heavenwards through a hollow tree trunk placed at a short distance from the house. This and cleanly surroundings and the interests of sanitation are the only restrictions on their Korean habits. The clothing and dwellings are the same as in Korea, and the top-knot flourishes. A little farther on there is the large village of Yanchi He, with a neat schoolhouse in which Russian and Korean pupils sit side by side at their lessons, a Greek church, singularly rich in internal decorations, and a priest's house adjoining. This is a very prosperous village. In the neat police station a Korean surgeon wrote down my requirements and sent off a smart Korean policeman in search of an interpreter. Four hundred Koreans in this neighborhood have conformed to the Greek church and have received baptism. On asking the priest, who was more picturesque than cultivated, and whose large young family seemed oppressively large for the house, what sort of Christians they made, he replied suggestively that they had a great deal to learn, and that there would be more hope for the next generation. I am not clear in my own mind as to the cause of the success which has attended missionary effort at Yanchihe and elsewhere. The statements I received on the subject differed widely, and in most cases were made hesitatingly, as if my informants were not sure of their ground. My impression is that while Russia is tolerant of devil worship or any other worship which is not subversive to the externals of morality, conformity is required to obtain for the Korean alien those blessings which belong to naturalization as a Russian subject. Preparations being completed for traveling to the Korean frontier and into Korea as far as Kyongheng, a town which a trade convention in 1888 opened to the residence of Russian subjects in the hope of creating a market there after the style of Kiachta, I had an interview with Mr. Matunin, the frontier commissioner, who gave me a very unpleasant account of insecurity on the frontier owing to the lawlessness of the Chinese troops, and an introduction to the governor of Kyongheng. A large tarantas with three ponies and a driver, a Korean on another pony, and the Korean headman of a neighboring village, who spoke Russian well, and our saddles were our modest outfit. The details of the two days' journey to the two men are too monotonous for infliction on the reader. The road was infamous, and at times disappeared altogether on a hillside or in a swamp, and swamps are frequent for the first forty versts. The tarantas, always attempting a gallop, bounced, bumped, and thumped, till breathing became a series of gasps. Occasionally we stuck fast in swampy streams where the ice was broken, being extricated by a tremendous, united, and apparently trained jump on the part of the ponies, which compelled a strong grip of the vehicle with hands and feet, and would have dislocated any other. Mr. Heidemann smoked cigarettes unceasingly and made no remarks. We crossed the head of Posiet Bay and other inlets at a gallop on thin ice, forded several streams in the aforesaid fashion, and passed through several Korean coast villages given up to the making of salt by a rude process, the finished product being carted away to Hunchun in China in baskets of finely woven reeds. These Chinese carts are drawn by seven mules each, constantly driven at a gallop. After thirty versts the country became very hilly, 
with rugged mountains in the distance, all without a tree or bush, and covered with coarse and fine grasses mixed up with myriads of withered flower stalks of compositae and umbelliferae, and here and there a lonely, belated purple aster shivered in the strong keen wind, which made an atmosphere at zero somewhat hard to face. The valleys are flat and broad, and their rich black soil, the product of ages of decaying vegetation, is absolutely stoneless. Almost all crops can be raised upon it. Besides being a rich agricultural country, the region is well suited for cattle breeding. There were large herds on the hills, and haystacks thickly scattered over the landscape indicated abundance of winter keep. The potato, which flourishes and is free from the disease, is largely cultivated, and is now with the Koreans an article of ordinary diet. The whole of this fine country is settled by Koreans, for the few hamlets of wretched, tumble-down Chinese houses are of no account. Whether as squatters or purchasers, they are making the best of the land. The number of their domestic animals enables them to fertilize it abundantly. They plough deep and rotate their crops, and get a splendid yield from their lands. We halted at Sarachie, a village of 120 families, admirably housed and with all material comforts abounding about them. Out of its 600 inhabitants, 450 have conformed. The Koreans, having no religion, are apparently not unwilling to secure the possible advantages of conversion, and though none of the Greek priests who conversed with me were enthusiastic about their consistency, it is at least more satisfactory to see an eke homo on the wall than the family demon. At distances of three and four miles there are Korean villages, of which prosperity in greater or less degree is a characteristic. The houses are large and well built, and the farmyards are well stocked with domestic animals, the people and children are well clothed, and the village lands carefully cultivated. A long ascent, during which the road, which for some time had been intermittent, gradually disappeared, leads to the summit of a high hill, from which the mountainous frontiers of Russia, China, and Korea are seen to converge. After losing our way and our time, and crossing several ranges of hills without a road, just as the winter sun was setting in a flood of red gold, glorifying the mountains on the Chinese frontier, a turn round a bluff revealed what is geographically and politically a striking view. The whole of the Russo-Korean frontier, eleven miles in length, and a broad river full of sandbanks passing through a desert of sand hills to the steely blue ocean, lay crimson in the sunset. On a steep bluff above the river, a tall granite slab marks the spot where the Russian and Chinese frontiers meet. Across the Tumen, the barren mountains of Korea loomed purple through a haze of gold. Three empires are seen at a glance. A small and poor Korean village is situated in a valley below. Close to the boundary stone, on the high steep bluff above the Tumen, there is a large mud hut from which most of the whitewash had scaled off, with thatch held on by straw ropes weighted with stones. It was a very lovely scene. A Korean told us that it was absolutely impossible for us to sleep at the village. A Cossack came out of the hut, took a long look at us, and returned. Then a forlorn-looking corporal appeared, who also took a long look, and, having hospitable instincts, came up and told us that the village was impossible except for the drivers and horses, but that he could put us up roughly in the hut, which consisted of one fair-sized room, another very small one, and a lean-to. The latest English papers had stated that Russia has lately massed 5,000 men on the Korean frontier and 4,000 at Hun Chun. It is not desirable to make any inquiries about the position and number of Russian troops, and I had prudently abstained from asking questions, and had looked forward with interest to seeing a great display of military force. 
This hut is the military post of Krasnoye Chelo, and the army of Russia, massed on her Korean frontier, consisted of fifteen men and a corporal, the officer being required to endure the isolation of the position for six months, and the privates for one. The roars of laughter which greeted the English statement were not complimentary to newspaper accuracy. The corporal's small room was of no particular shape, and was furnished with only a deal chair and small table, and a big earthen jar of water, but it was well warmed and had an iron camp bed in a recess with a wire-wove mattress, much broken and sagging, the sharp points of the broken wires sticking up in several places through the one rug with which I attempted to mollify their asperities. This recess, which just contained the bed, was curtained off for me, and the corporal, Mr. Heidemann, and three Korean headmen lay closely packed on the floor. The corporal, glad to have people to talk with, talked more than half the night, and began again before daybreak. We supped on barrack fare, black bread, barley brose, and tea, with the addition of a little kwas, a very slightly fermented drink, made from black bread, raisins, sugar, and a little vodka, schnapps and vodka containing 40% of alcohol. At 9 p.m. I was surprised and delighted with the noble strains of a Greek litany, chanted in well-balanced parts from the barrack room, the evening worship of the Cossacks. My last sunset view of the two men was of a sheet of ice. The headmen of the Korean villages of Sajorni and Krasnoye, who were in council till near midnight, thought it was impossible to get across, and they said that the ferry boat was drawn ashore and was frozen in for the winter, and that two Russian commissioners and a general, after waiting for three days, had left the day before, having failed. However, yielding to my urgency, they set all the able-bodied men of Sajorni to work at 2 a.m. to dig the boat out, and by 7 she had moved some yards towards the river, which, however, was still a sheet of ice. Later, the corporal sent 14 of his men to help the Koreans, laughingly saying that I had the whole Russian frontier army to get me across. At nine, word came that the boat was nearly afloat, and we started, on horseback, with two baggage ponies, and rode a mile over the hills and through the prosperous Korean village of Sajorni, down to a dazzling expanse of sand through which the two men flows to the sea, there ten miles off. The river ice was breaking up into large masses under the morning sun, and between Russia and Korea there was much open water about 600 feet broad. The experts said if we could get over at all, it would be between noon and two, after which the ice would pack and freeze together again. Koreans and Cossacks worked with a will, breaking the ice, digging under the boat and moving her with levers, but it was noon before the unwieldy craft, used for the ferriage of oxen, moved into the water, accompanied by a hearty cheer. She leaked badly, two men were required to bail her, and the stern platform, by which animals enter her, was carried away. The baggage was carried in by men wading much over their knees, and then came the turn of the ponies. But not the whole Russian army, by force or persuasion, could get those wretched animals embarked. After a whole hour's work and any amount of kicking, plunging, and injuries from getting one or two legs over the bulwarks and struggling back and rolling backwards into the river, two were apparently safe in the ferry boat, when suddenly they knocked over the man who held them and jumped into the water, one blind animal being rescued with difficulty and the other cutting his legs considerably. The ice was then fast forming, but the soldiers made one more attempt, which failed, owing to what Americans would not inaptly call the cussedness of the Siberian ponies. For the first time on any journey I had to confess myself baffled, for it was impossible to swim the contumacious animals across, 
owing to the heavy ice flows and the low temperature of the water. I had sat on my pony watching these proceedings for nearly four hours, watching too the grand Korean mountains as they swept down to the icy river in every shade of cobalt blue, varied by indigo shadows of the white cloud masses which sailed slowly across the heavenly sky. At that point, from which I most reluctantly turned back, the two men has a large volume of water, but above and below, sandbanks render the navigation so difficult that it is only in the rainy season that flat-bottomed boats make the attempt, and not always with success, to reach the Korean town of Kwan, eighty versts, or something over fifty miles, above Krasnoye Chelo. The Chinese, in the insane notion that Japan was about to land a large force on the south bank of the Tumen, had seized all the boats above the Russian post. I photographed the Russian army and the barracks as well as the boundary stone, and the corporal slouching against the scaly forlorn quarters on the desolate height in an attitude of extreme dejection, as we drove away, leaving him to his usual dullness. The days of the return journey gave me a good opportunity of learning something of the condition of the Koreans under another government than their own. So long ago as 1863, thirteen families from Hamgyong-do crossed the frontier and settled on the river Tizen ho a little to the north of Posiet Bay. By 1866 there were one hundred families there, very poor, among which the Russian government distributed cattle and seed for cultivation. During 1869, a year of very great scarcity in northern Korea, 4,500 Koreans migrated, hunger-driven, into Primorsk, some 3,800 of them being absolutely destitute. These had to be supported, no easy thing, as the territory, only ceded to Russia a few years before, was but a thinly peopled wilderness, and was also suffering from a bad harvest. In 1897 there were in Primorsk 32 village districts, that is, villages with outlying hamlets, divided into five administrative districts. Besides these, one village belongs to the city of Kabarovka on the Amur, and there are large Korean settlements adjacent to Vladivostok and Nikolskoye. The total number of Korean immigrants is estimated at from 16,000 to 18,000. It must be remembered that several thousands of these were literally paupers, and that they subsisted for nearly a year on the charity of the Russian authorities, and after that were indebted to them for seed corn. They settled on the rich lands of the Siberian valleys mostly as squatters, but have been unmolested for many years. Many have purchased the lands they occupy, and in other cases villages have acquired community rights to their adjacent lands. It is the intention of government that squatting shall gradually be replaced by purchase, the purchasers receiving legal title deeds. These alien settlers practically enjoy autonomy. At the head of each district is an elder or headman, with from one to three assistants according to its size. The police and their officers are Korean. In each district there are two or three judges with their clerks who try minor offences. The headmen, who are responsible for order and the collection of taxes, are paid salaries or receive various allowances. All these officials are Koreans and are elected by the people themselves from among themselves. The government taxation is 10 rubles, about one pound, on each farm per annum. The local taxation, settled by the villagers in council for their own purposes, such as roads, ditches, bridges and schools, is limited to three rubles per farm per annum. Men who are not landholders pay from one to two rubles per annum. Koreans settled in Siberia prior to 1884 can claim rights as Russian subjects and at this time those who can prove that they have been settled on purchased lands for ten years can do so, as well as certain others, well reported of as being of settled lives and good conduct. 
owing to the steady influx of settlers from southern Russia, the rich lands near the railroad are required for colonization, and further immigration from Korea has been prohibited. The sending of Koreans who are either squatters or of unsettled lives to the Amur province is under discussion. The villages between Krasnoye Chelo and Novo Kievsk are fair average specimens of Russo-Korean settlements. The roads are fairly good, and the ditches which border them well kept. Sanitary rules are strictly enforced, the headmen being made responsible for village cleanliness. Unlike the poor, ragged, filthy villages of the peninsula, these are well built in Korean style, of whitewashed mud and laths, trimly thatched. The compounds or farmyards are enclosed by whitewashed walls or high fences of neatly woven reeds, and look as if they were swept every morning, and the farm buildings are substantial and well kept. Even the pigsties testify to the Argus eyes of the district chiefs of police. Most of the dwellings have four, five, and even six rooms, with papered walls and ceilings, fretwork doors and windows, glazed with white translucent paper, finely matted floors, and an amount of plenishings rarely to be found even in a mandarin's house in Korea. Cabinets, bureaus, and rice chests of ornamental wood with handsome brass decorations, low tables, stools, cushions, brass samovars, dressers displaying brass dinner services, brass bowls, china, tea glasses, brass candlesticks, brass kerosene lamps, and a host of other things illustrate the capacity to secure comfort. Pictures of the Tsar and Tsaritsa, of the Christ and of Greek saints, and framed cards of twelve Christian prayers replace the coarse daubs of the family demons in very many houses. Out of doors, full granaries, ponies, mares with foals, black pigs of an improved breed, draught oxen and fat oxen for the Vladivostok market, with ox carts and agricultural implements, attest solid material prosperity. It would be impossible for a traveller to meet with more cordial hospitality and more cleanly and comfortable accommodation than I did in these Korean homes. But there is more than this. The air of the men has undergone a subtle but real change, and the women, though they nominally keep up their habit of seclusion, have lost the hangdog air which distinguishes them at home. The suspiciousness and indolent conceit, and the servility to his betters, which characterize the home-bred Korean, have very generally given place to an independence and manliness of manner rather British than Asiatic. The alacrity of movement is a change also, and has replaced the conceited swing of the young bun and the heartless lounge of the peasant. There are many chances for making money, and there is neither Mandarin nor young bun to squeeze it out of the people when made, and comforts and a certain appearance of wealth no longer attract the rapacious attentions of officials, but are rather a credit to a man, rather than a source of insecurity. All who work can be comfortable, and many of the farmers are rich and engage in trade, making and keeping extensive contracts. Those Koreans who are not settled on lands chiefly in the direction of the Chinese frontier and who subsist by wood-cutting and hauling are less well off, and their hamlets have something of squalor about them. In Korea I had learned to think of Koreans as the dregs of a race and to regard their condition as hopeless, but in Primorsk I saw reason for considerably modifying my opinion. It must be borne in mind that these people, who have raised themselves into a prosperous farming class, and who get an excellent character for industry and good conduct alike from Russian police officials, Russian settlers, and military officers, were not exceptionally industrious and thrifty men. They were mostly starving folk who fled from famine, and their prosperity and general demeanor give me the hope that their countrymen in Korea if they ever have an honest administration and protection for their earnings, may slowly develop into men. In parts of Western Asia, 
I have had occasion to note the success of Russian administration in conquered or acquired provinces and with subject races, especially her creation of an orderly, peaceful, and settled agricultural population out of the nomadic and predatory tribes of Turkestan. Her success with the Korean immigrants is in its way as remarkable, for the material is inferior. She is firm where firmness is necessary, but outside that limit allows extreme latitude, avoids harassing aliens by petty prohibitions and irksome rules, encourages those forms of local self-government which suit the genius and habits of different peoples, and trusts to time, education, and contact with other forms of civilization to amend what is reprehensible in customs, religion, and costume. A few days later I went to Hunchun on the frontier of Chinese Manchuria, from its position an important military post, and was most hospitably received by the commandant and his married aide de camp. There, as everywhere in Primorsk, and from the civil as well as the military authorities, I not only received the utmost kindness, courtesy, and hospitality, but information was frankly given on the various topics I was interested in, and help towards the attainment of my objects. Hunchun is in the midst of mountainous country, denuded of wood in recent years, and abounding in rich, well-watered valleys inhabited only by Koreans. A wilder, drearier, and more wind-swept situation it would be hard to find. Instead of 4,000 troops, there were only 200 Cossacks, housed in a good brick barrack, one half of which is a much decorated chapel, besides which there are only open thatched sheds for their hardy, active Baikal horses, a small, well-arranged hospital, a wooden house for the colonel commandant, and some terracotta mud houses for the officers and married troopers. The whole Russian military force from Hunchun to the Amur consisted of 1,500 Cossacks, distributed among 30 frontier posts. The commandant told me that their chief duty at that time was the daily arresting of Chinese brigands who crossed the frontier to harry the Korean villages and who, on being marched back and handed over to the mandarins, were at once liberated to repeat their forays. The Chinese had massed several thousand of their Manchu troops at Hunchun, and they had created such a reign of terror that the peasant farmers had deserted their homes over a large area of country. The soldiers, robbed by their officers of their nominal pay and only half fed, relied on unlimited pillage for making up the deficiency, and neither women nor property were safe from their brutality and violence. So desperately undisciplined were they, that only a few days before the secretary and interpreter of the Russian frontier commissioner at Novokievsk, visiting Hunchun on official business, narrowly escaped actual violence at their hands, and the Chinese governor told them that he had no control at all over the troops. It was only the rigid discipline of the Cossacks which prevented scrimmages which might have produced a serious conflagration. End of section 21。section 22 of Korea and her neighbors by Isabella L. Bird。this LibriVox recording is in the public domain。recording by Avai in May 2021。Chapter 20. The Trans-Siberian Railroad After returning to Vladivostok, accompanied by a young Danish gentleman who was kindly lent to me by Messrs. Kuntz and Albers, and who spoke English and Russian, I spent a week on the Yusuri Railway, the eastern section of the Trans-Siberian Railway, going as far as the hamlet of Yusuri on the Yusuri River at the Great Yusuri Bridge, beyond which the line, though completed for fifty versts, was not open for traffic. Indeed, up to that point from Nikolskoye, trains were run twice daily rather to settle the line than for profit, 
and their average speed was only twelve miles an hour. The weather was brilliant, varied by a heavy snowstorm. The present Tsar is understood to be enthusiastic about this railroad. During his visit to Vladivostok in 1891 when Tsarevich, he inaugurated the undertaking by wheeling away the first barrow full of earth and placing the first stone in position, after which work was begun simultaneously at both ends. The eastern terminus of this great railroad undertaking is close to the sea and the government deep water pier, at which the fine steamers from Odessa of the Russian volunteer fleet discharge their cargoes. The station is large and very handsome, and both it and the noble administrative offices are built of grey stone, with the architraves of the doors and windows in red brick. Buffets and all else were in efficient working order. In the winter of 1895-96, to 96, only third and fourth class cars were running, the latter chiefly patronized by Koreans and Chinese. Each third class carriage is divided into three compartments with a corridor and has a lavatory and steam heating apparatus. The backs of the seats are hooked up to form upper berths for sleeping, and as the cars are eight feet high, they admit of broad luggage shelves above these. The engines which ran the traffic were old American locomotives, but those which are to be introduced, as well as all the rolling stock, are being manufactured in the Baltic provinces. So also are the rails, the iron and steel bridges, the water tanks, the iron work required for stations, and all else. Large railway workshops with rows of substantial houses for artisans have been erected at Nikolskoye, 102 versts from Vladivostok, for the repairs of rolling stock on the Usuri section, and were already in full activity. There is nothing about this Usuri railway of the newness and provisional aspect of the Western American lines, or even of parts of the Canadian Pacific Railroad. The track was already ballasted as far as Usuri, 327 versts, steel bridges spanned the minor streams, and substantial stations, either of stone or decorated wood, with buffets at fixed distances, successfully compare both in stability and appearance with those of our English branch lines. The tank houses are of hewn stone. Houses for the employees, standing in neatly fenced gardens, are both decorative and substantial, being built of cement and logs protected by five coats of paint and contain four rooms each. The crossings are well laid and protected. Culverts and retaining walls are of solid masonry, and telegraph wires accompany the road, which is worked strictly on the block system. The aspect of solidity and permanence is remarkable. Even the temporary bridge over the Usuri, 1,050 feet in length, a trestle bridge of heavy timber to resist the impact of the ice, is so massive as to make the great steel bridge, the handsome abutments of which were already built, appear as if it would be a work of supererogation. Up to that point there are no serious embankments or cuttings, and the gradients are easy. The cost of construction of the Usuri section is 50,000 rubles per verst, a ruble at this time being worth about two shillings two pence. This includes rolling stock, stations, and all bridges, except that over the Amur, which was to cost three million rubles, but may now be dispensed with, owing to the diversion of the route through Manchuria. Convict labor was abandoned in 1894, and the line in Primorsk is being constructed by Chinese navvies, who earn about 80 cents per day, and who were bearing the rigor of a Siberian winter in well-warmed, semi-subterranean huts, the line being pushed on as much as possible during the cold season. For the first 102 versts it passes along prettily wooded shores of inlets and banks of streams, and the country is fairly well peopled, judging from the number of sleighs and the bustle at the six stations en route. The line as far as Nikolskoye was opened in early November 1893, 
and in a year had earned 280,000 rubles. The last section had only been open for eight weeks when I travelled upon it. Nikol's Goye, where I spent two pleasant days at the hospitable establishment of Messrs. Kunz and Albers, is the only place between Vladivostok and Yusuri of any present importance. It is a village of 8,000 inhabitants on a rich rolling prairie watered by the Sifun. It has six streets of grotesque width, a verst and a half long each. There is no poverty. It is a place of rapid growth and prosperity, the centre of a great trade in grain, and has a large flour mill owned by Mr. Lindholm, a government contractor. It has a spacious market place and bazaar, and two churches. It reminds me of parts of Salt Lake City, and the houses are of wood, plastered and whitewashed, with corrugated iron roofs mainly. A few are thatched. All stand in plots of garden ground. Utilitarianism is supreme. I drove for twenty miles in the region round the settlement, and everywhere saw prosperous farms and farming villages on the prairie, Russian and Korean, and found the settlers kindly and hospitable, and surrounded by material comfort. Nikolskoye is a great military station. There were infantry and artillery to the number of 9,000, and there, as elsewhere, large new barracks were being pushed to completion. An area of 50 acres was covered with brick barracks, magazines, stables, drill and parade grounds, and officers' quarters, and the military club is a really fine building. Newness, progress, and confidence in the future are as characteristic of Nikolskoye as of any rising town in the far west of America. The farther journey, occupying the greater part of two days and a night, except when near the swamps of the Hanka Lake, is through a superb farming region. Large villages with windmills are met with along the line for the first thirty versts, as far as the buffet station of Spaskoye. The stoneless soil, a rich loam six feet and more in depth, produces heavy crops of oats, wheat, barley, maize, rye, potatoes and tobacco. Beyond Spaskoye and east of the Hanka Lake up to the Amur, a magnificent region waits to be peopled. Well may eastern Siberia receive the name of Russia's Pacific Empire, including as it does the Amur and Maritime provinces, with their area of 880,000 square miles, rich in gold, copper, iron, lead, and coal, and with a soil which for a vast extent is of unbounded fertility. When China ceded to Russia in 1860 the region which we call Russian Manchuria, she probably did so in ignorance of its vast agricultural capacities and mineral wealth. The noble Amur, with its forest-covered shores, is navigable for 1,000 miles, and already 50 merchant steamers ply upon it, and its great tributary, the Yusuri, can be navigated to within 120 miles of Vladivostok. The great basin of the Yusuri, it is estimated, could support 5 million people, and from Kabarovka to the Tumen, it is considered by experts that the land could sustain from 20 to 40 to the square mile, while at present the population of the Amur and Yusuri provinces is only four-fifths of a man to the square mile. Grass, timber, water, coal, minerals, a soil as rich as the prairies of Illinois, and a climate not only favourable to agriculture but to human health, all await the settler, and the broad, unoccupied and fertile lands which Russian Manchuria offers are clamouring for inhabitants. To set against these advantages, there are the frozen waterways and the ice-bound harbour. It is utterly impossible that an increasing population will content itself without an outlet for its produce. A port on the Pacific, open all the year, is fast becoming as much a commercial as a political necessity, and doubtless the opening of the Trans-Siberian Railroad four years hence will settle the question, if it has not been settled before, 
and doom the policy which has shut Russia up in regions of thick-ribbed ice to utter extinction. In the maritime province, Russia is steadily and solidly laying the foundations of a new empire, which she purposes to make as nearly as possible a homogeneous one. No foreigner need apply. The emigrants, who are going out at the rate of from 700 to 1,000 families a year, are of a good class. Emigration is fostered in two ways. By the first, the government grants assisted passages to heads of families who are possessed of 600 rubles, about 60 pounds at present, which are deposited with a government official at Odessa and are repaid to the emigrant on landing at Vladivostok. The industry and thrift represented by this sum indicate a large proportion of the best class of settlers. Under the second arrangement, families possessed of little capital or none receive free passages. On arriving, emigrants of both classes are lodged in excellent emigrant barracks and can buy the necessary agricultural implements at cost price from a government depot, advice as to the purchase being thrown in. Each family receives a free allotment of from 200 to 300 acres of arable land and a loan of 600 rubles, to be repaid without interest in 32 years, the young male colonists being exempted from military service for the same period. Already much of the land along the line as far as the Usuri has been allotted, and houses are rapidly springing up, and there is nothing to prevent this fine country from being peopled up to the Amur, the rivers Sungacha and Yusuri, which form the boundary of Russia from the Hanka Lake to Kabarovka, giving a natural protection from Chinese brigandage. In addition to direct emigration, large numbers of time-expired men, chiefly Cossacks, are encouraged to settle on lands and do so. It would be short-sighted to minimize the importance of the present drift of population to eastern Siberia, which is likely to assume immense proportions on the opening of the railway, or the commercial value of that colossal undertaking which is greatly enhanced by the treaty under which Russia has taken powers to run the Trans-Siberian line through Chinese Manchuria. The creation of a new route, which will bring the Far East within 6,000 miles and 16 days of London, and cheapen the cost of the transit of passengers very considerably, cannot be overlooked either. The railroad is being built for futurity, and is an enterprise worthy of the great nation which undertakes it. Footnote. I am very glad to be able to fortify my opinion of the solid and careful construction of this line by that of Colonel Waters, military attaché to the British Embassy at St. Petersburg, who has recently crossed Siberia and desires to give emphatic testimony to the magnificent character of the great railway crossing Siberia, as well as by that of another recent traveller, Mr. J. Y. Simpson, who, in Blackwood's magazine for January 1897, in an article, The Great Siberian Iron Road, after a long description of the laborious carefulness with which the line is being built, writes thus, Lastly, one is impressed with the extremely finished nature of the work. End footnote. End of section 22. Section 23 of Korea and Her Neighbors by Isabella L. Bird. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in May 2021. Chapter 21 the king's oath an audience leaving vladivostok by the last japanese steamer of the season i spent two days at wonsan little changed except that its background of mountains was snow covered that the koreans were enriched by the extravagant sums paid for labor by the japanese during the war that business was active and that Japanese sentries in wooden sentry boxes guarded the peaceful streets. Twelve thousand Japanese troops had passed through Wonsan on their way to Pyongyang. At Husan, my next point, there were two hundred Japanese soldiers, new waterworks, 
and a new military cemetery on a height, in which the number of graves showed an enormous Japanese mortality. Reaching Chemulpo on 5th January 1895 via Nagasaki, I found a singular contrast to the crowd, bustle and excitement of the previous June. In the outer harbour there were two foreign warships only, in the inner three Japanese merchant steamers. The former predominant military element was represented by a few soldiers, ten large hospital sheds and the crowded cemetery in which the Japanese military dead lie in rows of sixty, each grave marked by a wooden obelisk. The solid and crowded Chinese quarter, with its roaring trade, large shops and noise of drums, gongs and crackers by day and night, was silent and deserted, and not a single Chinese was in the street as I went up to Itai's inn. One shop had ventured to reopen. At night, instead of throngs, noise, lights, and jollification, there was a solitary glimmer from behind a closed shutter. The Japanese occupation had been as destructive of that quarter of Chemulpo as a medieval pestilence. In the Japanese quarter and all along the shore the utmost activity prevailed. The beach was stacked with incoming and outgoing cargo. The streets were only just passable not alone from the enormous traffic on bulls and coolies' backs, but from the piles of beans and rice which were being measured and packed on the roadway. Prices were high, wages had more than doubled, squeezing was diminished, and the Koreans were working with a will. I went up to Seoul on horseback, snow falling the whole time. So safe was the country that no escort was needed, and I rode as far as Oricol without even a mapu. The halfway house of my first visit was a Japanese post, and going to it in ignorance of the change, I was very kindly received by the Japanese soldiers, who gave me tea and a brazier of charcoal. The sole road, packed out by Japanese surveyors for a railroad, was thickly sprinkled for the whole distance with laden men and bulls. At Seoul I was the guest of Mr. Hillier, the British Consul General, for five weeks. The weather was glorious, and the mercury sank on two occasions to seven degrees below zero, the lowest temperature on record. I received the warmest welcome from the kindly foreign community, and was steeped in Seoul life, the political and other interests growing upon me daily, and having a pony and a soldier at my disposal, I saw the city in all its turnings and windings, and the charming country outside the gates, and several of the royal tombs with their fine trees, and avenues of stately stone figures. The stagnation of the previous winter was at an end. Japan was in the ascendant. She had a large garrison in the capital, some of the leading men in the cabinet were her nominees, her officers were drilling the Korean army, Changes, if not improvements, were everywhere, and the air was thick with rumours of more to come. The king, whose royal authority was nominally restored to him, accepted the situation. The queen was credited with intriguing against the Japanese, but Count Inoue was acting as Japanese minister, and his firmness and tact kept everything smooth on the surface. On the 8th of January 1895, I witnessed a singular ceremony which may have far-reaching results in Korean history. The Japanese, having presented Korea with the gift of independence, demanded that the king should formally and publicly renounce the suzerainty of China, and, having resolved to cleanse the Ogean stable of official corruption, they compelled him to inaugurate the task by proceeding in semi-state to the altar of the spirits of the land, and there proclaiming Korean independence, and swearing before the spirits of his ancestors to the proposed reforms. His Majesty, by exaggerating a trivial ailment, had for some time delayed a step which was very repulsive to him, and even the day before the ceremony, a dream in which an ancestral spirit had appeared to him, 
adjuring him not to depart from ancestral ways, terrified him from taking the proposed pledge. But the spirit of Count Inoue proved more masterful than the ancestral spirit, and the oath was taken in circumstances of great solemnity in a dark pine wood under the shadow of Puk Han at the most sacred altar in Korea, in presence of the court and the dignitaries of the kingdom. Old and serious men had fasted and mourned for two previous days, and in the vast crowd of white-robed and black-hatted men which looked down upon the striking scene from a hill in the grounds of the Mulberry Palace, there was not a smile or a spoken word. The sky was dark and grim, and a bitter east wind was blowing, ominous signs in Korean estimation. The royal procession, which had something of the aspect of the Kurdong, was shorn of the barbaric splendor which made that ceremonial one of the most imposing in the Eastern world. It was, in fact, barbaric with the splendor left out, and there were suggestions of a new era and a forthcoming swamping wave of Western civilization, in the presence within the palace gates and in the procession of a few trim, dapper, blue ulster Japanese policemen, as the special protectors of the Home Minister Park Yong Ho, one of the revolutionaries of 1884, against whom there was a vow of vengeance, though the king had been compelled to pardon him, to reinstate his ancestors who had been degraded, to recall him from exile, and to confer upon him high office. The long road outside the palace was lined with Korean cavalry, who turned their faces to the wall and their backs and their ponies' tails to the king. Great numbers of Korean soldiers carrying various makes of muskets, dressed in rusty black, brown and blue cotton uniforms, trousers sometimes a foot too short, at others a foot too long, white wadded socks, string shoes and black felt hats of Tyrolese style with pink ribbon round the crowns, stood in awkward huddles, mixed up with the newly created sole police in blue European uniforms and a number of handsome overfed ponies of court officials with saddles over a foot high, gorgeous barbaric trappings, red pompons on their heads and a flow of red manes. The populace stood without speech or movement. After a long delay and much speculation as to whether the king at the last moment would resist the foreign pressure, the procession emerged from the palace gate, huge flags on trident-headed poles, purple bundles carried aloft, a stand of stones conveyed with much ceremony. Footnote. These are ancient musical instruments called by the Chinese Qing and were in use at courts in the days of Confucius. End footnote. Groups of scarlet and blue-robed men in hats of the same colors, shaped like fool's caps, the king's personal servants in yellow robes and yellow bamboo hats, and men carrying bannerets. Then came the red silk umbrella, followed not by the magnificent state chair with its forty bearers, but by a plain wooden chair with glass sides, in which sat the sovereign, pale and dejected, borne by only four men. The crown prince followed in a similar chair. Mandarins, ministers, and military officers were then assisted to mount their caparisoned ponies, and each, with two attendants holding his stirrups and two more leading his pony, fell in behind the home minister, riding a dark donkey and rendered conspicuous by his foreign saddle and foreign guard. When the procession reached the sacred enclosure, the military escort and the greater part of the cavalcade remained outside the wall. Only the king, dignitaries, and principal attendants proceeded to the altar. The grouping of the scarlet-robed men under the dark pines was most effective from an artistic point of view, and from a political standpoint the taking of the following oath by the Korean king was one of the most significant acts in the tedious drama of the late war. The King's Oath On this twelfth day of the twelfth moon of the 503rd year of the founding of the dynasty, 
we presume to announce clearly to the spirits of all our sacred imperial ancestors that we their lowly descendant received in early childhood now thirty and one years ago the mighty heritage of our ancestors and that in reverent awe towards heaven and following in the rule and pattern of our ancestors we though we have encountered many troubles have not loosed hold of the thread how dare we your lowly descendant aver that we are acceptable to the heart of heaven it is only that our ancestors have graciously looked down upon us and benignly protected us splendidly did our ancestor lay the foundation of our royal house opening a way for us his descendants through five hundred years and three now in our generation the times are mightily changed and men and matters are expanding a friendly power designing to prove faithful and the deliberations of our council aiding thereto show that only as an independent ruler can we make our country strong how can we your lowly descendant not conform to the spirit of the time and thus guard the domain bequeathed by our ancestors how venture not to strenuously exert ourselves and stiffen and anneal us in order to add lustre to the virtues of our predecessors for all time from now no other state will we lean upon but will make broad the steps of our country towards prosperity building up the happiness of our people in order to strengthen the foundations of our independence when we ponder on this course let there be no sticking in the old ways no practice of ease or of dalliance but docilely let us carry out the great designs of our ancestors watching and observing sublunary conditions reforming our internal administration remedying their accumulated abuses we your lowly descendant do now take the fourteen clauses of the great charter and swear before the spirits of our ancestors in heaven that we reverently trusting in the merits bequeathed by our ancestors will bring these to a successful issue nor will we dare to go back on our word do you bright spirits descend and behold one all thoughts of dependence on china shall be cut away and a firm foundation for independence secured two a rule and ordinance for the royal house shall be established in order to make clear the line of succession and precedence among the royal family three the king shall attend at the great hall for the inspection of affairs where after personally interrogating his ministers he shall decide upon matters of state the queen and the royal family are not allowed to interfere four palace matters and the government of the country must be kept separate and may not be mixed up together five the duties and powers of the cabinet and of the various ministers shall be clearly defined six the payment of taxes by the people shall be regulated by law wrongful additions may not be made to the list and no excess collected seven the assessment and collection of the land tax and the disbursement of expenditure shall be under the charge and control of the finance department the expenses of the royal household shall be the first to be reduced by way of setting an example to the various ministries and local officials nine an estimate shall be drawn up in advance each year of the expenditure of the royal household and the various official establishments putting on a firm foundation the management of the revenue ten the regulations of the local officers must be revised in order to discriminate the functions of the local officials eleven young men of intelligence in the country shall be sent abroad in order to study foreign science and industries twelve the instruction of army officers and the practice of the methods of enlistment to secure the foundation of a military system thirteen 
civil law and criminal law must be strictly and clearly laid down none must be imprisoned or fined in excess so that security of life and property may be insured for all alike fourteen men shall be employed without regard to their origin and in seeking for officials recourse shall be had to capital and country alike in order to widen the avenues for ability official translation of the text of the oath taken by his majesty the king of korea at the altar of heaven seoul on january eighth eighteen ninety five though at this date korea is being reformed under other than japanese auspices it is noteworthy that nearly every step in advance is on the lines laid down by japan count inoue is reported by the nichi nichi shimbun to have said regarding korea in my eyes there were only the royal family and the nation such a conclusion was legitimate in the early part of eighteen ninety five and in arriving at it as i did i am glad to be sheltered by such an unexceptionable authority hence it was with real pleasure that i received an invitation from the queen to a private audience to which i was accompanied by mrs underwood an american medical missionary and the queen's physician and valued friend mr hillier sent me to the king pok palace in an eight-bearer official chair escorted by the korean legation guard i have been altogether six times at this palace and always with increased wonder at its intricacy and admiration of its quaintness and beauty entering by a grand three-arched gateway with its stone balustraded stone staircase and stone lions on stone pedestals below one is bewildered by the number of large flagged courtyards huge audience halls pavilions buildings of all descriptions more or less decorated stone bridges narrow passages and gateways with double-tiered carved roofs through and among which one passes a japanese policeman was at the grand gate at each of the interior gates and there are many there were six korean sentries lounging who pulled themselves together as we approached and presented arms what with eight hundred troops one thousand five hundred attendants and officials of all descriptions courtiers and ministers and their attendants secretaries messengers and hangers-on the vast enclosure of the palace seemed as crowded and populated as the city itself we had nearly half a mile of buildings to pass through before we reached a very pretty artificial lake with a decorative island pavilion in the centre near which are a foreign palace built not long before and the simple korean buildings then occupied by the king and queen alighting at the gateway of the courtyard which led to the queen's house we were received by the court interpreter a number of eunuchs two of the queen's ladies-in-waiting and her nurse who was at the head of the palace ladies a very privileged person middle-aged with decidedly fine features in a simple room hung with yellow silk we were entertained in a courteous fashion with coffee and cake on arriving and afterwards at dinner the nurse supported by the court interpreter taking the head of the very prettily decorated table the dinner was admirably cooked in foreign style and included soup fish quails wild duck pheasant stuffed and rolled beef vegetables creams glassy walnuts fruit claret and coffee several of the court ladies and others sat at table with us after this long delay we were ushered accompanied only by the interpreter into a small audience room upon the dais at one end of which stood the king the crown prince and the queen in front of three crimson velvet chairs which after mrs underwood had presented me they resumed and asked us to be seated on two chairs which were provided her majesty who was then past forty was a very nice-looking slender woman with glossy raven-black hair and a very pale skin the pallor enhanced by the use of pearl powder 
the eyes were cold and keen, and the general expression one of brilliant intelligence. She wore a very handsome, very full, and very long skirt of mazarine blue brocade, heavily pleated, with the waist under the arms, and a full-sleeved bodice of crimson and blue brocade, clasped at the throat by a coral rosette and girdled by six crimson and blue cords, each one clasped with a coral rosette with a crimson silk tassel hanging from it. Her headdress was a crownless black silk cap edged with fur, pointed over the brow with a coral rose and full red tassel in front and jeweled aigrettes on either side. Her shoes were of the same brocade as her dress. As soon as she began to speak, and especially when she became interested in conversation, her face lighted up into something very like beauty. The king is short and sallow, certainly a plain man, wearing a thin moustache and a tuft on the chin. He is nervous and twitches his hands, but his pose and manner are not without dignity. His face is pleasing, and his kindliness of nature is well known. In conversation, the queen prompted him a good deal. He and the crown prince were dressed alike in white leather shoes, wadded silk socks, and voluminous wadded white trousers. Over these they wore first white silk tunics, next pale green ones, and overall sleeveless dresses of mazarine blue brocade. The whole costume, being exquisitely fresh, was pleasing. On their heads they wore hats and manghuns of very fine horsehair gauze, with black silk hoods bordered with fur, for the mercury stood at five degrees below zero. The crown prince is fat and flabby, and though unfortunately very near-sighted, etiquette forbids him to wear spectacles, and at that time he produced on every one, as on me, the impression of being completely an invalid. He was the only son and the idol of his mother, who lived in ceaseless anxiety about his health, and in dread, lest the son of a concubine should be declared heir to the throne. To this cause must be attributed several of her unscrupulous acts, her invoking the continual aid of sorcerers, and her always increasing benefactions to the Buddhist monks. During much of the audience, mother and son sat with clasped hands. After the queen had said many kind things to me personally, showing herself quick-witted as well as courteous, she said something to the king, who immediately took up the conversation and continued it for another half hour. At the close of the audience, I asked leave to photograph the lake pavilion, and the king said, Why that alone? come many days and photograph many things, mentioning several, and he added, I should like you to be suitably attended. We then curtsied ourselves out after a very agreeable and interesting hour, and as it was dusk, the king sent soldiers with us and a number of lantern bearers with floating drapery of red and green silk gauze. Two days later, the suitable attendants turned out to be an unwieldy and embarrassing crowd, consisting of five military officers, half a regiment of soldiers, and a number of palace attendants. I was greatly impressed by a certain grandeur and stateliness in the buildings, the vast hall of audience resting on a much elevated terrace ascended by a triple flight of granite stairs, the noble proportions of the building, the richly carved ceiling with its manifold reticulations, painted red, blue, and green, the colossal circular pillars, red with white bases, and in the dimness of the vast area fronting the entrance, the shadowy splendor of the Korean throne. Grand, too, in its simplicity and solidity, is the summer palace or hall of congratulations, on a stone platform approached by three granite bridges, in a lotus lake of oblong form beautified conventionally with two stone-faced islands, and by a broad flagged promenade carried the whole way round it on a stone-faced embankment. This palace is a noble building. 
the upper hall with its vast sweeping roof is supported on forty-eight granite pillars sixteen feet in height and three feet square at the base all monoliths the situation and the views are beautiful during the next three weeks i had three more audiences on the second being accompanied as before by mrs underwood the third being a formal reception and the fourth a strictly private interview lasting over an hour on each occasion i was impressed with the grace and charming manner of the queen her thoughtful kindness her singular intelligence and force and her remarkable conversational power even through the medium of an interpreter i was not surprised at her singular political influence or her sway over the king and many others she was surrounded by enemies chief among them being the tai won kung the king's father all embittered against her because by her talent and force she had succeeded in placing members of her family in nearly all the chief offices of state her life was a battle she fought with all her charm shrewdness and sagacity for power for the dignity and safety of her husband and son and for the downfall of the taiwan kun she had cut short many lives but in doing so she had not violated korean tradition and custom and some excuse for her lies in the fact that soon after the king's accession his father sent to the house of her majesty's brother an infernal machine in the shape of a beautiful box which on being opened exploded killing her mother brother and nephew as well as some others since then he plotted against her own life and the feud between them was usually at fever heat the dynasty is worn out and the king with all his amiability and kindness of heart is weak in character and is at the mercy of designing men as has appeared increasingly since the strong sway of the queen was withdrawn i believe him to be at heart according to his lights a patriotic sovereign far from standing in the way of reform he has accepted most of the suggestions offered to him but unfortunately for a man whose edicts become the law of the land and more unfortunately for the land he is persuadable by the last person who gets his ear he lacks backbone and tenacity of purpose and many of the best projects of reform become abortive through his weakness of will to substitute constitutional restraints for absolutism would greatly mend matters but cela va sans dire this could only be successful under foreign initiative the king was forty-three the queen a little older during his minority and while he was receiving the usual chinese education his father the taiwan kun who is described by a korean writer as having bowels of iron and a heart of stone ruled as regent with excessive vigor for ten years and in eighteen sixty six put two thousand korean catholics to death able rapacious and unscrupulous his footsteps have always been blood-stained he even put to death one of his own sons from the time when his regency ceased until the murder of the queen korean political history is mainly the story of the deadly feud between the queen and her clan and the taiwan kun i was presented to him at the palace and was much impressed by the vitality and energy of his expression his keen glance and the vigor of his movements though he is an old man the king's expression is gentle he has a wonderful memory and is said to know korean history so well that when any question as to fact or former custom arises he can give full particulars with a precise reference to the reign in which any historic event occurred and to the date the office of royal reader is not a sinecure and the royal library which is contained in one of the most beautiful buildings of the king pok palace is a very extensive one in chinese literature he has no anti-foreign feeling his friendliness to foreigners is marked and in his manifold perils he has frankly relied upon their aid 
At the time of my second visit, when Japan was in the ascendant, the king and queen showed special attention and kindness to Europeans, and even invited the whole foreign community to a skating party on the lake. The king's attitude towards Christian missions is very friendly and toleration is a reality. The American medical attendants of both the king and queen, as well as other foreigners with whom they were in constant contact, were warmly attached to them, and I think that the general feeling among Koreans is one of affectionate loyalty, the blame for oppressive and mistaken actions being laid on the ministers. I have dwelt so long on the king's personality because he is de facto the Korean government and not a mere figurehead, as there is no constitution, written or unwritten, no representative assembly, and it may be said no law except his published edicts. He is extremely industrious as a ruler, acquaints himself with all the work of departments, receives and attends to an infinity of reports and memorials, and concerns himself with all that is done in the name of government. It is often said that in close attention to detail he undertakes more than any one man could perform. At the same time he has not the capacity for getting a general grip of affairs. He has so much goodness of heart and so much sympathy with progressive ideas that if he had more force of character and intellect and were less easily swayed by unworthy men, he might make a good sovereign, but his weakness of character is fatal. The subjects of conversation introduced at three of my audiences not only showed an intelligent desire for such information as might be serviceable, but reflected the reforms which the Japanese were pressing on the king. I was very closely questioned as to what I had seen of China and Siberia, as to the Siberian and Japanese railroads, cost of construction per li, as to the popular feeling in Japan concerning the war, etc. Again I was catechized as to the avenues to official employment in England, the possibility of men not of the noble class reaching high positions in the government, the position of the English nobility with regard to privileges, and their attitude to inferiors. On one day, the whole attention of the king and queen was concentrated on the relations between the English crown and the cabinet, especially with regard to the civil list, on which the king's questions were so numerous and persistent as very nearly to pose me. He was specially anxious to know if the finance minister, the chancellor of the exchequer, I suppose, exercised any control over the personal expenditure of Her Majesty, and if the Queen's personal accounts were paid by herself or through the Treasury. The affairs under the control of each Secretary of State were the subject of another series of questions. Many queries were about the duties of the Home Minister, the position of the Premier, and his relations with the other Ministers and the Crown. He was very anxious to know if the Queen could dismiss her Ministers if they failed to carry out her wishes, and it was impossible to explain to him through an interpreter, to whom the ideas were unfamiliar, the constitutional checks on the English crown, and that the sovereign only nominally possesses the right of choosing her ministers. Just before I left Korea, I was summoned to a farewell audience and asked to take the legation interpreter with me. I went in an eight-bearer chair and was received with the usual honours, soldiers presenting arms, etc. There was no crowd of attendants and no delay. As I was being escorted down a closed veranda by several eunuchs and military officers, a sliding window was opened by the king, who beckoned to me to enter, and then closed it. I found myself in the raised alcove in which the royal family usually sat, but the sliding panels between it and the audience chamber were closed, and as it is not more than six feet wide, it was impossible to make the customary profound curtsies. Instead of the usual throng of attendants, eunuchs, ladies-in-waiting in silk gowns a yard too long for them, and heavy coils and pillows of artificial hair on their heads, 
and privileged persons standing behind the king and queen and crowding the many doorways there were present only the queen's nurse and my interpreter who stood at a chink between the panels where he could not see the queen bent into an attitude of abject reverence never lifting his eyes from the ground or raising his voice above a whisper the precautions however failed to secure the privacy which the king and queen desired i was certain that through the chink i saw the shadow of a man in the audience room and the interpreter's subsequent remark it was very hard for me to interpret for his majesty to-day was intelligible when i heard that the shadow belonged to one of the ministers of state specially distrusted by the king and who later had to fly from korea it was understood that this person carried the substance of what the king and queen said to a foreign legation i cannot here allude to the matter on which the king spoke but the audience which lasted for an hour was an extremely interesting one on one point the king expressed himself very strongly as he has done to many others he considers that now that korea is formally independent of china she is entitled to a resident minister accredited solely to the korean court he expressed great regard and esteem for mr hillier and said that nothing would be more acceptable to him than his appointment as the first minister to korea the queen spoke of queen victoria and said she has everything that she can wish greatness wealth and power her sons and grandsons are kings and emperors and her daughters empresses does she ever in her glory think of poor korea she does so much good in the world her life is a good we wish her long life and prosperity to which the king added england is our best friend it was really touching to hear the occupants of that ancient but shaky throne speaking in this fashion on this occasion the queen was dressed in a bodice of brocaded amber satin a mazarine blue brocaded train skirt a crimson girdle with five clasps and tassels of coral and a coral clasp at the throat her head was uncovered and her abundant black hair gathered into a knot at the back she wore no ornament except a pearl and coral jewel on the top of the head the king and queen rose when i took leave and the queen shook hands they both spoke most kindly and expressed the wish that i should return and see more of korea when i did return nine months later the queen had been barbarously murdered and the king was practically a prisoner in his own palace travellers received by the korean king have often ridiculed the audience the surroundings and the palace i must say that i saw nothing to ridicule unless national customs and etiquette varying from our own are necessarily ridiculous on the contrary there were a simplicity dignity kindliness courtesy and propriety which have left a very agreeable impression on me and my four audience at palace were the great feature of my second visit to korea end of section 23、section 24 of korea and her neighbors by isabella l bird this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by avai in may 2021 chapter 22 a transition stage during january eighteen ninety five seoul was in a curious condition the old order was changing but the new had not taken its place the japanese victorious by land and sea were in a position to enforce the reforms in which before the war they had asked china to cooperate the king since the capture of the palace by the japanese in july eighteen ninety four had become little more than a salaried automaton and the once powerful members of the min clan had been expelled from their offices the japanese were prepared to accept the responsibility of the supervision of all departments and to enforce honesty on a corrupt executive 
the victory over the chinese at pyongyang on seventeenth september eighteen ninety four had set them free to carry out their purposes count inoue one of the foremost of the statesmen who created the new japan arrived as resident on october twentieth eighteen ninety four and practically administered the government in the king's name there were japanese controllers in all the departments the army was drilled by japanese drill instructors a police force was organized and clothed in badly fitting japanese uniforms a council of koreans was appointed to draft a scheme of reform and form the nucleus of a possible korean parliament and count inoue as japanese adviser had the right of continual access to the king and with an interpreter and stenographer sat at the meetings of the cabinet every day japanese ascendancy was apparent in new appointments regulations abolitions and reforms the japanese claimed that their purpose was to reform the administration of korea as we had done that of egypt and i believe they would have done it had they been allowed a free hand it was apparent however that count inoue found the task of reformation a far harder one than he had expected and that the difficulties in his way were nearly insurmountable he said himself that there were no tools to work with and in the hope of manufacturing them a large number of youths of the upper class were sent for two years to japan one year to be spent in education and another in learning accuracy and the first principles of honor in certain government departments sundry japanese demands though conceded at the time by the king had been allowed to drop and it was not till december eighteen ninety four that count inoue obtained a formal covenant that five of them should be at once carried out one a full pardon for all the conspirators of eighteen eighty four two that the taiwan kun and the queen should interfere no more in public affairs three that no relatives of the royal family should be employed in any official capacity four that the number of eunuchs and palace ladies should at once be reduced to a minimum five that caste distinctions patrician and plebeian should no longer be recognized edicts on some of the foregoing subjects appeared in the gazette and large numbers of the eunuchs packed up their clothes and left the palace quietly in the night along with the palace ladies but the king in his vast dwelling was so lonely without them that the next morning he sent an order commanding their immediate return under serious penalties and it was obeyed at once the attitude of the korean official class with the exception of a small number who were personally interested in the success of japan was altogether unfavorable to the new regime and every change was regarded with indignation though destitute of true patriotism the common people looked upon the king as a sacred person and they were furious at the indignities to which he had been subjected the official class saw that reform meant the end of squeezing and ill-gotten gains and they with the whole army of parasites and hangers-on of yamens were all pledged by the strongest personal interest to oppose it by active opposition or passive resistance though corruption has its stronghold in seoul every provincial government repeats on a smaller scale the iniquities of the capital and has its own army of dishonest and lazy officials fattening on the earnings of the industrial classes the cleansing of the ogean stable of the korean official system which the japanese had undertaken was indeed a herculean labor traditions of honor and honesty if they ever existed had been forgotten for centuries standards of official rectitude were unknown in korea when the japanese undertook the work of reform there were but two classes the robbers and the robbed and the robbers included the vast army which constituted officialdom squeezing and peculation were the rule from the highest to the lowest and every position was bought and sold the transition stage 
down to 12th February 1895, when I left Korea, was a remarkable one. The official gazette curiously reflected that singular period. One day, a decree abolished the three feet long tobacco pipes, which were the delight of the Koreans of the capital. Another, there was an enlightened statute ordering the planting of pines to remedy the denudation of the hills around Seoul, the same gazette directing that duly appointed geomancers should find an auspicious day on which the king might worship at the ancestral tablets. One day, barbarous and brutalizing punishments were wisely abolished. Another, there appeared a string of vexatious and petty regulations calculated to harass the Chinese out of the kingdom, and appointing as a punishment for the breach of them a fine of one hundred dollars or one hundred blows. Failure intact was one great fault of the Japanese. The seizure of the palace and the king's person in July 1894, even if a dubious political necessity, did not excuse the indignities to which the sovereign was exposed. The forcing of former conspirators into high office was a grave error, and tactless proceedings, such as the abolition of long pipes, alterations in court and other dress, many interferences with social customs, and petty and harassing restrictions and regulations, embittered the people against the new regime. The Tonghaks, who had respectfully thrown off allegiance to the king on the ground that he was in the hands of foreigners, and had appointed another sovereign, had been vanquished early in January, and their king's head had been sent to Seoul by a loyal governor. There I saw it in the busiest part of the Peking Road, a bustling market outside the little west gate, hanging from a rude arrangement of three sticks like a camp kettle stand, with another head below it. Both faces wore a calm, almost dignified expression. Not far off, two more heads had been exposed in a similar frame, but it had given way, and they lay in the dust of the roadway, much gnawed by dogs at the back. The last agony was stiffened on their features. A turnip lay beside them, and some small children cut pieces from it and presented them mockingly to the blackened mouths. This brutalizing spectacle had existed for a week. Three days later, in the stillness of the Korean New Year's Day, I rode with a friend along a lonely road passing through a fair agricultural valley among pine-clothed knolls outside the south and east gates of Seoul. Snow lay on the ground, and the grim sky threatened a further storm. It was cold, and we observed with surprise three coolies in summer cotton clothing lying by the roadside asleep. But it was the last sleep, for on approaching them we found that, though their attitudes were those of easy repose, the bodies were without heads, nor had the headsman's axe been merciful or sharp. In the middle of the road were great, frozen, crimson splashes where the Tonghak leaders had expiated their treason, criminals in Korea, as in old Jerusalem, suffering without the gate. A few days later an order appeared in the Gazette abolishing beheadings and slicing to death, and substituting death by strangulation for civil and by shooting for military capital crimes. This order practically made an end of the prerogative of life and death heretofore possessed by the Korean sovereigns. So, the old order was daily changing under the pressure of the Japanese advisers, and on the whole changing most decidedly for the better, though, owing to the number of reforms decreed and in contemplation, everything was in a tentative and chaotic state. Korea was swithering between China and Japan. Afraid to go in heartily for the reforms initiated by Japan, lest China should regain position and be down upon her, and afraid to oppose them actively, lest Japan should be permanently successful. On that same New Year's Day there was more to be seen than headless trunks. Through the length of Seoul, towards twilight, an odor of burning hair overpowered the aromatic scent of the pine brush, and all down every street, outside every door, there were red glimmers of light. 
it is the custom in every family on that day to carry out the carefully preserved clippings and combings of the family hair and burn them in potsherds a practice which it is hoped will prevent the entrance of certain demons into the house during the year rude straw dolls stuffed with a few cash were also thrown into the street this effigy is believed to take away troubles and foist them on whoever picks it up to prevent such a vicarious calamity more than one mother on that evening pounced upon a child who childlike had picked up the doll and threw it far from him on that night round pieces of red or white paper placed in cleft sticks are put upon the roofs of houses and those persons who have been warned by the sorcerers of troubles to come pray to the moon to remove them a common korean custom on the same day is for people to paint images on paper and to write against them their troubles of body or mind afterwards giving the paper to a boy who burns it a more singular new year custom in seoul is walking the bridges up to midnight men women and children cross a bridge or bridges as many times as they are years old this is believed to prevent pains in the feet and legs during the year this day the great fifteenth day concludes the kite flying and stone fights which enliven seoul for the previous fortnight and every korean insists on keeping it as a holiday graves are formally visited and gathered families spread food before the ancestral tablets curious customs prevail at this time a few days before the palace eunuchs chant invocations swinging burning torches as they do so this is supposed to ensure bountiful crops for the next season people buy quantities of nuts which they crack hold the kernels in the mouth and then throw them away this is to prevent summer sores and boils also on the great fifteenth day men try to find out the probable rainfall for each month by splitting a small piece of bamboo and lying twelve beans side by side in one of the halves after which it is closed and after being bound tightly with cord is lowered into a well for the night each bean represents a month in the morning when they are examined in rotation they are variously enlarged and the enlargement indicates the proportion of rain in that special moon if on the contrary one or more are wizened it causes great alarm as indicating complete or partial drought in one or more months dogs do not get their usual meal on the morning of the great fifteenth in the belief that the deprivation will keep them from being pestered with flies during the long summer if a boy has been born during the year poles bearing paper fish by day and lanterns by night project from the house of the parents the people at night watch the burning of candles if they are entirely burned the life of the child will be long if only partially burned it will be proportionately shorter i left seoul very regretfully on fifth february the japanese had introduced jin rikshas but the runners were unskilled and i met with so severe an accident in going down to chemulpo that i did not recover for a year the line of steamers to japan was totally disorganized by the war and in the week that i had waited for the higomaru war was uppermost in people's thoughts there were some who even then could not bring themselves to believe in the eventual success of the japanese the fall of wei hai wei and the capture of the chinese fleet opened many eyes i was in the office of the n y k when the news came and the clerks were too wild with excitement to attend to me apologizing by saying it's another victory chemulpo was decorated illuminated and processioned for victories li hung chang was burned in effigy and unlimited sake for all comers was supplied from tubs at the street corners there were indications of the cost of victory however the great military hospitals were full the cemetery was filling fast military funerals with military pomp and shinto priests passed down the bannered street 
and six hundred transport coolies tramping from Manchuria arrived in rags and tatters, some clothed in raw hides and raw skins of sheep, their feet, hands, and lips frost-bitten, and with blackened stumps of fingers and toes protruding from filthy bandages. The Japanese schools teach that Japan has a right to demand all that a man has, and that life itself is not too costly a sacrifice for him to lay on the altar of his country. Undoubtedly the teaching bears fruit. Not long before at Osaka I saw the wharves piled high with voluntary contributions for the troops, and the Third Army leave the city amidst an outburst of popular enthusiasm such as I never saw equalled. Most of these coolies, when they received new clothing, volunteered for further service, and dying soldiers on battlefields and in hospitals uttered, Dai Nippon, Banzai, Great Japan Forever, with their last faltering breath. When I left Korea, the condition of things may be summarized thus. Japan was thoroughly in earnest as to reforming the Korean administration through Koreans, and very many reforms were decreed or in contemplation, while some evils and abuses were already swept away. The king, deprived of his absolute sovereignty, was practically a salaried registrar of decrees. Count Inoue occupied the position of resident, and the government was administered in the king's name by a cabinet consisting of the heads of ten departments, in some measure the nominees of the resident. Footnote. I repeat this statement in this form for the benefit of the reader, and ask him to compare it with a summary of Korean affairs early in 1897, given in the 36th chapter of this volume. End footnote. End of section 24. Section 25 of Korea and Her Neighbors by Isabella L. Bird. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in May 2021. Chapter 23. The Assassination of the Queen. In May 1895, a treaty of peace between China and Japan was signed at Shimonoseki, a heavy indemnity, the island of Formosa and a great accession of prestige being the gains of Japan. From thenceforward, no power having interests in the Far East could afford to regard her as a quantité négligeable. After travelling for some months in South and Mid-China, and spending the summer in Japan, I arrived in Nagasaki in October 1895 to hear a rumor of the assassination of the Korean Queen, afterwards confirmed on board the Surugamaru by Mr. Sill, the American minister who was hurrying back to his post in Seoul in consequence of the disturbed state of affairs. I went up immediately from Chemulpo to the capital, where I was Mr. Hillier's guest at the English legation for two exciting months. The native and foreign communities were naturally much excited by the tragedy at the palace and the treatment which the king was receiving. Count Inoue, whose presence in Seoul always produced confidence, had left a month before and had been succeeded by General Viscount Miura, a capable soldier without diplomatic experience. In an interview which Count Inoue had with the Queen shortly before his departure, speaking of the ascendancy of the Taiwan Kun after the capture of the palace by Mr. Otori in the previous July, Her Majesty said, It is a matter of regret to me that the overtures made by me towards Japan were rejected. The Taiwan Kun, on the other hand, who showed his unfriendliness towards Japan, was assisted by the Japanese minister to rise in power. In the dispatch in which Count Inoue reported this interview to his government, he wrote, I gave as far as I could an explanation of these things to the Queen, and after so allaying her suspicions, I further explained that it was the true and sincere desire of the Emperor and Government of Japan to place the independence of Korea on a firm basis, 
and in the meantime to strengthen the royal house of Korea. In the event of any member of the royal family, or indeed any Korean, therefore attempting treason against the royal house, I gave the assurance that the Japanese government would not fail to protect the royal house even by force of arms, and so secure the safety of the kingdom. These remarks of mine seemed to have moved the king and queen, and their anxiety for the future appeared to be much relieved. The Korean sovereigns would naturally think themselves justify in relying on the promise so frankly given by one of the most distinguished of Japanese statesmen, whom they had learned to regard with confidence and respect, and it is clear to myself that when the fateful night came, a month later, their reliance on this assurance led them to omit certain possible precautions and caused the queen to neglect to make her escape at the first hint of danger. When the well-known arrangement between Viscount Miura and the Taiwan Kun was ripe for execution, the Japanese minister directed the commandant of the Japanese battalion, quartered in the barracks just outside the palace gate, to facilitate the Taiwan Kun's entry into the palace by arranging the disposition of the Kunren Tai, Korean troops drilled by Japanese, and by calling out the imperial force to support them. Miura also called upon two Japanese to collect their friends, go to Ryongsan on the Han, where the intriguing prince was then living, and act as his bodyguard on his journey to the palace. The minister told them that on the success of the enterprise depended the eradication of the evils which had afflicted the kingdom for twenty years, and instigated them to dispatch the queen when they entered the palace. One of Miura's agents then ordered the Japanese policemen, who were off duty, to put on civilian dress, provide themselves with swords, and accompany the conspirators to the Taiwan Kun's house. At 3 a.m. on the morning of the 8th of October, they left Ryongsan, escorting the Princess Palaquin, Mr. Okamoto, to whom much had been entrusted, assembling the whole party when on the point of departure, and declaring to them that on entering the palace the fox should be dealt with according as exigency might require. Then this procession, including ten Japanese who had dressed themselves in uniforms taken from ten captured Korean police, started for Seoul, more than three miles distant. Outside the gate of staunch loyalty, they were met by the Kunren Tai, and then waited for the arrival of the Japanese troops, after which they proceeded at a rapid pace to the palace, entering it by the front gate, and after killing some of the palace guard, proceeded a quarter of a mile to the buildings occupied by the king and queen, which have a narrow courtyard in front. So far I have followed the Hiroshima judgment in its statement of the facts of that morning, but when it has conducted the combined force to the inner chambers, it concludes abruptly with a not proven in the case of all the accused. For the rest of the story, so far as it may interest my readers, I follow the statements of General Dai and Mr. Sabatin of the King's Guard and of certain official documents. It is necessary here to go back upon various events which preceded the murder of Her Majesty. Trouble arose in October between the Kunren Tai and the Seoul police, resulting in the total defeat of the latter. The Kunren Tai, numbering 1,000, were commanded by Colonel Hong, who in 1882 had rescued the Queen from imminent danger and was trusted by the royal family. The palace was in the hands of the old guard under Colonel Hyon, who had saved Her Majesty's life in 1884. In the first week of October, the strength of this guard was greatly reduced, useful weapons were quietly withdrawn, and the ammunition was removed. On the night of the 7th, the Kunren Tai, with their Japanese instructors, marched and countermarched till they were found on all sides of the palace, causing some uneasiness within. The alarm was given to General Dai and Mr. Sabatin early on the morning of the 8th. Footnote. General Dai, late of the U.S. Army, was instructor of the old guard. 
Mr. Sabatin, a Russian subject, was temporarily employed as a watchman to see that the sentries were at their posts. End footnote. These officers, looking through a chink of the gate, saw a number of Japanese soldiers with fixed bayonets standing there, who, on being asked what they were doing, filed right and left out of the moonlight under the shadow of the wall. Skulking under another part of the wall were over two hundred of the Kunrentai. The two foreigners were consulting as to the steps to be taken, when heavy sounds of battering came from the grand entrance gate, followed by firing. General Dai attempted to rally the guard, but after five or six volleys from the assailants, they broke with such a rush as to sweep the two foreigners past the king's house to the gateway of the queen's. No clear account has ever been given of the events which followed. Colonel Hong, the commander of the Kunrentai, was cut down by a Japanese officer at the great gate, and was afterwards mortally wounded by eight bullets. The Kunrentai swarmed into the palace from all directions, along with Japanese civilians armed with swords, who frantically demanded the whereabouts of the queen, hauling the palace ladies about by the hair to compel them to point out her majesty, rushing in and out of windows, throwing the ladies-in-waiting from the seven-feet-high veranda into the compound, cutting and kicking them, and brutally murdering four in the hope that they had thus secured their victim. Japanese troops also entered the palace, and formed in military order under the command of their officers round the small courtyard of the king's house and at its gate, protecting the assassins in their murderous work. Before this force of Japanese regulars arrived, there was a flying rout of servants, runners and palace guards rushing from every point of the vast enclosure in mad haste to get out of the gates. As the Japanese entered the building, the unfortunate king, hoping to divert their attention and give the queen time to escape, came into a front room where he could be distinctly seen. Some of the Japanese assassins rushed in, brandishing their swords, pulled his majesty about, and beat and dragged about some of the palace ladies by the hair in his presence. The crown prince, who was in an inner room, was seized, his hat torn off and broken, and he was pulled about by the hair and threatened with swords to make him show the way to the queen, but he managed to reach the king and they have never been separated since. The whole affair did not occupy much more than an hour. The crown prince saw his mother rush down a passage followed by a Japanese with a sword, and there was a general rush of assassins for her sleeping apartments. In the upper story, the crown princess was found with several ladies, and she was dragged by the hair, cut with a sword, beaten, and thrown downstairs. Yi Kyung Jik, minister of the royal household, seems to have given the alarm, for the queen was dressed and was preparing to run and hide herself. When the murderers rushed in, he stood with outstretched arms in front of her majesty, trying to protect her, furnishing them with the clue they wanted. They slashed off both his hands and inflicted other wounds, but he contrived to drag himself along the veranda into the king's presence, where he bled to death. The queen, flying from the assassins, was overtaken and stabbed, falling down as if dead. But one account says that, recovering a little, she asked if the crown prince, her idol, was safe, on which a Japanese jumped on her breast and stamped her through and through with his sword. Even then, though the nurse whom I formerly saw in attendance on her covered her face, it is not certain that she was dead, but the Japanese laid her on a plank, wrapped a silk quilt around her, and she was carried to a grove of pines in the adjacent deer park, where kerosene oil was poured over the body, which was surrounded by faggots and burned only a few small bones escaping destruction. Thus perished, at the age of forty-four, by the hands of foreign assassins, instigated to their bloody work by the minister of a friendly power, the clever, ambitious, intriguing, fascinating, and in many respects lovable Queen of Korea. In her lifetime, Count Inoue, 
whose verdict for many reasons may be accepted, said, Her Majesty has few equals among her countrymen for shrewdness and sagacity. In the art of conciliating her enemies and winning the confidence of her servants, she has no equals. A short time after daylight, the Taiwan Kun issued two proclamations, of which the following sentences are specimens. First, the hearts of the people dissolve through the presence in the palace of a crowd of base fellows. So the National Grand Duke is returned to power to inaugurate changes, expel the base fellows, restore former laws, and vindicate the dignity of His Majesty. Second, I have now entered the palace to aid His Majesty, expel the low fellows, perfect that which will be a benefit, save the country, and introduce peace. The palace gates were guarded by the mutinous Kun Ren Tai with fixed bayonets who allowed a constant stream of Koreans to pass out, the remnants of the old palace guard, who had thrown off their uniforms and hidden their arms, each man being seized and searched before his exit was permitted. Near the gate was a crimson pool marking the spot where Colonel Hong fell. Three of the ministers were at once dismissed from their posts, some escaped, and many of the high officials sought safety in flight. Nearly every one who was trusted by the king was removed, and several of the chief officers of state were filled by the nominees of the officers of the Kun Ren Tai, who, later, when they did not find the cabinet, which was chiefly of their own creation, sufficiently subservient, used to threaten it with drawn swords. Viscount Miura arrived at the palace at daylight, with Mr. Sugimura, secretary of the Japanese legation, who had arranged the details of the plot, and a certain Japanese who had been seen by the king apparently leading the assassins, and actively participating in the bloody work, and had an audience of His Majesty who was profoundly agitated. He signed three documents at their bidding, after which the Japanese troops were withdrawn from the palace, and the armed forces, and even the king's personal attendants, were placed under the orders of those who had been concerned in attack. The Taiwan Kun was present at this audience. During the day, all the foreign representatives had audiences of the king, who was much agitated, sobbed at intervals, and, believing the queen to have escaped, was very solicitous about his own safety, as he was environed by assassins, the most unscrupulous of all being his own father. In violation of custom, he grasped the hands of the representatives, and asked them to use their friendly offices to prevent further outrage and violence. He was anxious that the Kun Ren Tai should be replaced by Japanese troops. On the same afternoon, the foreign representatives met at the Japanese legation to hear Viscount Miura's explanation of circumstances in which his countrymen were so seriously implicated. Three days after the events in the palace, and while the king and the general public believed the queen to be alive, a so-called royal edict, a more infamous outrage on the queen even than her brutal assassination, was published in the official gazette. The king, on being asked to sign it, refused, and said he would have his hands cut off rather, but it appeared at his decree, and bore the signatures of the minister of the household, the Prime Minister, and six other members of the Cabinet. Royal Edict It is now thirty-two years since we ascended the throne, but our ruling influence has not extended wide. The Queen Min introduced her relatives to the court and placed them about our person, whereby she made dull our senses, exposed the people to extortion, put our government in disorder, selling offices and titles. Hence, tyranny prevailed all over the country, and robbers arose in all quarters. Under these circumstances, the foundation of our dynasty was in imminent peril. We knew the extreme of her wickedness, but could not dismiss and punish her because of helplessness and fear of her party. We desire to stop and suppress her influence. 
In the twelfth moon of last year we took an oath at our ancestral shrine that the queen and her relatives and ours should never again be allowed to interfere in state affairs. We hoped this would lead the Min faction to mend their ways. But the queen did not give up her wickedness, but with her party aided a crowd of low fellows to rise up about us, and so managed as to prevent the ministers of state from consulting us. Moreover, they have forged our signature to a decree to disband our loyal soldiers, thereby instigating and raising a disturbance, and when it occurred she escaped as in the im o year. We have endeavoured to discover her whereabouts, but as she does not come forth and appear, we are convinced that she is not only unfitted and unworthy of the Queen's rank, but also that her guilt is excessive and brimful. Therefore, with her, we may not succeed to the glory of the royal ancestry. So, we hereby depose her from the rank of Queen, and reduce her to the level of the lowest class. Signed by Yi Chai Myon, Minister of the Royal Household, Kim Hong Chip, Prime Minister, Kim Yun Shik, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Park Chong Yang, Minister of Home Affairs, Shim Sang Hun, Minister of Finance, Cho He Yon, Minister of War, So Kwang Pom, Minister of Justice, So Kwang Pom, Minister of Education, Cho Pyong Ha, Vice Minister of Agriculture and Commerce. On the day following the issue of this fraudulent and infamous edict, another appeared in which Her Majesty, out of pity for the Crown Prince, and as a reward for his deep devotion to his father, was raised by the King to rank of concubine of the First Order. The diplomats were harassed and anxious, and met constantly to discuss the situation. Of course, the state of extreme tension was not caused solely by happenings in Korea and their local consequences. For behind this well-executed plot, and the diabolical murder of a defenseless woman, lay a terrible suspicion, which gained in strength every hour during the first days after the tragedy, till it intensified into a certainty, of which people spoke as in cipher, by hints alone, that other brains than Korean planned the plot, that other than Korean hands took the lives that were taken, that the sentries who guarded the king's apartments while the deed of blood was being perpetrated wore other than Korean uniforms, and that other than Korean bayonets gleamed in the shadow of the palace wall. People spoke their suspicions cautiously, though the evidence of General Dai and of Mr. Sabatin pointed unmistakably in one direction. So early as the day after the affair, the question which emerged was, is Viscount General Miura criminally implicated or not? It is needless to go into particulars on this subject. Ten days after the tragedy at the palace, the Japanese government, which was soon proved innocent of any complicity in the affair, recalled and arrested Viscount Miura, Sugimura, and Okamoto, advisor to the Korean War Department, who, some months later, along with 45 others, were placed on their trial before the Japanese court of first instance at Hiroshima, and were acquitted on the technical ground that there was no sufficient evidence to prove that any of the accused actually committed the crime originally mediated by them. This crime, according to the judgment, being that two of the accused, at the instigation of Miura, decided to murder the queen, and took steps by collecting accomplices. More than ten others were directed by these two persons to do away with the queen. Viscount Miura was replaced by Mr. Komura, an able diplomatist, and shortly afterwards Count Inoue arrived, bearing the condolences of the Emperor of Japan to the unfortunate Korean king. A heavier blow to Japanese prestige and position as the leader of civilization in the East could not have been struck, and the government continues to deserve our sympathy on the occasion. For when the disavowal is forgotten, 
it will be always remembered that the murderous plot was arranged in the Japanese legation, and that of the Japanese dressed as civilians and armed with swords and pistols, who were directly engaged in the outrages committed in the palace, some were advisers to the Korean government and in its pay, and others were Japanese policemen connected with the Japanese legation. Sixty persons in all, including those known as Soshi, and exclusive of the Japanese troops. The foreign representatives, with one exception, informed the cabinet that until steps were taken to bring the assassins to justice, till the Kunren Tai Guard was removed from the palace, and till the recently introduced members of the cabinet who were responsible for the outrages had been arraigned or at least removed from office, they declined to recognize any act of the government or to accept as authentic any order issued by it in the king's name. The prudence of this course became apparent later. On 15th October, in an extra issue of the Official Gazette, it was announced, by royal command, that, as the position of queen must not remain vacant for a day, proceedings for the choice of a bride were to begin at once. This was only one among the many insults which were heaped upon the royal prisoner. During the remainder of October and November there was no improvement in affairs. The gloom was profound. Instead of royal receptions and entertainments, the king, shaken by terror and in hourly dread of poison or assassination, was a close prisoner in a poor part of his own palace, in the hands of a cabinet chiefly composed of men who were the tools of the mutinous soldiers who were practically his jailers, compelled to put his seal to edicts which he loathed, the tool of men on whose hands the blood of his murdered queen was hardly dry. Nothing could be more pitiable than the condition of the king and crown prince, each dreading that the other would be slain before his eyes, not daring to eat of any food prepared in the palace, dreading to be separated, even for a few minutes, without an adherent whom they could trust, and with recent memories of infinite horror as food for contemplation. General Dai, the American military adviser, an old and feeble man, slept near the palace library, and the American missionaries in twos took it in turns to watch with him. This was the only protection which the unfortunate sovereign possessed. He was also visited daily by the foreign representatives in turn, with the double object of ascertaining that he was alive and assuring him of their sympathy and interest. Food was supplied to him in a locked box from the Russian or U.S. legations, but so closely was he watched that it was difficult to pass the key into his hand, and a hasty and very occasional whisper was the only communication he could succeed in making to these foreigners who were his sole reliance. Undoubtedly, from the first, he hoped to escape either to the English or Russian legation. At times he sobbed piteously and shook the hands of the foreigners, who made no attempt to conceal the sympathy they felt for the always courteous and kindly sovereign. Entertainments among the foreigners ceased. The dismay was too profound and the mourning too real to permit even of the mild gaieties of a sole winter. Every foreign lady, and specially Mrs. Underwood, her Majesty's medical attendant, and Madame Weber, who had been an intimate friend, felt her death as a personal loss. Her oriental unscrupulousness in politics was forgotten in the horror excited by the story of her end. Yet then, and for some time afterwards, people clung to the hope that she had escaped as on a former occasion and was in hiding. Among Koreans, opinion was greatly concealed, for there were innumerable arrests, and no one knew when his turn might come, but it was believed that there was an earnest desire to liberate the king. A number of foreign warships lay at Chemulpo, and the British, Russian, and American legations were guarded by marines. 
Nearly a month after the assassination of the Queen, and when all hope of her escape had been abandoned, the condition of things was so serious under the rule of the new cabinet that an attempt was made by the foreign representatives to terminate it by urging on Count Inoue to disarm the Kunrentai and occupy the palace with Japanese troops until the loyal soldiers had been drilled into an efficiency on which the king might rely for his personal safety. It will be seen from this proposal how completely the Japanese government was exonerated from blame by the diplomatic agents of the great powers. This proposal was not received with cordial alacrity by Count Inoue, who felt that the step of an armed reoccupation of the palace by the Japanese, though with the object of securing the king's safety, would be liable to serious misconstruction and might bring about very grave complications. Such an idea was only to be entertained if Japan received a distinct mandate from the powers. The telegraph was set to work, a due amount of consent to the arrangement was obtained, and when I left Seoul on a northern journey on November 7th, it was in the full belief that on reaching Pyongyang I should find a telegram announcing that this serious coup d'etat had been successfully accomplished in the presence of the foreign representatives. Japan, however, did not undertake the task, though urged to do so both by Count Inoue and Mr. Komura, the new representative, and the Kunren Tai remained in power and the king a prisoner. Had the recommendation of the foreign representatives, among whom the Russian representatives was the most emphatic in urging the interference of Japan, been adopted, it is more than probable that the present predominance of Russian influence in Korea would have been avoided. It is only fair to the Russian government to state that it gave a distinct mandate to the Japanese to disarm the Kunren Tai and take charge of the king. The Japanese government declined, and therefore is alone responsible for Russia's subsequent intervention. During November, the dissatisfaction throughout Korea with the measures which were taken and proposed increased, and the position became so strained, owing to the demand of the foreign representatives and of all classes of Koreans, that the occurrences of the 8th of October must be investigated, and that the fiction of the Queen being in hiding should be abandoned, that the cabinet unwillingly recognized that something must be done. So, on 26 November, the foreign representatives were invited by the king to the palace, and the prime minister, in presence of his majesty, who was profoundly agitated, produced a decree bearing the king's signature, dismissing the special nominees of the mutineers, the ministers of war and police, declaring that the so-called edict degrading the queen was set aside and treated as void from the beginning, and that she was reinstated in her former honours, that the occurrences of the 8th October were to be investigated by the Department of Justice, and that the guilty persons were to be tried and punished. The death of Her Majesty was announced at the same time. At the conclusion of this audience, Mr. Sill, the United States Minister, expressed to the King his profound satisfaction with the announcement. Mr. Hillier followed by congratulating His Majesty on those satisfactory steps, and hoped it would be the beginning of a time of peace and tranquillity, and relieve His Majesty from much anxiety. These good wishes were cordially endorsed by his colleagues. The measures proposed by the King to reassert his lost authority and punish the conspirators promised very well but were rendered abortive by a loyal plot which was formed by the old palace guard and a number of Koreans, some of them by no means insignificant men. It had for its object the liberation of the sovereign and the substitution of loyal troops for the Kun Ren Tai. Though it ended in a fiasco two nights after this hopeful interview, its execution having been frustrated by premature disclosures, its results were disastrous, for it involved a number of prominent men, created grave suspicions, 
raised up a feeling of antagonism to foreigners, some of whom, American missionaries, were believed to be cognizant of the plot, if not actually accessories, and brought about a general confusion, from which, when I left Korea five weeks later, there was no prospect of escape. The king was a closer prisoner than ever. Those surrounding him grew familiar and insolent. He lived in dread of assassination, and he had no more intercourse with foreigners, except with those who had an official right to enter the palace, which they became increasingly unwilling to exercise. It was with much regret that I left Seoul for a journey in the interior at this most exciting time, when every day brought fresh events and rumours, and a coup d'etat of great importance was believed to be impending. But I had very little time at my disposal before proceeding to western China on a long-planned journey. End of section 25「Section 26 of Korea and her Neighbors」by Isabella L. Bird. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in May 2021. Chapter 24 Burial Customs After the interpreter difficulty had appeared as before insurmountable, I was provided with one who acquitted himself to perfection and through whose good offices I came much nearer to the people than if I had been accompanied by a foreigner. He spoke English remarkably well, was always bright, courteous, intelligent, and good-natured. He had a keen sense of the ludicrous, and I owe much of the pleasure, as well as the interest, of my journey to his companionship. Mr. Hillier equipped me with Im, a soldier of the legation guard, as my servant. He had attended me on photographing expeditions on a former visit, and on the journey I found him capable, faithful, quick, and full of go, so valuable and efficient, indeed, as to take the shine out of any subsequent attendant. With these, a passport and a kwanja, or letter from the Korean Foreign Office, commending me to official help, never used, my journey was made under the best possible auspices. The day before I left was spent in making acquaintance with Mr. Yi Hak In, receiving farewell visits from many kind and helpful friends, looking over the backs and tackle of the ponies I had engaged for the journey, and in arranging a photographic outfit. Im was taught to make curry, an accomplishment in which he soon excelled, and I had no other cooking done on the journey. For the benefit of future travellers I will mention that my equipment consisted of a camp bed and bedding, candles, a large, strong, doubly oiled sheet, a folding chair, a kettle, two pots, a cup and two plates of enameled iron, some tea which turned out musty, some flour, curry powder, and a tin of Edward's desiccated soup, which came back unopened. To the oft-repeated question, did you eat Korean food, I reply certainly, pheasants, fowls, potatoes, and eggs. Warm winter clothing, a Japanese kurumaya's hat, the best of all travelling hats, and Korean string shoes completed my outfit, and I never needed anything I had not got. The start on 7th November was managed in good time, without any of the usual delays, and I may say at once that the mapu, the bugbear and torment of travellers usually, never gave the slightest trouble. Though engaged by the day, they were ready to make long days' journeys, were always willing and helpful, and a month later we parted excellent friends. As this is my second favourable experience, I am inclined to think that Korean Mapu are a maligned class. For each pony and man, the food of both being included, I paid one dollar, about two shillings, per day when travelling, and half that sum when halting. Mr. Yi had two ponies, I two baggage animals, on one of which Im rode, and a saddle pony, 
that is, a pack pony equipped with my side saddle for the occasion. Starting from the English legation and the customs buildings, we left the city by the west gate, and passing the stone stumps which up till lately supported the carved and coloured roof under which generations of Korean kings after their accession met the Chinese envoys, who came in great state to invest them with Korean sovereignty, and through the narrow and rugged defile known as the Peking Pass, we left the unique capital and its lofty clambering wall out of sight. The day was splendid even for a Korean autumn, and the frightful black pinnacles, serrated ridges, and flaming corrugations of Pukhan on the right of the road were atmospherically idealized into perfect beauty. For several miles the road was thronged with bulls loaded with faggots, rice, and pine brush for the supply of the daily necessities of the city. Then, except when passing through the villages, it became solitary enough, except for an occasional group of long-sworded Japanese travellers or baggage ponies in charge of Japanese soldiers. The road as far as Paju lies through pretty country, small valleys either terraced for rice, which was lying out to dry on the dikes, or growing barley, wheat, millet, and cotton, surrounded by low but shapely hills, denuded of everything but oak and pine scrub, but with folds in which the pinus sinensis grew in dark clumps, lighted up by the vanishing scarlet of the maple and the glowing crimson of the amelopsis vaichii. On the lower slopes, and usually in close proximity to the timber, are numerous villages, their groups of deep-eaved, brown-thatched roofs, on which scarlet capsicums were laid out to dry, looking pretty enough as adjuncts to landscapes which on the whole lack life and emphasis. The villages through which the road passes were seen at their best, for the roadway, serving for the village threshing floor, was daily swept for the threshing of rice and millet, the passage of travellers being a secondary consideration. Everything was dry, and the white clothes of the people were consequently at their cleanliest. At noon we reached Koyang, a poor place of three hundred hovels, with ruinous official buildings of some size, once handsome. At this, and every other magistracy up to Pyongyang, from twenty to thirty Japanese soldiers were quartered in the Yamens. The people hated them with a hatred which is the legacy of three centuries, but could not allege anything against them, admitting that they paid for all they got, molested no one, and were seldom seen outside the Yamen gates. There the Mapu halted for two hours to give their ponies and themselves a feed. This midday halt is one bone of contention between travellers and themselves. No amount of hunting and worrying them shortens the halt by more than ten minutes, and I preferred peace of spirit, only insisting that when the road admitted of it, as it frequently did, they should travel twelve li, or about three and three-quarter miles an hour. At Koyang I began the custom of giving the landlord of the inn at which I halted one hundred cash for the room in which I rested, which gave great satisfaction. I had my mattress laid upon the hot floor, and as Im, by instinct, secured privacy for me by fastening up mats and curtains over the paper walls and doors, these midday halts were very pleasant. Almost every house in these roadside villages and small towns has a low table of such food as Koreans love laid out under the eaves. Beyond Koyang, standing out in endless solemnity above a pine wood on the side of a steep hill, are two of the strangely few antiquities of which Korea can boast. These are two miryoks, colossal busts, about thirty-five feet in height, carved out of the solid rock. They are supposed to be relics of the very early days of Korean Buddhism, when men were religious enough to toil at such stupendous works, and to represent the male and female elements in nature. They are side by side. One wears a round, and the other a square hat. 
the buddhistic calm or rather i should say apathy rests on their huge faces which have looked stolidly on many a change in korea but on none greater than the last year had witnessed during the day we saw three funerals and i observed that a japanese detachment which occupied the whole road filed to the right and left to let one of the processions pass the men raising their caps to the corpse as they did so these funerals gave an impression of gaiety rather than grief two men walked first carrying silk bannerets which designated the woman about to be interred as the wife of so-and-so a married woman having no name next came a man walking backwards with many streamers of coloured ribbon floating from his hat ringing a large bell and accompanying its clang with a dissonance supposed to be singing the coffin under a four-posted domed cover and concealed by gay curtains was borne on a platform by twelve men and was followed by a large party of male mourners a man with a musical instrument a table and a box of food none of the faces were composed to a look of grief on the dome were two mythical birds resembling the phoenix the dome and curtains were brilliantly colored and decorated with ribbon streamers two corpses each extended on a board and covered with white paper pasted over small hoops lay in the roadway at different places these were bodies of persons who had died far from home and were being conveyed to their friends for burial later we met another funeral the corpse carried as before on a platform by twelve bearers who moved to a rhythmic chant of the most cheerful description the whole party being as jolly as if they were going to a marriage there was a cross in front of the gay hearse with an extended dragon on each arm and four large gaily painted birds resembling pheasants were on the dome korean customs as to death and burial deserve a brief notice when a man or woman falls ill the mutang or sorceress is called in to exorcise the spirit which has caused the illness when this fails and death becomes imminent in the case of a man no women are allowed to remain in the room but his nearest female relations and in that of a woman all men must withdraw except her husband father and brother after death the body specially at the joints is shampooed and when it has been made flexible it is covered with a clean sheet and laid for three days on a board on which seven stars are painted this board is eventually burned at the grave the star board as it is called is a euphemism for death and is spoken of as we speak of the grave during these days the grave clothes which are of good materials in red blue and yellow coloring are prepared korean custom enjoins that burial shall be delayed in the case of a poor man three days only in that of a middle-class man nine days of a nobleman or a high official three months and in that of one of the royal family nine months but this period may be abridged or extended at the pleasure of the king man is supposed to have three souls after death one occupies the tablet one the grave and one the unknown during the passing of the spirit there is complete silence the undergarments of the dead are taken out by a servant who waves them in the air and calls him by name the relations and friends meantime wailing loudly after a time the clothes are thrown upon the roof when the corpse has been temporarily dressed it is bound so tightly round the chest as sometimes to break the shoulder blades which is interpreted as a sign of good luck after these last offices a table is placed outside the door on which are three bowls of rice and a squash beside it are three pairs of straw sandals the rice and sandals are for the three zayas or official servants who come to conduct one of the souls to the ten judges the squash is broken the shoes burned and the rice thrown away within half an hour after death 
pictures of the ship tai wong or ten judges are to be seen in buddhist temples in korea on a man's death one of his souls is seized by their servants and carried to the unknown where these judges who through their spies are kept well informed as to human deeds sentence it accordingly either to a good place or to one of the manifold hells the influence of buddhism doubtless maintains the observance of this singular custom even when the idea of its significance is lost or discredited the coffin is oblong where interment is delayed it is hermetically sealed with several coats of lacquer until the funeral there is wailing daily in the dead man's house at the three hours of meals next the geomancer is consulted about the site for the grave and receives a fee heavy in proportion to the means of the family he is believed from long study to have become acquainted with all the good and bad influences which are said to reside in the ground a fortunate sight brings rank wealth and many sons to the sons and grandsons of the deceased and should be if possible on the southerly slope of a hill he also chooses an auspicious day for the burial in the case of a rich man the grave with a stone altar in front of it is prepared beforehand in that of a poor man not till the procession arrives the coffin is placed in a gaily decorated hearse and with wailing music singing wine food and if in the evening with many colored lanterns the cortege proceeds to the grave a widow may accompany her husband's corpse in a closed chair though this appears unusual but the mourners are all men in immense hats which conceal their faces and sackcloth clothing after the burial and the making of the circular mound over the coffin a libation of wine is poured out and the company proceeds to sacrifice and to feast offerings of wine and dried fish are placed on the stone altar in front of the grave if it has been erected or on small tables the relatives facing these and the grave make five prostrations and a formula wishing peace to the spirit which is to dwell there is repeated behind the grave similar offerings and prostrations are made to the mountain spirit who presides over it and who is the host of the soul committed to his care the wine is thrown away and the fish bestowed upon the servants it will be observed that no priest has any part in the ceremonies connected with death and burial and that two souls have now been disposed of one to the judgment of the unknown and the other to the keeping of the mountain spirit a chair is invariably carried in a funeral procession containing the memorial or as we say the ancestral tablet of the deceased a strip of white wood bearing the family name set in a socket a part of the inscription on this is written at the house and it is completed at the grave it is carried back with exactly the same style and attendance that a dead man would have had had he been living for the third soul is supposed to return to the house with the mourners and to take up its abode in the tablet which is placed in a vacant room and raised on a black lacquer chair with a black lacquer table before it on which renewed offerings are made of bread wine cooked meat and vermicelli soup the spirit being supposed to regale itself with their odors the mourners again prostrate themselves five times after which they eat the offerings in an adjoining room it is customary for friends to strew the root of the procession with paper money in the period between the death and the interment silence is observed in the house of mourning and only those visitors are received who come to condole with the family and speak of the virtues of the departed it is believed that conversation on any ordinary topic will cause the corpse to shake in the coffin and show other symptoms of unrest for the same reason the servants are very particular in watching the cats of the household if there are any but cats are not in favor in korea it is terribly unlucky for a cat to jump over a corpse 
it may even cause it to stand upright. After the deceased has been carried out of the house, two or three mutangs or sorceresses enter it with musical instruments and the other paraphernalia of their profession. After a time, one becomes inspired by the spirit of the dead man and accurately impersonates him, even to his small tricks of manner, movement and speech. She gives a narrative of his life in the first person singular, if he were a bad man confessing his misdeeds which may have been unsuspected by his neighbours, and if he were a good man narrating his virtues with becoming modesty. At the end she bows, takes a solemn farewell of those present, and retires. After the tablet has been removed to the ancestral temple, and the period of mourning is over, meals are offered in the shrine once every month, and also on the anniversary of each death, all the descendants assembling, and these observances extend backwards to the ancestors of five generations. Thus it is a very costly thing to have many near relations and a number of ancestors, the expense falling on the eldest son and his heirs. A Korean gentleman told me that his nephew, upon whom this duty falls, spends more upon it than upon his household expenses. It is not till the three years' mourning for a father has expired that his tablet is removed to the ancestral temple which rich men have near their houses. During the period of mourning it is kept in a vacant room, usually in the women's apartments. A poor man puts it in a box on one side of his room, and when he worships his other ancestors, strips of paper with their names upon them are pasted on the mud wall. I have slept in rooms in which the tablet lay smothered in dust on one of the cross beams. Common people only worship for their ancestors of three generations. The anniversary of a father's death is kept with much ceremony for three years. On the previous night, sacrifice is offered before the tablet, and on the following day the friends pay visits of condolence to the family and eat varieties of food. During the day they visit the grave and offer sacrifices to the soul and the mountain spirit. A widow wears mourning all her life. If she has no son, she acts the part of a son in performing the ancestral rites for her husband. It has not been correct for widows to remarry. If, however, a widow inherits property, she occasionally marries to rid herself of importunities, in which case she is usually robbed and deserted. The custom of tolerating the remarriage of widows has, however, lately been changed into the right of remarriage. End of section 26「Section 27 of Korea and her neighbors by Isabella L. Bird. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in May 2021. Chapter 25. Song Do, a royal city. It grew dark before we reached Paju, and the Mapu were in great terror of tigers and robbers. It is unpleasant to reach a Korean inn after nightfall, for there are no lights by which to unload the baggage, and noise and confusion prevail. When the traveller arrives, a man rushes in with a brush, stirs up the dust and vermin, and sometimes puts down a coarse mat. Experience has taught me that an oiled sheet is a better protection against vermin than a pony load of insect powder. I made much use of the tripod of my camera. It served as a candle stand, a barometer suspender, and an arrangement on which to hang my clothes at night, out of harm's way. In two hours after arrival my food was ready, after which Mr. Yi came in to talk over the day, to plan the morrow, to enlighten me on Korean customs, and to interpret my orders to the faithful Im, and by 8.30 I was asleep. After leaving Paju, the country is extremely pretty, and one of the most picturesque views in Korea is from the height overlooking the romantically situated village of Im Jin, 
clustering along both sides of a ravine which terminates on the broad imjin gang a tributary to the han in two steep rocky bluffs sprinkled with the pinus sinensis the two being connected by a fine double-roofed granite chinese gateway inscribed gate for the tranquillization of the west the road passing down the village street reaches the water's edge through this relic one of three or four similar barriers on this high road to china the imjin gang there three hundred forty three yards broad has shallow water and a flat sandy shore on its north side but a range of high bluffs crowned with extensive old defensive works lines the south side the gateway being the only break for many miles below these the river is a deep green stream navigable for craft of fourteen tons for forty miles from its mouth there was a still faintly blue atmosphere and the sails of boats passing dreamily into the mountains over the silver water had a most artistic effect there are two chinese bridges on that road curved slabs of stone supported on four-sided blocks of granite giving one a feeling of security even though they have no parapets korean bridges are poles laid over a river with matting or brushwood covered with earth upon them and are usually full of holes these precarious structures had just been replaced after the summer rains a mapu usually goes ahead to test their solidity the region is extremely fertile producing fine crops of rice wheat barley millet buckwheat cotton sesamum castor oil beans maize tobacco capsicums eggplant peas etc but russian and american kerosene is fast displacing the vegetable oils for burning and is producing the same revolution in village evening life which it has effected in the western islands of scotland i never saw a korean hamlet south of pyongyang however far from the main road into which kerosene had not penetrated i was obliged to halt for the night when only ten li from song do all the more regretfully because the people were unwilling to receive a foreigner and the family room which i occupied only eight feet six inches by six feet was heated up to eighty five degrees was poisoned with the smell of cakes of rotting beans and was so alive with vermin of every description that i was obliged to suspend a curtain over my bed to prevent them from falling upon it the next morning in an atmosphere which idealized everything we reached song do or kai song now the second city in the kingdom once the capital of honjo one of the three kingdoms which united to form korea and the capital of korea five centuries ago a city of sixty thousand people lying to the south of sangdan san with a wall ten miles in circumference running irregularly over heights and pierced by double-roofed gateways with a peaked and splintered ridge extending from sangdan san to the northeast its higher summits attaining altitudes of from two thousand to three thousand feet it has a striking resemblance to seoul the great gate is approached by an avenue of trees and the road is lined with seon cheung pi monuments to good governors and magistrates faithful widows and pious sons a wide street its apparent width narrowed by two rows of thatched booths divides the city it was a scene of bustle activity and petty trade something like a fair the women wear white sheets gathered round their heads and nearly reaching their feet the street was thronged with men in huge hats and very white clothing with boy bridegrooms in pink garments and the quaint yellow hats which custom enjoins for several months after marriage and with mourners dressed in sackcloth from head to foot the head and shoulders concealed by peaked and scalloped hats the identity being further disguised by two-handled sackcloth screens held up to their eyes 
In thatched stalls on low stands and on mats on the ground were all Korean necessaries and luxuries, among which were large quantities of English peace goods and hacked pieces of beef with the blood in it, Korean killed meat being enough to make anyone a vegetarian. Goats are killed by pulling them to and fro in a narrow stream, which motion is said to destroy the rank taste of the flesh, dogs by twirling them in a noose until they are unconscious, after which they are bled. I have already inflicted on my readers an account of the fate of a bullock at Korean hands. It was a busy, dirty, poor, mean scene under the hot sun. The song do inns are bad, and a friend of Mr. Yi kindly lent me a house, partly in ruins, but with two rooms which sheltered him and myself, and in this I spent two pleasant days in lovely weather, Mr. Yi, who was visiting friends, escorting me to the song do sites, which may be seen in one morning, and to pay visits in some of the better-class houses. My quarters, though by comparison very comfortable, would not at home be considered fit for the housing of a better-class cow. But Korea has a heavenly climate for much of the year. The squalor, dust and rubbish in my compound and everywhere were inconceivable, though the city is rather a well-to-do one. The water supply is atrocious, offal and refuse of all kinds lying up to the mouths of the wells. It says something for the security of Korea that a foreign lady could safely live in a dwelling up a lonely alley in the heart of a big city, with no attendant but a Korean soldier knowing not a word of English, who, had he been so minded, might have cut my throat and decamped with my money, of which he knew the whereabouts, neither my door nor the compound having any fastening. Points of interest in a Korean city are few, and the ancient capital is no exception to the rule. There is a fine bronze bell with curiously involved dragons in one of the gate towers, cast five centuries ago, an archery ground with official pavilions on a height with a superb view, the governor's yamen, once handsome, now ruinous, with Japanese sentries, a dismal temple to Confucius, and the showy one to the god of war. Outside the crowd and bustle of the city, reached by a narrow path among prosperous ginseng farms and persimmon-embowered hamlets, are the lonely remains of the palace of the kings who reigned in Korea prior to the dynasty of which the present sovereign is the representative, and even in their forlornness they give the impression that the Korean kings were much statelier monarchs then than now. The remains consist of an approach to the main platform on which the palace stood, by two subsidiary platforms, the first reached by a nearly obliterated set of steps. Four staircases, fifteen feet wide, of thirty steps each, lead to a lofty artificial platform, faced with hewn stone in great blocks, fourteen feet high, and by rough measurement, 846 feet in length. On the east side there are massive abutments. On the west the platform broadens irregularly. At the entrance, eighty feet wide, at the top of the steps, there are the bases of columns suggestive of a very stately approach. The palace platform is intersected by massive stone foundations of halls and rooms, some of large area. It is backed by a pine-closed knoll, and is prettily situated in an amphitheatre of hills. Songdo, as a royal city, and as one of the so-called fortresses for the protection of the capital, still retains many ancient privileges. It is a bustling business town and a great centre of the grain trade. It has various mercantile guilds with their places of business, small shops built round compounds with entrance gates. It makes wooden shoes, coarse pottery and fine matting, and imports paper, which it manufactures with sesame oil into the oil paper for which Korea is famous, and which is made into cloaks, umbrellas, tobacco pouches, and sheets for walls and floors. In answer to many inquiries I learned that trade had improved considerably since the war, 
but the native traders now have to compete with 14 Japanese shops and to suffer the presence of 40 Japanese residents. I have left until the last a commodity for which Song Do is famous and which is the chief source of its prosperity, ginseng. Panax ginseng or quinquefolia is, as its name imports, a panacea. No one can be in the Far East for many days without hearing of this root and its virtues. No drug in the British pharmacopoeia rivals with us the estimation in which this is held by the Chinese. It is a tonic, a febrifuge, a stomachic, the very elixir of life, taken spasmodically or regularly in Chinese wine by most Chinese who can afford it. It is one of the most valuable articles which Korea exports and one great source of its revenue. In the steamer in which I left Chemul Po, there was a consignment of it worth $140,000. But valuable as the cultivated root is, it is nothing to the value of the wild, which grows in northern Korea, a single specimen of which has been sold for 40 pounds. It is chiefly found in the Gangge Mountains, but it is rare, and the search so often ends in failure that the common people credit it with magical properties, and believe that only men of pure lives can find it. The ginseng season was at its height. People talked, thought, and dreamed ginseng, for the risks of its six or seven years' growth were over, and the root was actually in the factory. I went to several ginseng farms, and also saw the different stages of the manufacturing process, and received the same impression as in Siberia, that if industry were lucrative, and the Korean were sure of his earnings, he would be an industrious, and even a thrifty person. All round Songdo are carefully fenced farms on which ginseng is grown with great care and exquisite neatness on beds eighteen inches wide, two feet high, and neatly bordered with slates. It is sown in April, transplanted in the following spring, and again in three years into specially prepared ground, not recently cultivated, and which has not been used for ginseng culture for seven years. Up to the second year the plant has only two leaves. In the fourth year it is six inches high with four leaves, standing out at right angles from the stalk. It reaches maturity in the sixth or seventh year. During its growth it is sheltered from both wind and sun by well-made reed roofs with blinds, which are raised or lowered as may be required. When the root is taken up it is known as white ginseng and is bought by merchants who get it manufactured, about three and one quarter catiers of the fresh root making one catier of red or commercial ginseng. The grower pays a tax of 20 cents per catier, and the merchant $16 a catier for the root as received from the manufacturer. The annual time of manufacture depends on orders given by the government. The growers and merchants make the most profit when the date is early. Only two manufacturers are licensed and 150 growers. The quantity to be manufactured is also limited. In 1895 it was 15,000 catiers of red ginseng and 3,000 of beards. The terms beards and tails are used to denote different parts of the root, which eventually has a grotesque resemblance to a headless man. It is possible that this likeness is the source of some of the almost miraculous virtues which are attributed to it. Everything about the factories is scrupulously clean and would do credit to European management. The row of houses used by what we should call the excisemen are well built and comfortable. There are two officials sent from Seoul by the agricultural department for the season, with four policemen and two attendants, whose expenses are paid by the manufacturers, and each step of the manufacture and the egress of the workmen are carefully watched. Mr. Yi was sent by the customs to make special inquiries in connection with the revenue derived. 
ginseng is steamed for twenty-four hours in large earthen jars over iron pots built into furnaces and is then partially dried in a room kept at a high temperature by charcoal the final drying is effected by exposing the roots in elevated flat baskets to the rays of the bright winter sun the human resemblance survives these processes but afterwards the beards and tails used chiefly in korea are cut off and the trunk from three to four inches long looks like a piece of clouded amber these trunks are carefully picked over and being classified according to size are neatly packed in small oblong baskets containing about five catiers each twelve or fourteen of these being packed in a basket which is waterproofed and matted and stamped and sealed by the agricultural department as ready for exportation a basket according to quality is worth from fourteen thousand to twenty thousand dollars in a good season the grower makes about fifteen times his outlay ginseng was a royal monopoly but times have changed this medicine which has such a high and apparently partially deserved reputation throughout the far east does not suit Europeans, and is of little account with European doctors. A post office had been established in Songdo under Korean management, and I not only received, but sent a letter, which reached its destination safely. Buddhism still prevails to some extent in this city, and large sums are expended upon the services of sorcerers in songdo i saw what very rarely may be seen in seoul and elsewhere a red door these are a very high honor reserved for rare instances of faithfulness in widows loyalty in subjects and piety in sons when a widow almost invariably of the upper class weeps ceaselessly for her husband maintains the deepest seclusion attends loyally to her father and mother-in-law and spends her time in pious deeds the people of the neighborhood proud of her virtues represent them to the governor of the province who conveys their recommendation to the king with whom it rests to confer the red door the distinction is also given to the family of an eminently loyal subject who has given his life for the king's life the case of a son whose father has reached a great age is somewhat different and the honor is more emphatic still his filial virtue is shown by such methods as these he goes every morning to his father's apartments asks him how his health is how he has slept what he has eaten for breakfast and how he enjoyed the meal if he has any fancies for dinner and if he shall go to the market and buy him some thai the best fish in korea and if he shall come back and assist him to take a walk the reader will observe how extremely material the pious son's inquiries are such assiduity continued during a course of years on being represented to the king may receive the coveted red portal in former days these matters used to be referred to the suzerain the emperor of china in songdo as in the villages a straw fringe is frequently to be seen stretched across a door either plain or with bits of charcoal knotted into it the former denotes the birth of a girl the latter that of a boy a girl is not specially welcome nor is the occasion one of festivity but neither is it as in some countries regarded as a calamity although if it be a firstborn the friends of the father are apt to write letters of condolence to him with the consoling suggestion that the next will be a boy. End of section 27。section 28 of Korea and her neighbors by Isabella L. Bird。this librivox recording is in the public domain。recording by Avai in May 2021。chapter 26。the Pyongyang battlefield。glorious weather favored my departure from the ancient korean capital the day's journey lay through pretty country small valleys and picturesquely shaped hills 
on which the vegetation, whatever it was, had turned to a purple as rich as the English heather blossom, while the blue gloom of the pines emphasized the flaming reds of the dying leafage. The villages were few and small, and cultivation was altogether confined to the valleys. Pheasants were so abundant that the mapu pelted them out of the cover by the roadside, and wild ducks abounded on every stream. The one really fine view of the day is from the crest of a hill just beyond ohuksuk -ju, where there is a second defensive gate, with a ruinous wall carried along a ridge for some distance on either side. The masonry and the gatehouse are fine, and the view down the wild valley beyond, with its rich autumn colouring, was almost grand. It was evident that officials were expected, for the road was being repaired everywhere, that is, spadefuls of soft soil were being taken from the banks and roadsides, and were being thrown into the ruts and holes to deepen the quagmire which the next rain would produce. From four to seven men were working at each spade. A great part of the male population had turned out, for when an official of rank is to travel, every family in the district must provide one male member, or a substitute, to put the road in order. The repairs of the roads and bridges devolve entirely on the country people. The following day brought a change of weather. My room had no hot floor, and the mercury at daybreak was only twenty degrees. When we started, a strong northwester was blowing, which increased to a gale by noon, the same fierce gale in which at Chimulpo HMS Edgar lost her boat with forty-seven men. My pony and I would have been blown over a wretched bridge had not four men linked themselves together to support us, and later, on the top of a precipice above a river, a gust came with such force that the animals refused to face it, and one of them was as nearly lost as possible. By noon it was impossible to sit on our horses, and we fought the storm on foot. When Im lifted me from my pony I fell down, and it took several men shouting with laughter to set me on my feet again. When Mr. Yi and I spoke to each other, our voices had a bobbery clatter, and sentences broke off halfway in an insane giggle. I felt as if there were hardly another shot in the locker, but if a traveller says die, the men lose all heart, so I summoned up all my pluck, took a photograph after the noon halt, and walked on at a good pace. But the wind, with the mercury at twenty-six degrees, was awful, gripping the heart and benumbing the brain. I have not felt anything like it since I encountered the devil wind on the Zagros heights in Persia. At some distance from our destination, Mr. Yi, Im, and the Mapu begged me to halt, as they could no longer face it, though the accommodation for man and beast at Tolmaru, where we put up, was the worst imaginable, and the large village the filthiest, most squalid, and most absolutely poverty-stricken place I saw in that land of squalor. The horses were crowded together, and their baffled attempts at fighting were only less hideous than the shouts and yells of the Mapu, who were constantly being roused out of a sound sleep to separate them. My room was six feet by eight, and much occupied by the chattels of the people, besides being alive with cockroaches and other forms of horrid life. The dirt and discomfort in which the peasant Koreans live are incredible. An uninteresting tract of country succeeded and some time was occupied in threading long treeless valleys, cut up by stony beds of streams, margined by sandy flats, inundated in summer, and then covered chiefly with weathered reeds, asters and artemisia, a belated aster every now and then displaying its untimely mauve blossom. All these, and the dry grasses and weeds of the hillsides, were being cut and stacked for fuel even brushwood having disappeared. This work is done by small boys, who carry their loads on wooden saddles suited to their size. 
That region is very thinly peopled, only a few hamlets of squalid hovels being scattered over it, and cultivation was rare and untidy, except in one fine agricultural valley where wheat and barley were springing. No animals, except a breed of pigs no larger than English terriers, were to be seen. One of the most dismal and squalid towns on this route is Shurhung, a long rambling village of nearly five thousand souls, and a magistracy, built along the refuse-covered bank of a bright, shallow stream. As if the crown official were the Yupas tree, the town with the Yamen is always more forlorn than any other. In Churhung, the large and once handsome Yamen buildings are all but in ruins, and so is the Confucian temple, visited periodically, as all such temples are, by the magistrate, who bows before the tablet of the Most Holy Teacher and offers an animal in sacrifice. The Korean official is the vampire which sucks the lifeblood of the people. We had crossed the Tao Jol, the boundary between the provinces of Kyonghui and Huanghai, and were then in the latter. Most officials of any standing live in Seoul for pleasure and society, leaving subordinates in charge, and as their tenure of office is very brief, they regard the people within their jurisdiction rather with reference to their squeezableness than to their capacity for improvement. Forty Japanese soldiers found a drafty shelter within the tumble-down buildings of the Yamen. As I walked down the street, one of them touched me on the shoulder, asking my nationality, whence I came and whither I was going, not quite politely, I thought. When I reached my room, a dozen of them came and gradually closed round my door, which I could not shut, standing almost within it. A trim sergeant raised his cap to me, and passing on to Mr. Yi's room, asked him where I came from and whither I was going, and on hearing replied, All right, raised his cap to me and departed, withdrawing his men with him. This was one of several domiciliary visits, and though they were usually very politely made, they suggested the query as to the right to make them, and to whom the mastership in the land belonged. There, as elsewhere, though the people hated the Japanese with an intense hatred, they were obliged to admit that they were very quiet and paid for everything they got. If the soldiers had not been in European clothes, it would not have occurred to me to think them rude for crowding round my door. A day's ride through monotonous country brought us to Pong San, where we halted in the dirtiest hole I had till then been in. As soon as my den was comfortably warm, myriads of houseflies, blackening the rafters, renewed a semi-torpid existence, dying in heaps in the soup and curry, filling the well of the candlestick with their singed bodies, and crawling in hundreds over my face. Next came the cockroaches in legions, large and small, torpid and active, followed by a great army of fleas and bugs, making life insupportable. To judge from the significant sounds from the public room, no one slept all night, and when I asked Mr. Yi after his welfare the next morning, he uttered the one word, miserable. Discomforts of this nature, less or more, are inseparable from the Korean inn. The following day, at a large village, we came upon the weekly market. It is usual to inquire regarding the trade of a district, and as the result of my inquiries, I assert that trade, in the ordinary sense, has no existence in a great part of central and northern Korea. That is, there is no exchange of commodities between one place and another, no exports, no imports by resident merchants, and no industries supplying more than a local demand. Such are to be found to some extent in southern Korea, and especially in the province of Chulla. Apart from Pyongyang, trade does not exist in the region through which I travelled. Reasons for such a state of things may be found in the debased coinage, 
so bulky that a pony can only carry ten pounds worth of it the entire lack of such banking facilities as even in western china render business transactions easy the general mutual distrust prejudices against preparing hides and working leather caste prejudices the general insecurity of earnings ignorance absolutely inconceivable and the existence of numerous guilds which possess practical monopolies under japanese influence however the superb silver yen has made its way slowly into the interior and instead of having to carry a load of cash as on my former journey or to be placed in great difficulties by the want of it this large silver coin was readily taken at all the inns although i did not see a single specimen of the new korean coinage trade as i became acquainted with it is represented by japanese buyers who visit the small towns and villages buying up rice grain and beans which they forward to the ports for shipment to japan and by an organized corporation of pusang or peddlers one of the most important of the many guilds which have been among the curious features of korea there are no shops in villages and few where there are any even in small towns it is in fact impossible to buy anything except on the market day as no one keeps any stock of anything at the weekly market the usual melancholy dullness of a korean village is exchanged for bustle color and crowds of men from an early hour in the morning the paths leading to the officially appointed center are thronged with peasants bringing in their wares for sale or barter chiefly fowls in coops pigs straw shoes straw hats and wooden spoons while the main road has its complement of merchants that is peddlers mostly fine strong well-dressed men either carrying their heavy packs themselves or employing porters or bulls for the purpose these men travel on regular circuits to the village centers and are industrious and respectable a few put up stalls especially those who sell silks gauzes cords for girdles dress shoes amber buttons silks in skeins small mirrors tobacco pouches dress combs of tortoise shell for men's top knots tape girdles for trousers boxes with mirror tops and the like but most of the articles from which one learns a good deal about the necessaries and luxuries required by the korean are exposed for sale on low tables or on mats on the ground the merchant giving the occupant of the house before which he camps a few cash for the accommodation on such tables are sticks of pulled candy as thick as an arm some of it stuffed with sesame seeds a sweetmeat sold in enormous quantities and peace goods shirtings of japanese and english make victoria lawns hempen cloth turkey red cottons korean flimsy silks dyes chiefly aniline which are sold in great quantities together with saffron, indigo, and Chinese Prussian blue. On these are also exposed long pipes, contraband in the capital, and Japanese cigarettes, coming into great favor with young men and boys, with leather courier bags and lucifer matches from the same country, wooden combs, hairpins with tinsel heads, and, such is the march of ideas, purses for silver paper the best of the korean manufacturers in its finer qualities prosed in chulla do is honored by stalls every kind is purchasable in these markets from the beautiful translucent buff oiled paper nearly equal to vellum in appearance and tenacity used for the floors of middle and upper class houses and the stout paper for covering walls to the thin strong film for writing on and a beautiful fabric a sort of frothy gauze for wrapping up delicate fabrics as well as the coarse fibrous material used for covering heavy packages and intermediate grades applied to every imaginable purpose such as the making of string almost all manufactured from the paper mulberry 
On mats on the ground are exposed straw mats, straw and string shoes, flints for use with steel, black buckram dress hats, coarse narrow cotton cloth of Korean manufacture, rope muzzles for horses, much needed, sweeping whisks, wooden sabots and straw, reed and bamboo hats in endless variety. On these also are rough iron goods, family cooking pots, horseshoes, spade shoes, door rings, nails, and carpenter's tools, when of native manufacture as rough as they can be, and Korean roots and fruits, tasteless and untempting, great hard pears much like raw parsnips, chestnuts, peanuts, persimmons which had been soaked in water to take the acridity out of them, and ginger. There were coops of fowls and piles of pheasants brought down by falcons, gorgeous birds selling at six for a yen, about four pence each, and torn and hacked pieces of bull beef. One prominent feature of that special market was the native pottery, both coarse and brittle ware, clay with a pale green glaze rudely applied, small jars and bowls chiefly, and a coarser ware, nearly black and slightly iridescent, closely resembling iron. This pottery is of universal use among the poor for cooking pots, water jars, refuse jars, receptacles for grain and pulse, and pickle jars five feet high, roomy enough to hold a man, two of which are a bull's load. At that season these jars were in great request, for the peasant world was occupied, the men in digging up a great hard white radish weighing from two to four pounds, and the women in washing its great head of partially blanched leaves, which, after being laid aside in these jars in brine, form one great article of a Korean peasant's winter diet. Umbrella hats, oiled paper, hat covers, pounded capsicums, rice, peas, and beans, bean curd and other necessaries of Korean existence were there, but business was very dull, and the crowds of people were nearly as quiet as the gentle bulls which stood hour after hour among them. Late in the afternoon, the peddlers packed up their wares and departed en route for the next centre, and a good deal of hard drinking closed the day. I have been thus minute in my description because the peripatetic merchant really represents the fashion of Korean trade, and the wares which are brought to market are both the necessaries and luxuries of Korean existence. The reader will agree with me that, except for a certain amount of insight into Korean customs, which can only be gained by mixing freely with Koreans, the journey from Seoul to Pyongyang tends to monotony, though at the time Mr. Yi's brightness, intelligence, sense of fun, and unvarying good nature made it very pleasant. Among the few features of interest on the road are the hill towns, of which three are striking objects, especially one on the hill opposite to the magistracy of Pieng San, the hilltop being surrounded by a battlemented wall two miles in circuit, enclosing a tangled thicket containing a few hovels and the remains of some granaries. Unwalled towns are supposed to possess such strongholds, with stores of rice and soy, as refuges in times of invasion or rebellion, but as they have not been required for three centuries, they are now ruinous. The one on a high hill above Sai Nam, where the last Chinese gate occurs, is imposing from its fine gateway and the extent of ground it encloses. Two days before reaching Pyongyang, we crossed the highest pass on the road, and by a glen wooded with such deciduous trees, shrubs, and trailers as ash, elegnus, euonymus, hornbeam, oak, lime, acantopanax ricinifolia, actinidia with scarlet berries, clematis, Ampelopsis vaichii, etc., descended to the valley of the Nam Ton, a broad but shallow stream which joins the Tai Dong. On the right bank, where the stream, crossed by a dilapidated bridge, 
is 128 yards wide, the town of Wangju is picturesquely situated, 36 li from the sea, at the base of two low, fur-crowned hills, which terminate in cliffs above the Nam Chon. A battlemented wall nine li in circumference, with several fine towers and gateways, encloses the town, and being carried along the verge of the cliff and over the downs and ups of the hills, has a very striking appearance. It was a singularly attractive view. The Korean sky was at its bluest, and the winding Nam Chon was seen in glimpses here and there through the broad fertile plain in reaches as blue, and the broken sparkle of its shallow waters flashed in sapphire gleams against the grey rock and the grey walls of the city. On the wall, and grouped in the handsome water gate, were a number of Japanese soldiers watching a crowd of Koreans sparing white fish with three-pronged forks from rafts made of two bundles of reeds with a cask lashed between them, and from the bridge the ruinous state of the walls and towers could not be seen. Wangju is memorable to me as being the first place I saw which had suffered from the ravages of recent war. There the Japanese came upon the Chinese, but there was no fighting at that point. Yet whatever happened has been enough to reduce a flourishing town with an estimated population of 30,000 souls to one of between five and 6,000, and to destroy whatever prosperity it had. I passed through the water gate into a deplorable scene of desolation. There were heaps of ruins, some blackened by fire, others where the houses had apparently collapsed all of a heap, with posts and rafters sticking out of it. There are large areas of nothing but this, and streets of deserted houses, sadder yet, with doors and windows gone for the bivouac fires of the Japanese, and streets where roofless mud walls alone were standing. In some parts there were houses with windows gone and torn paper waving from their walls, and then perhaps an inhabited house stood solitary among the deserted or destroyed, emphasizing the desolation. Some of the destruction was wrought by the Chinese, some by the Japanese, and much resulted from the terrified flight of more than 20,000 of the inhabitants. North of Wangju are rich plains of productive, stoneless, red alluvium, extending towards the Taidong for nearly 40 miles. On these there were villages partly burned and partly depopulated and ruinous, and tracts of the superb soil had passed out of cultivation owing to the flight of the cultivators, and there was a total absence of beasts, the splendid bulls of the region having perished under their loads en route for Manchuria. It was a dreary journey that day through partially destroyed villages, relapsing plains, and slopes denuded of every stick which could be burned. There were no wayfarers on the roads, no movement of any kind, and as it grew dusk, the Mapu were afraid of tigers and robbers, and we halted for the night at the wretched hamlet of Komontari, where I obtained a room with delay and difficulty, partly owing to the unwillingness of the people to receive a foreigner. They had suffered enough from foreigners, truly. The concluding day's march was through a pleasant country, though denuded of trees, and the approach to a great city was denoted by a number of villages, demon shrines, and refreshment booths on the road, the increased traffic, and, eventually, by a long avenue of stone tablets, some of them under highly decorated roofs, recording the virtues of Pyongyang officials for 250 years. The first view of Pyongyang delighted me. The city has a magnificent situation, taken advantage of with much skill, and at a distance merits the epithet imposing. It was a glorious afternoon. All the low ranges which girdle the rich plain through which the Taidong winds were blue and violet, melting into a blue haze, the crystal waters of the river were bluer still, 
brown-sailed boats drifted lazily with the stream, and above it the grey mass of the city rose into a dome of unclouded blue. It is built on lofty ground, rising abruptly from the river, above which a fine wall climbs picturesquely over irregular but always ascending altitudes, till it is lost among the pines of a hill which overhangs the Taidong. The great double-roofed Taidong Mon, river gate, decorated pavilions on the walls, the massive curled roofs of the governor's yamen, a large Buddhist monastery and temple on a height, and a fine temple to the god of war, prominent objects from a distance, prepare one for something quite apart from the ordinary meanness of a Korean city. Crossing the clear flashing waters of the Taidong with our ponies in a crowded ferry boat, we found ourselves in the slush of the dark water gate, at all hours of the day crowded with water carriers. There are no wells in the city, the reason assigned for the deficiency being that the walls enclose a boat-shaped area, and that the digging of wells would cause the boat to sink. The water is carried almost entirely in American kerosene tins. I lodged at the house of a broker, and had nice clean rooms for myself and Im, quite quiet and with a separate access from the street. It was truly a luxury to have roof, walls and floor papered with thick oiled paper much resembling varnished oak, but there was no hot floor and I had to rely for warmth solely on the fire bowl. Taking a most diverting boy as my guide, I went outside the city wall, through some farming country, to a Korean house in a very tumble-to-pieces compound which he insisted was the dwelling of the American missionaries. But I only found a Korean family, and there were no traces of foreign occupation in glass panes let into the paper of the windows and doors. Nothing daunted, the boy pulled me through a smaller compound, opened the door, and pushed me into what was manifestly posing as a foreign room, gave me a chair, took one himself, and offered me a cigarette. I had reached the right place. It was a very rough Korean room, about the length and width of a Norfolk and Western Railway saloon carriage. It had three camp beds, three chairs, a trunk for a table, and a few books and writing materials, as well as a few articles of male apparel hanging on the mud walls. I waited more than an hour, every attempt at departure being forcibly, as well as volubly, resisted by the urchin, imagining the devotion which could sustain educated men year after year in such surroundings, and then they came in hilariously, and we had a most pleasant evening. I shall say more of them later. It was a weird walk through ruins which looked ghostly in the starlight to my curious quarters in the densest part of the city by the water gate, where at intervals through the night I heard the beat of the sorcerer's drum and the shrieking chant of the mutang. It may be taken for granted that every Korean winter day is splendid, but the following day in Pyongyang was heavenly. Three Koreans called on me in the morning very courteous persons, but as Mr. Yi and I had parted company for a time on reaching the city, the interpretation was feeble, and we bowed and smiled, and smiled and bowed with tedious iteration, without coming to much mutual understanding, and I was glad when the time came for seeing the city and battlefield under Mr. Moffat's guidance. On such an incomparable day, everything looked at its very best, but also at its very worst, for the brilliant sunshine lit up desolations sickening to contemplate, a prosperous city of 80,000 inhabitants reduced to decay and 50,000, four-fifths of its houses destroyed, streets and alleys choked with ruins, hill slopes and vales once thick with Korean crowded homesteads covered with gaunt, hideous remains, fragments of broken walls, kung floors, kung chimneys, indefinite heaps in which roofs and walls lay in unpicturesque confusion, and still worse, roofs and walls standing, 
but doors and windows all gone, suggesting the horror of human faces with their eyes put out. Everywhere there were the same scenes, miles of them, and very much of the desolation was charred and blackened, shapeless, hideous, hopeless, under the mocking sunlight. Pyongyang was not taken by assault. There was no actual fighting in the city. Both the Chinese who fled and the Japanese who occupied posed as the friends of Korea, and all this wreck and ruin was brought about not by enemies, but by those who professed to be fighting to give her independence and reform. It had gradually come to be known that the Wojen, dwarfs, did not kill Koreans, hence many had returned. Some of these unfortunate fugitives were picking their way among the heaps, trying to find indications which might lead them to the spots where all they knew of home once existed, and here and there, where a family found their walls and roofs standing, they put a door and window into one room and lived in it among the ruins of five or six. When the Japanese entered and found that the larger part of the population had fled, the soldiers tore out the posts and woodwork and often used the roofs also for fuel or lighted fires on house floors, leaving them burning when the houses took fire and perished. They looted the property left by the fugitives during three weeks after the battle, taking even from Mr. Moffat's house seven hundred dollars worth, although his servant made a written protest, the looting being sanctioned by the presence of officers. Under these circumstances, the prosperity of the most prosperous city in Korea was destroyed. If such are the results of war in the green tree, what must they be in the dry? During the subsequent occupation, the Japanese troops behaved well, and all stores obtained in the town and neighborhood were scrupulously paid for. Intensely as the people hated them, they admitted that quiet and good order had been preserved, and they were very apprehensive that on their withdrawal they would suffer much from the Kunren Tai, a regiment of Koreans drilled and armed by the Japanese, and these had already begun to rob and beat the people and to defy the civil authorities. The main street on my second visit had assumed a bustling appearance. There was much building up and pulling down, for Japanese traders had obtained all the eligible business sites and were transforming the small, dark, low, Korean shops into large, light, airy, dainty Japanese erections, well stocked with Japanese goods, and specially with kerosene lamps of every pattern and price, the de Fries and Hinkes patents being unblushingly infringed. Pyongyang has a truly beautiful situation on the right or north bank of the clear, bright Taidong, 400 yards wide at the ferry. It occupies an undulating plateau, and its wall, parallel for two miles and a half, rises from the river level at the stately water gate, and following its windings, mounts escarped hills to a height of over 400 feet, turning westwards at the crest of the cliff at a sharp angle marked by a pavilion, one of several, and follows the western ridge of the plateau, where it falls steeply down to a fertile rolling plain where the one real battle of the late war was fought. This wall, which is in excellent repair, is a loopholed and battlemented structure, twenty feet high, pierced by several gates with gate towers. The city, large as it was, was once much larger, for the old wall on the west side encloses a far larger area than the modern one. The walk over the grassy undulations within the wall and up to the northern pine-clothed summit is entrancing, and the views, even in winter, are exquisite, eastwards over a rich white plain to the mountains through which the Taidong cuts its way, or northwest to one of its affluents and the great battlefield over which in 1593 the joint forces of Chinese and Koreans poured to recover Pyongyang from the Japanese, or seawards, where the clear bright waters wind through fertile and populous country, 
or the hilly area within the walls where pine-closed knolls conceal the devastations and the governor's yamen temples and monasteries make a goodly show between the city and the chinese frontier is the largest and richest plain in korea to the east where the violet shadows lay are the valleys of the two branches of the tai dong rich in silk iron and cotton while within ten miles there are at least five coal mines and for all produce there is easy communication with the sea thirty-six miles distance for vessels of light draught by means of the river which flows below the city wall footnote there are five coal miles at distances varying from ten to thirty li from pyongyang those of yangtang fifteen li away producing the best quality with rich iron ore close to the river bank at kai chon about thirty-six li off the elements of prosperity are ready to hand the coal owners have no proper appliances for working the coal rely chiefly on korean axes and the output is very small much money has been spent in trying to get the coal and in two mines they cannot proceed any farther with their present tools the difficulties of transport are great and there is no demand for any quantity in pyongyang itself but the mineral is there in abundance and of good quality and only awaits capital and enterprise a tax of five per cent is levied on all coal sent away from the mines the total export for eighteen ninety five was only six hundred fifty two tons varied at four dollars twenty cents per ton nine shillings End footnote. timber is rafted down the taidong in summer the peking road which i had followed thus far and which for centuries has linked pyongyang with the outer world and the capital is another element in the former prosperity of the city it was to photograph for the widow and family of general tso of mukden the commander of the best disciplined and best equipped cavalry brigade in the chinese army the scenes connected with his last days and death that i visited the hill within the wall the river wall of pyongyang after two miles of an undulating ascent turns sharply at a pavilion outside of which the ground falls precipitously to rise again in a knife-like ridge the three highest points of which are crowned with chinese forts from this pavilion the wall following the lie of the hill slopes rapidly down to a very picturesque and narrow gate the chil sung mon or seven star gate after which it trends in a northwesterly direction to the potong mon in the pine wood at the highest part of the angle formed by the wall general tso had built three mud forts or camps with walls ten feet high the ground under the trees is dotted with the stone-lined cooking holes of his men blackened with the smoke of their last fires on the afternoon of the fifteenth of september eighteen ninety four general tso and his force which mustered five thousand men when it left mukden but must have been greatly diminished by desertion and death made its fatal sally passing through the chil sung mon and down the steep zigzag descent below it to the plain meeting his death probably within three hundred yards of the gate the koreans say that some of his men took up the body but were shot by the japanese while removing it and that it was lost in the slaughter which ensued a neat obelisk rail drowned was erected by the japanese at the supposed spot bearing on one face the inscription tso pao kuei commander-in-chief of the feng tian division place of death and on the other killed while fighting with the japanese troops at pyongyang a graceful tribute to their ablest foe general tso's troops demoralized by his death sought refuge everywhere from the deadly fire of the japanese apart flying back to their forts within the wall while many probably blinded and desperate rode along the pine woods which densely covered the broken ground outside by a path along a wide dry moat 
which, three weeks later, when Mr. Moffat returned, was piled with the dead bodies of their horses. In the bright moonlight night which followed that day, the Japanese stormed and took by assault the three Chinese forts on the three summits of the ridge, which were the key of the position, enabling them to throw their shell into the Chinese forts and camps within the wall. The beautiful pavilion at the angle of the wall is much shattered, and big fragments of shell are embedded in its pillars and richly carved woodwork. So desperately hurried was the flight of the vanquished from the last fort which held out, that they were mown down in numbers as they ran down the steep hill, falling face foremost, with their outstretched hands clutching the earth. All was then lost, and why that doomed army, numbering then perhaps twelve thousand men, did not surrender unconditionally, I cannot imagine. During the night, abandoning guns and all war material, the remains of Tso's brigade and all the infantry and unwounded men passed through the deserted and silent city, surged out of the Potong Mon, crossed the shallow stream, and emerged upon a plain girdled by low hills and intersected by the Peking Road, the eastern extremity being occupied by some Chinese forts and breastworks. Tso's cavalry attempted to cross the plain and gain the shelter of some low hills, while great numbers of the infantry took to the Peking Road. The horrors of that night will never be accurately known. The Battle of Pyongyang was lost and won when the forts were taken. What remained was less of a battle than a massacre. Before the morning, this force, the flower of the Chinese army as to drill and equipment, had perished, those who escaped never reappearing as an organized body. It is estimated that from 2,000 to 4,000 men were slain, with thousands of horses and bulls, the cavalry being literally mown down in hundreds, and lying, men and horses, heaped in mounds. For the Japanese had girdled the plain with a ring of fire. Mr. Moffat, who was there three weeks later, described the scene even then as one of indescribable horror. Still there were mounds of men and horses stiffened in the death agony, many having tried vainly to extricate themselves from the pile above them. There were blackened corpses in hundreds lying along the Peking Road, ditches filled up with bodies of men and animals, fields sprinkled with them, and rifles, muskets, paper umbrellas, Fans, coats, hats, sword belts, scabbards, cartridge boxes, sleeves, and everything that could be cast away in a desperate flight strewing the ground. Numbers of the wounded crept into the deserted houses and died there, some of the bodies showing indications of suicide from agony, and throughout this mass of human relics which lay blackening and festering in the hot sun, Dogs, left behind by their owners, were holding high carnival. Even in my walks over the battlefield, though the grain of another year had ripened upon it, I saw human skulls, spines with ribs, spines with the pelvis attached, arms and hands, hats, belts, and scabbards. On a lofty knoll within the wall, the Japanese have erected a fine monolith to the memory of the 168 men they lost. They turned the temple of the god of war into a hospital, and there, cela va sans dire, their wounded were admirably treated, and in another building the Chinese wounded were carefully attended to, though naturally not till many of them had died of their wounds on the battlefield. A ghastly retribution followed the neglect to bury the Chinese dead, for typhus fever broke out, and its ravages among the Japanese troops may be partially estimated by the long lines of graves in the military cemetery at Chemulpo. Outside the wall, in beautifully broken ground, roughly wooded with the Pinus sinensis, there are still bullets in the branches many of which were splintered by the iron hail, and the temple at the tomb of Kitse, the founder of Korean civilization, must have been the center of a deadly fight, 
for its woodwork is riddled with bullets and damaged by shell, and on its floor are great dark stains, where, when the fight was over, the Japanese wounded lay in pools of blood. At some points, especially at the mud forts by the ferry, the Chinese made a very determined stand for ten hours, so that the Japanese troops wavered, and were only recovered by a gallant dash made by General Oshima. Probably the Battle of Pyongyang decided the fate of the campaign. Mr. Yi found an old book in eighteen volumes for sale, which gives a history of this city. Most Korean matters are lost in obscurity after one or two centuries, but the story of Pyongyang takes a bold backward leap and deals fearlessly with the events of centuries B.C. Kitse, whose fine reputed tomb and temples in the wood are still regarded with so much reverence that a stone tablet on the road below warns equestrians to dismount in passing so sacred a place, and who is said to have emigrated from China in 1122 BC and to have founded a dynasty which lasted for seven centuries, made Pyongyang his capital. The temple at his reputed grave, though full of bullets, is in admirable repair, and its rich decorations have lately been renovated, a phenomenon in Korea. Near the city is the standard of land measurement which he introduced, illustrated by ditches and paths cut, it is said, by himself. The temple to the god of war at the foot of the hill is perhaps the finest in Korea. Frescoes, as in the temple to the same god outside the south gate of Seoul, but on a far grander scale, cover the walls of the corridors of one of the courtyards, and the gigantic figures round the altar, with the sacrificial utensils, hangings and dresses, are costly and magnificent. Not far from this is a large and wealthy Buddhist monastery. End of section 28「Section 29 of Korea and Her Neighbors」by Isabella L. Bird. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Hawaii in May 2021. Chapter 27 – Northward Ho! For the northern journey simple preparations only were needed, consisting of the purchase of candles and two blankets for him, in having two pheasants cooked, in dispensing with one pony, leaving us the moderate allowance of two baggage animals, and in depositing most of my money with Mr. Moffat. For there were rumours of robbers on the road, and Mr. Yi left his fine clothes and elegant travelling gear also behind. On a brilliant morning, and when are Korean mornings not brilliant, Passing through the gate out of which General Tso made his last sally, and down the steep declivity on which it opens, we travelled for a time along the Anju road, skirting the base of the hill on which the Chinese cavalry made their desperate attack on an entrenched position, and near the ruins of two entrenched camps, where they fell in hundreds before the merciless fire of the enemy, and where human bones were still lying about but where death reaped that ghastly harvest, magnificent grain crops had recently been secured, and the mellow sunlight shone on miles of stubble. Shortly we turned off on a road untouched by the havoc of war, and saw no more of the gaunt ruins or charred remains of cottages. In that pleasant region, ranges of hills with pines on their lower slopes girdle valleys of rich stoneless alluvium, producing abundantly cotton, tobacco, castor oil, wheat, barley, peas, beans, and, most especially, the red and white millet. Wherever a lateral valley descends upon the one through which the road passes, there is a village of thatched houses, pretty enough at a distance and embowered in fruit trees, while clumps of pines, oaks, elms, and selkavas denote the burial places of its dead, who are the guardians of the only fine timber which is suffered to exist. 
the hamlets along the road were cheerfully busy millet was stacked in the village roadways leaving only room for one laden animal to pass at a time and as all the threshing of rice and grain is done with double flails also in the village street one actually rides over the threshed product the red or large millet is nearly as useful to the korean as is the bamboo to the chinese its stalks furnish fuel material for mats and thick woven fences and even for houses for in pyong an do the walls are formed of bundles of millet stalks eight feet high for the uprights across which single stalks are laid the interstices being filled up with mud after two days of somewhat monotonous prettiness beyond shoyang yi the country became really beautiful some of the larger valleys were specially attractive with abundance of fruit and other deciduous trees below the dark pinus sinensis on the hill slopes and there were plenty of large villages with a general look of prosperity everything clothing included being much cleaner than usual there were fine views of lofty dog-tooth peaks and of serrated ranges running east and west nearly every valley has its bright rapid stream on which the hills descend on one side in abrupt and much caverned limestone cliffs the other side being level and fertile the people there and doubtless everywhere were taken up entirely with their own concerns the new system of taxation under which a fixed tax in money is levied on the assessed value of the land meeting with their approval events in seoul had no interest for them the recent murder of the queen and the imprisonment of the king did not concern them as there were no effects of either on their circumstances after crossing the pass of miryok yang eight hundred sixteen feet in altitude in a romantic region we entered poorer country with stony soil often piled with large shingle by the violence of streams then perfectly dry by misdirection misunderstanding or complexity or complete illegibility of the track we spent much of the day in losing and retracing our way scrambling up steep rock ladders etc and when we reached kai pang after dusk we were for some time refused admission to the inn the owner said he could not take in any one travelling with so many mapu four and a soldier he was terrified he said we should go away in the morning without paying him and should beat him when he asked to be paid however the mapu gave me such an excellent character that at last he consented and i had an excellent room that is the walls and roof were cream washed which gave it a look of cleanliness the timid innkeeper was old and this brought out the fact that when a local magistrate has aged parents it is customary for him to invite to an entertainment everybody in his district between the ages of sixty and one hundred and it is usual for the old men to take their oldest grandsons with them as testimonies to their old age as every guest has to be accompanied fittingly the company often numbers two hundred at ka chang and elsewhere the pigsties are much more solid than the houses being regular log cabins with substantial roofs for the protection of their inmates from tigers or in that neighbourhood from wolves these pigs of which every country family in korea possesses some are of an absurdly small black breed a full-grown animal not weighing more than twenty-six pounds during the two days journey from the market-place of sian chong we passed the magistracies of cha san and unsan ferrying the taidong just beyond cha san where it is a fine stream three hundred seventeen yards broad and is said by the ferrymen to be forty-seven feet deep all that region is well peopled and fertile there are no resident young buns in the province of pyong an gold is obtained by a simple process all round the country especially at keung san at bolpo a prettily situated village and elsewhere 
a quantity of the coarser descriptions of paper is made. Paper and tobacco were the goods that were on the move, bound for Pyongyang. Paper is used for a greater variety of purposes in Korea than anywhere else, and its toughness and durability render it invaluable. The coarser sorts are made from old rags and paper, the finer from the paper mulberry. Paper is the one article of Korean manufacture which is exported in any quantity to China, where it is used for some of the same purposes. Oil paper, about a sixth of an inch in thickness, is pasted on the floors instead of carpets or mats. It bears washing and takes a high polish from dry rubbing. In the royal palaces, where two tints are used carefully, it resembles oak parquet. It is also used for walls. A thinner quality is made into the folding, conical hat covers which every Korean carries in his sleeve, and into waterproof cloaks, coats, and baggage covers. A very thick kind of paper made of several thicknesses beaten together is used for trunks, which are strong enough to hold heavy articles. Lanterns, tobacco pouches, and fans are made of paper, and the Korean wooden latticed windows, from the palace to the hovel, are glazed with a thin, white, tough variety, which is translucent. Much prized, however, were my photographic glass plates when cleaned. Many a joyful householder let one into his window, giving himself an opportunity of amusement and espionage denied to his neighbours. The day's journey from Ka Chang to Tok Chon is through very attractive scenery with grand mountain views. After crossing a low but severe pass, we came down upon a large affluent of the Tai Dong, which for want of a name I designate as the Komop So, flowing as a full-watered green stream between lofty cliffs of much caverned limestone fantastically buttressed, and between hills which grow out rocky spurs, terminating or thinning down into high limestone walls resembling those of ruinous fortifications. Again losing the way and our time, a struggle over a rough pass brought us in view of the Tai Dong, with the characteristics of its mountain course, long rapids with glints of foam and rocks, long reaches of deep, still, slow-gliding, jagged, translucent green water, broad and deep, making constant abrupt turns, and by its volume suggesting great powers of destructiveness when it is liberated from its mountain barriers. In about a fortnight it would be frozen for the winter, Diamond flashing in the fine breeze, below noble cliffs and cobalt mountains, across which cloud shadows were sailing in indigo, under a vault of cloud-flecked blue, that view was one of those dreams of beauty which become a possession forever. From that pass the road, if it can be called such, is shut in with the Tai Dong for thirty li. In some places there is not room even for the narrowest bridle track, and the ponies scramble as they may over the rough boulders which margin the water, and climb the worn, steep, and rocky steps, often as high as their own knees, by which the breakneck track is taken over the rocky spurs which descend on the river. It is one of the worst pieces of road I ever encountered, and it was not wonderful that we did not meet a single traveller, and that there should be only about nine a year. We made by our utmost efforts only a short mile an hour, and it took us five hours of this severe work to reach the wretched hamlet of Huok Kuri, a few hovels dumped down among heaps of stones and great boulders, some of which served as bags for the huts. Poverty-stricken, filthy, squalid, the few inhabitants subsisted entirely on red millet. Poor Mr. Yi, who had had a wakeful night owing to vermin, said woefully as he dismounted stiffly, sleepy, tired, cold, hungry, and there was nothing to eat, and little for the ponies either, which may have been the reason that they got up a desperate fight, of which they bore the traces for some days. 
the track continued shut in by the high mountains which lie the tai dong till within a mile of tok chong forcing the ponies to climb worn rock ladders or to pick a perilous way among sharp pointed rocks i had not thought that korea could produce anything so empathic as the road occasionally broke up in face of some apparently impassable spur we occasionally got into impassable places and lost time so badly that we were benighted when little more than half way but as there were no inhabitants we pushed on as a matter of necessity when we got to better going the mapu inspired by the double terror of robbers and wild animals hurried on the ponies yelling as they drove and by the time we reached the tok chon ferry a young moon had risen and the mountains in shadow and the great ferry boat full of horses men in white and bulls in relief against the silvered water made a beautiful night scene i sent on the ponies and im to prepare my room fully expecting comfort as at pyongyang for though i could never find anybody who had been at tok chon it was always spoken of as a sort of metropolis it is indeed a magistracy with a remarkably ruinous yamen and a market-place and is the chief town of a very large region it is entered from the river by stepping stones through abominable slush by a long narrow street from which we were directed on and on till we came to a wide place where the inns of the towns are there in the moonlight a great masculine crowd had collected and in the middle of it were our mapu with the loads still on their ponies raging at large and im rushing hither and thither like a madman for they had been refused accommodation and every door had been barred against them on the ground that i was a foreigner they said truly or falsely that no foreigner had ever profaned tok chon by his presence that they lived in peace and did not want to be implicated with a foreigner all foreigners being japanese it is most disagreeable to force oneself in even the slightest degree on any one but i had been twelve hours in the saddle it was eight p m there was snow on the ground and it was freezing hard the yard door of one inn was opened a chink for a moment our men rushed for it but it was at once barred and we were all again left standing in the street the centre of a crowd which increased every moment our men eventually forced open the door of one inn and got their ponies in then the paper was torn off two doors and im was visible against the light from within tearing about like a black demon we had then stood like statues for two hours with our feet in freezing slush the great crowd preserving a ring round us staring stolidly but not showing any hostility at last im appeared at an open door waving my chair and we got into a high dark lumber room but the crowd was too quick for us and came tumbling in behind us till the place was full then the landlord closed the doors but they were smashed in and he had no better luck when he weakly besought the people to look at him and not at the stranger for his entreaty only produced an ebullition of korean wit by no means complimentary an official from the yamen arrived and inquired if i had any complaint to make but i had none and he sat down and took a prolonged stare on his own account not making any attempt to disperse the crowd so i sat facing the door mr yi not far off smoking endless cigarettes while im battled for a room after one he had secured had its doors broken down by the crowd i sat for two hours longer in that cold ruinous miserable place two front and three back doorways filled up with men the whole male population of tok chon and never moved a muscle or showed any sign of dissatisfaction some sat on the door sill little men were on the shoulders of big ones all inside and outside clamoring at once the situation might have been serious had a european man been with me 
and the experiences of Mr. Campbell of the consular service at Cap San might have been repeated. No Englishman could have kept his temper in such circumstances from 8 p.m. till midnight. He would certainly have knocked somebody down, and then there would have been a fight. The ill-bred curiosity tires, but does not annoy me, though it exceeded all bounds that night. Fortunately for me, a Korean gentleman is taught from his earliest boyhood that he must never lose his temper, and that it is a degradation to him to touch an inferior, therefore he must never strike a servant or one of the lower orders. At midnight, probably weary of our passivity and anxious for sleep, the inn people consented to give me a room in the backyard if I did not object to one prepared for sacrifice and containing the ancestral tablets. The crowd then filled the back yard and attempted to pour into my room when Im's sorely tried patience gave way for only the second time and he knocked people down left and right. This, and the contents of a fire bowl which was upset in the scrimmage, helped to scatter the crowd, but it was there again at daylight, attempting to enter every time Im opened the door. The room prepared for sacrifice in aspect was a small barn, fearfully dirty and littered with rubbish, and bundles of rags, rope, and old shoes were tucked away among the beams and rafters. My camp bed cut it exactly in half. In the inner half there was a dusty table, and behind it on a black stand a dusty black shrine, at the back of which was a four-leaved screen covered with long strips of paper, on which were poems in praise of the deceased. In front, dividing the room and falling from the roof to the floor, was a curtain made of two widths of very dirty foreign calico. Among the poor, instead of setting food before the ancestral shrine twice or thrice daily during the three years of mourning for a parent, it is only placed there twice a month. In a small white wooden tablet within the shrine, popular belief places the residence of the third soul of the deceased, as I have mentioned before. I spent two days at Tok Chon. Properly speaking, the Taidong is never navigable to that point, owing to many and dangerous rapids, and any idea of the possibility of this highly picturesque stream becoming a great commercial highway may be utterly dismissed. Small boats can ascend it at all seasons to Mu Chin Tai, about 140 li lower down, and during two summer months, when the water is high, a few with much difficulty get up to Tok Chon, and even a few li farther, and at the same season rafts descend from the forests of the Yung Won district, from 30 to 40 li higher, but owing to severe rapids, shallows and sandbanks, which shift continually, the river is not really navigable higher than Pyongyang, and all commercial theories built upon it are totally chimerical. For thirty li above Tok Chon, the river scenery is far grander than below, the perpendicular walls of limestone rock rising from 800 to 1,000 feet, with lofty mountains above them, the peaks of which, even so early as the end of November, were crested with new-fallen snow. I had been assured in Pyongyang that boats could be hired at Tok Chon, and I had planned to descend the river, but there are no boats except a few fairy scows, higher than Mo Chin Tai. Tok Chon and its district are lamentably poor. The people said that the war had made the necessaries of life dearer, and that they had only the same produce to barter or buy with. The reforms which were being carried out farther south had not reached that region, and squeezing was still carried on by the officials. Rice, the ordinary staff of Korean life, is brought from Anju, but is used only by the rich, that is, the officials. The poor live on large and small millet. Potatoes and wheat are grown, but the soil is poor and stony. A little trade, chiefly in dried fish and seaweed, is done with one son. 
a few silk linos and gauzes of very poor quality are made, the industry having been introduced by the Chinese. Peace goods are only a few cash dearer than at Pyongyang. Those displayed on the market day were nearly all Japanese. It was the dullest market I have seen. The peddlers carried away nearly as much as they brought. The country is absolutely denuded of wood. There are no deciduous trees, and the region owes its few groves of dwarfed and distorted pines to the horseshoe graves on the hillsides. A yamen, which only hangs together from force of habit, a Confucian temple and a Buddhist temple on a height are the only noteworthy buildings. The district magistrate returned while I was in Tokchon, and the people showed a degree of interest in the event. Runners lined the river bank by the ferry, blowing horns. Forty men in black gauze coats over their white ones, and a few singing girls met his chair and ran with it to the yamen, and a few men looked on apathetically. A more squalid retinue could not be imagined. Some magistrates had a thousand of such retainers paid by this impoverished country. In a single province there were at that time forty-four district mandarins, with an average staff of four hundred men each, whose sole duties were those of police and tax collecting, their food alone, at the rate of two dollars per month, costing three hundred ninety-two thousand four hundred dollars a year. This army of seventeen thousand six hundred men, not receiving a living wage, squeezed on its own account the peasant who in Korea has neither rights nor privileges, except that of being the ultimate sponge. As an illustration of the methods of proceeding, I give the case of a village in a southern province. Telegraph poles were required, and the provincial governor made a requisition of 100 cash on every house. The local magistrate increased it to 200, and his runners to 250, which was actually paid by the people, the runner is getting fifty cash, the magistrate one hundred, and the governor one hundred, a portion of which sum was expended on the object for which it was levied. An edict abolishing this attendance and reducing the salaries of magistrates had recently been promulgated. At Tok Chon, the ruin and decay of official buildings and the filth and squalor of the private dwellings could go no farther. End of section twenty nine. Section 30 of Korea and Her Neighbors by Isabella L. Bird. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Abai in May 2021. Chapter 28 Over the Ankil Yung Pass. Finding the Taidong totally impracticable and being limited as to time by the approach of the closing of the river below Pyongyang by ice, I regretfully turned southwards, and journeyed solewards by another route of much interest, which touches here and there the right bank of the Taidong. As I sat amidst the dirt, squalor, rubbish, and odd and endism of the inn-yard before starting, surrounded by an apathetic, dirty, vacant-looking, open-mouthed crowd steeped in poverty, I felt Korea to be hopeless, helpless, pitiable, piteous, a mere shuttlecock of certain great powers, and that there is no hope for her population of twelve or fourteen millions unless it is taken in hand by Russia, under whose rule, giving security for the gains of industry as well as light taxation, I had seen Koreans in hundreds transformed into energetic, thriving peasant farmers in eastern Siberia. The road, which was said, and truly, to be a very bad one, crosses a small plain, and passing under a roofed gateway between two hills, which are scarred by remains of fortifications running east and west, enters upon really fine scenery which becomes magnificent in about thirty li, at first a fertile mountain-girdled basin, whose rim is spotted with large villages, 
and then a narrowing valley with stony soil and a sparse population walled in by savage mountains of empathetic forms swinging apart at times and revealing loftier peaks and ranges then glittering with new-fallen snow in crossing the plain at a point where the road was good i was remarking to mr yi what a pleasant and prosperous journey we had had and hoping our good fortune might continue when there was a sudden clash and flurry i was nearly kicked off my pony and in a moment we were in the midst of disaster one baggage pony was on his back on his load pawing the air in the middle of a ploughed field his mapu helpless for the time lamed by a kick above the knee sobbing blood and tears running down his face the other baggage animal having divested himself of im was kicking off the rest of his load and im who had been thrown from the top of the pack was sitting on the roadside evidently in intense pain all the work of a moment mr yi called to me that the soldier had broken his ankle and it was a great relief when he rose and walked toward me everything breakable was broken except my photographic camera which i did not look at for two days for fear of what i might find leaving the men to get the loads and ponies together we walked on to a hamlet so destitute as not to be able to provide either wood or wadding for a splint i picked up a thick faggot however which had been dropped from a load and it was thinned into being usable with a hatchet the only tool the village possessed and after padding it with a pair of stockings and making a six-yard bandage out of a cotton garment i put up im's right arm which was broken just above the wrist in splints and made a sling out of one of the two towels which the rats had left to me i should have been glad to know korean enough to rate the gossiping mapu three men to two horses who allowed the accident to happen the animals always fight if they are left to themselves and loads and riders are nowhere one day mr yi had a bit of a finger taken off in a fight and if a strange brute had not kicked my stirrup iron which was bent by the blow instead of myself i should have had a broken ankle when we halted at midday the villagers tried hard to induce im to have his arm needled to let out the bad blood a most risky surgical proceeding which often destroys the usefulness of a limb for life and he was anxious for it but yielded to persuasion being delayed by this accident it was late when we started to cross the pass of ankil yung regarded as the most dangerous in korea owing to its liability to sudden fogs and violent storms three thousand three hundred forty six feet in altitude and said to be thirty li long the infamous path traverses a wild rocky glen with an impetuous torrent at its bottom and only a few wretched hamlets in which the hovels are indistinguishable from the millet and brushwood stacks along its length of several miles poverty limiting the people to the barest necessaries of life is the lot of the peasant in that region but i believe that his dirty and squalid habits give an impression of want which does not actually exist i doubt much whether any koreans are unable to provide themselves with two daily meals of millet with clothes sufficient for decency in summer and for warmth in winter and with fuel grass leaves twigs and weeds enough to keep their miserable rooms at a temperature of seventy degrees and more by means of the hot floor to the west the valley is absolutely closed in by a wall of peaks the bridle path a well-engineered road when it ascends the very steep ridge of the watershed in many zigzags rests for one hundred feet and descends the western side by seventy-five turns except in tibet i never saw so apparently insurmountable an obstacle but it does not present any real difficulty the ascent took seventy minutes rain fell very heavily but the superb view to the northeast was scarcely obscured at the top which is only one hundred feet wide there is a celebrated shrine to the demon of the past 
to him all travellers put up petitions for deliverance from the many malignant spirits who are waiting to injure them and for a safe descent the shrine contains many strips of paper inscribed with the names of those who have made special payments for special prayers and a few wreaths and posies of faded paper flowers the woman who lives in the one hovel on the pass makes a good living by receiving money from travellers who offer rice cakes and desire prayers the worship is nearly all done by proxy and the rice cakes do duty any number of times besides the shrine and a one-roomed hovel there are some open sheds made of millet stalks to give shelter during storms the Ankil Jung Pass is blocked by snow for three months of the year, but at other times is much used, in spite of its great height. Excellent potatoes are grown on the mountain slopes at an altitude exceeding 3,000 feet, and round Tok Chong they are largely cultivated and enter into the diet of the people, never having had the disease. Darkness came on prematurely with the heavy rain, and we asked the shrine-keeper to give us shelter for the night, but she said that to take in six men and a foreign woman was impossible, as she had only one room. But it was equally impossible for us to descend the pass in the darkness with tired ponies, and after half an hour's altercation the matter was arranged, Im, who retained his wits, securing for me a degree of privacy by hanging some heavy mats from a beam, giving me, I am sure, the lion's share of the apartment. Really, the accommodation was not much worse than usual, but though the mercury fell to the freezing point, the hot floor kept the inside temperature up to 83 degrees, and the dread of tigers on the part of my hostess forbade my having even a chink of the door open. The rain cleared off in time for the last sunset gleam on the distant mountains, which, when darkness fell on the pass, burned fiery red against a strip of pale green sky, taking on afterwards one by one the ashy look of death as the light died off from their snows. All about Ankil Jung the mountains are wooded to their summits with deciduous trees, the ubiquitous Pinus sinensis being rare. But to the northward, in the direction of Paik Tu San, the character of the scenery changes, and peaks and precipices of naked rock, and lofty mountain monoliths with snow-crowned ranges beyond, form by far the grandest view that I saw in this land of hill and valley. Then Im had to be attended to, and though I was very anxious about him, I could not be blind to the picturesqueness of the scene in the hovel, Mr. Yi sitting in my chair holding the candle, the soldier, with his face puckered with pain, squatting on the floor with his swollen arm lying on a writing-board on my lap, and no room to move. I failed there, as elsewhere, to get a better piece of wood for the splint, which was too short, and I could only get wadding for padding it by taking some out of Im's sleeve, and all the time, and afterwards, I was very anxious for fear that I had put the bandage on too tightly or too loosely, and that my want of experience would give the poor fellow a useless right arm. He was in severe pain all that night, but he was very plucky about it, made no fuss, and never allowed me to suffer in the slightest degree from his accident. Indeed, he was even more attentive than before. He said to Mr. Yi, the foreign woman looked so sorry and touched my arm as if I had been one of her own people, I shall do my best. And so he did. I had indulged in a long perspective of pheasant curries, and I must confess that when the prospect faded I felt a little dismal. To a traveller who carries no foreign food it makes a great difference to get a nice, hot, stimulating dish, even though it is served in the pot it is cooked in, after a ten hours cold ride. To my surprise I was never without curry for dinner, and though before the accident I had only cold rice for tiffin, after it I was never without something hot. The descent of Ankil Jung is very grand. The road leads into a wide valley with a fine stream, 
one side of which looks as if the mountains had dumped down all their available stones upon it, while the other is rich alluvial soil. Gold washing is carried on to a great extent along this stream, which is a tributary of the Taidong, and some of the workings show more care and method than usual, being pits neatly lined with stone in their upper parts. Eighty cents per day is the average earning of a gold seeker there. This valley terminates in pretty, broken country, with fine mountain views and picturesque cliffs along the river, on which the dark blue gloom of pines was lighted by the fading scarlet of the maple, and crimson streaks of the Amelopsis Vaichii brightened the russet into which the countless trailers which draped the rocks had passed. The increased fertility of the soil was denoted by the number of villages and hamlets on the road, and foot passengers in twos and threes gave something of life and movement. But it was remarkable that so soon after the harvest, and when the roads were in their best condition, there was no goods in transit, except such local productions as paper and tobacco, no strings of porters or ponies carrying goods into the interior from Pyongyang, no evidence of trade but that given by the peddlers going the round of the marketplaces. Along that road and elsewhere near the villages, there are tall poles branching at the top into a V, which are erected in the belief that they will guard the inhabitants from cholera and other pestilences. On that day's journey, at a crossroad, a small log with several holes like those of a mouse trap, one of them plugged doubly with bungs of wood, was lying on the path, and the Mapu were careful to step over it and lead their ponies over it, though it might easily have been avoided. Into the bunked hole the mutang or sorceress, by her arts, had inveigled a demon which was causing sickness in a family, and had corked him up. It is proper for passers-by to step over the log. At nightfall it is buried. That afternoon's ride was through extremely attractive country, small valley basins of rich stoneless soil, with brown hamlets nestling round them in calm, pine-sheltered folds of hills, which, though not high, are shapely, and were etherealized into purple beauty by the sinking sun, which turned the lake-like expanse of the Tai Dong at Mu Jin Tai, the beautifully situated halting place for the night, into a sheet of gold. With a splendid climate, an abundant but not superabundant rainfall, a fertile soil, a measure of freedom from civil war and robber bands, the Koreans ought to be a happy and fairly prosperous people. If squeezing, yamen runners and their exactions, and certain malign practices of officials can be put down with a strong hand, and the land tax is fairly levied and collected, and law becomes an agent for protection rather than an instrument of injustice, I see no reason why the Korean peasant should not be as happy and industrious as the Japanese peasant. But these are great ifs. Security for the gains of industry, from whatever quarter it comes, will, I believe, transform the limp apathetic native. Such ameliorations as have been made are owed to Japan, but she had not a free hand, and she was too inexperienced in the role which she undertook, and I believe honestly, to play, to produce a harmonious working scheme of reform. Besides, the men through whom any such scheme must be carried out are nearly universally corrupt, both by tradition and habit. Reform was jerky and piecemeal, and Japan irritated the people by meddlesomeness in small matters and suggested interferences with national habits, giving the impression, which I found prevailing everywhere, that her object is to denationalize the Koreans for purposes of her own. Travelers are much impressed with the laziness of the Koreans, but after seeing their energy and industry in Russian Manchuria, their thrift, and the abundant and comfortable furnishings of their houses, I greatly doubt whether it is to be regarded as a matter of temperament. 
every man in Korea knows that poverty is his best security, and that anything he possesses beyond that which provides himself and his family with food and clothing is certain to be taken from him by voracious and corrupt officials. It is only when the exactions of officials become absolutely intolerable and encroach upon his means of providing the necessaries of life that he resorts to the only method of redress in his power, which has a sort of counterpart in China. This consists of driving out, and occasionally in killing, the obnoxious and intolerable magistrate, or, as in a case which lately gained much notoriety, roasting his favorite secretary on a woodpile. The popular outburst, though under unusual provocation it may culminate in deeds of regrettable violence, is usually founded on right, and is an effective protest. Among the modes of squeezing are forced labor, doubling or trebling the amount of a legitimate tax, exacting bribes in cases of legitation, forced loans, etc. If a man is reported to have saved a little money, an official asks for the loan of it. If it is granted, the lender frequently never sees principal or interest. If it is refused, he is arrested thrown into prison on some charge invented for his destruction, and beaten until either he or his relations for him produce the sum demanded. To such an extent are these demands carried, that in northern Korea, where the winters are fairly severe, the peasants, when the harvest has left them with a few thousand cash, put them in a hole in the ground, and pour water into it, the frozen mass which results then being earthed over when it is fairly safe both from officials and thieves. End of section 30 Section 31 of Korea and Her Neighbors by Isabella L. Bird. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in May 2021. Chapter 29. Social Position of Women. Muchin Tai is a beautifully situated village and has something of a look of comfort. Up to that point, small boats can come up at all seasons, but there is almost no trade. The Tai Dong expands into a broad sheet of water on which the hills descend abruptly. There is a ferry, and we drove our ponies into the ferry boat and yelled for the ferryman. After a time he appeared on the top of the bank, but absolutely declined to take us over for any money. He would have nothing to do with a foreigner, he said, and he would not be implicated with a Japanese. So we put ourselves across, and the Mapu was so angry that they threw his poles into the river. Passing through very pretty country, and twice crossing the Tai Dong, we halted at the town of Sun Chon, a magistracy with a deplorably ruinous yamen. All these official buildings have seen better days. Their courts are spacious, and the double-roofed gateways, with their drum towers, as well as the central hall of the yamen, still retain a certain look of stateliness, though paint, lacquer, and gilding have long ago disappeared from the elaborately arranged beams and carved wood of the roofs, and the fretwork screening the interiors is always shabby and broken. About the Sunchon Yamen and all others, there are crowds of runners, writers, soldiers in coarse ragged uniforms, young men of the Yangban class in spotless white garments, lounging or walking with the swinging gait befitting their position, while the decayed and forlorn rooms in the courtyard are filled with petty officials, smoking long pipes and playing cards. To judge from the crowds of attendants, the walking hither and thither, the hurrying in various directions with manuscripts, and the din of drums and fifes when the great gate is open and closed, one would think that nothing less than the business of an empire was transacted within the ruinous portals. 
soldiers writers yamen runners and men of the yangban and literary classes combined with the loafers of the town to compose a crowd which by its buzzing and shouting and tearing off the paper from my latticed door gave me a fatiguing and hideous two hours a korean crowd being only unbearable when it is led by men of the literary class who as in china indulge in every sort of vulgar impertinence eventually i was smuggled into the women's apartments where i was victimized in other ways by insatiable curiosity the women of the lower classes in korea are ill-bred and unmannerly far removed from the gracefulness of the same class in japan or the reticence and kindliness of the chinese peasant women their clothing is extremely dirty as if the men had a monopoly of their ceaseless laundry work which everywhere goes on far into the night every brookside has its laundresses squatting on flat stones dipping the soiled clothes in the water lying them on flat stones in tightly rolled bundles and beating them with flat paddles a previous process consisting of steeping them in a lay made of wood ashes bleached under the brilliant sun and very slightly glazed with rice starch after beaten for a length of time with short quick taps on a wooden roller with club-shaped laundry sticks common white cotton looks like dull white satin and has a dazzling whiteness which always reminds me of st mark's words concerning the raiment at the transfiguration so as no fuller on earth can white them this wearing of white clothes and especially of white wadded clothes in winter entails very severe and incessant labor on the women the coats have to be unpicked and put together again each time they are washed and though some of the long seams are often joined with paste there is still much sewing to be done besides this the korean peasant woman makes all the clothing of the household does all the cooking husks and cleans rice with a heavy pestle and mortar carries heavy loads to market on her head draws water in remote districts works in the fields rises early and takes rest late spins and weaves and as a rule has many children who are not weaned till the age of three the peasant woman may be said to have no pleasures she is nothing but a drudge till she can transfer some of the drudgery to her daughter-in-law at thirty she looks fifty and at forty is frequently toothless even the love of personal adornment fades out of her life at a very early age beyond the daily routine of life it is probable that her thoughts never stray except to the demons who are supposed to people earth and air and whom it is her special duty to propitiate it is really difficult to form a general estimate of the position of women in korea absolute seclusion is the inflexible rule among the upper classes the ladies have their own courtyards and apartments towards which no windows from the men's apartments must look no allusion must be made by a visitor to the females of the household inquiries after their health would be a gross breach of etiquette and politeness requires that they should not be supposed to exist women do not receive any intellectual training and in every class are regarded as being of a very inferior order nature having in the estimation of the korean man who holds a sort of dual philosophy marked woman as his inferior the youth's primer historical summaries and the little learning impress this view upon him in the schools and as he begins to mix with men this estimate of women receives daily corroboration the seclusion of women was introduced five centuries ago by the present dynasty in a time of great social corruption for the protection of the family and has probably been continued not as a korean frankly told mr heber jones because men distrust their wives but because they distrust each other and with good reason for the immorality of the cities and of the upper classes almost exceeds belief thus all young women and all older women except those of the lowest class 
are secluded within the inner courts of the houses by a custom which has more than the force of law to go out suitably concealed at night or on occasions when it is necessary to travel or to make a visit in a rigidly closed chair are the only outings of a korean woman of the middle and upper classes and the low-class woman only goes out for purposes of work the murdered queen told me in allusion to my own korean journeys that she knew nothing of korea or even of the capital except on the route of the cordon daughters have been put to death by their fathers wives by their husbands and women have even committed suicide according to dalet when strange men whether by accident or design have even touched their hands and quite lately a serving woman gave as her reason for remissness in attempting to save her mistress who perished in a fire that in the confusion a man had touched the lady making her not worth saving the law may not enter the women's apartments a noble hiding himself in his wife's rooms cannot be seized for any crime except that of rebellion a man wishing to repair his roof must notify his neighbors lest by any chance he should see any of their women after the age of seven boys and girls part company and the girls are rigidly secluded seeing none of the male sex except their fathers and brothers until the date of marriage after which they can only see their own and their husband's near male relations girl children even among the very poor are so successfully hidden away that in somewhat extensive korean journeys i never saw one girl who looked above the age of six except hanging listlessly about in the women's rooms and the brightness which girl life contributes to social existence is unknown in the country but i am far from saying that the women fret and groan under this system or crave for the freedom which european women enjoy seclusion is the custom of centuries their idea of liberty is peril and i quite believe that they think that they are closely guarded because they are valuable chattels one intelligent woman when i pressed her hard to say what they thought of our customs in the matter replied we think that your husbands don't care for you very much concubinage is a recognized institution but not a respected one the wife or mother of a man not infrequently selects the concubine who in many cases is looked upon by the wife as a proper appendage of her husband's means or position much as a carriage or a butler might be with us the offspring in these cases are under a serious social stigma and until lately have been excluded from some desirable positions legally the korean is a strict monogamist and even when a widower marries again and there are children by the second marriage those of the first wife retain special rights there are no native schools for girls and though women of the upper classes learn to read the native script the number of korean women who can read is estimated at two in a thousand it appears that a philosophy largely imported from china superstitions regarding demons the education of men illiteracy a minimum of legal rights and inexorable custom have combined to give woman as low a status in civilized korea as in any of the barbarous countries in the world yet there is no doubt that the korean woman in addition to being a born intrigant exercises a certain direct influence especially as mother and mother-in-law and in the arrangement of marriages her rights are few and depend on custom rather than law she now possesses the right of remarriage and that of remaining unmarried till she is sixteen and she can refuse permission to her husband for his concubines to occupy the same house with herself she is powerless to divorce her husband conjugal fidelity typified by the goose the symbolic figure at a wedding being a feminine virtue solely her husband may cast her off for seven reasons incurable disease theft childlessness infidelity jealousy 
incompatibility with her parents-in-law, and a quarrelsome disposition. She may be sent back to her father's house for any one of these causes. It is believed, however, that desertion is far more frequent than divorce. By custom rather than law she has certain recognized rights, as to the control of children, redress in case of damage, etc. Domestic happiness is a thing she does not look for. The Korean has a house, but no home. The husband has his life apart. Common ties of friendship and external interest are not known. His pleasure is taken in company with male acquaintances and gesang, and the marriage relationship is briefly summarized in the remark of a Korean gentleman in conversation with me on the subject. We marry our wives, but we love our concubines. End of section 31section thirty two of korea and her neighbors by isabella l bird this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by avai in may two thousand twenty one chapter thirty exorcists and dancing women at cha san a magistracy we rejoined the road from which we had diverged on the northward journey it is a quiet decayed place though in a good agricultural country. As I had been there before, the edge of curiosity was blunted, and there was no mobbing. The people gave a distressing account of their sufferings from the Chinese soldiers, who robbed them unscrupulously, took what they wanted without paying, and maltreated the women. The Koreans deserted, through fright, the adjacent ferry village of O Ching Gang, where we previously crossed the Taidong, and it was held by fifty-three Chinese, being an important post. Two Japanese scouts appeared on the other side of the river, fired, and the Chinese detachment broke and fled. At Cha San, as elsewhere, the people expressed intense hatred of the Japanese, going so far as to say that they would not leave one of them alive, but, as in all other places, they bore unwilling testimony to the good conduct of the soldiers and the regularity with which the commissariat paid for supplies. The Japanese detachments were being withdrawn from the posts along that road, and we passed several well-equipped detachments, always preceded by bulls loaded with red blankets. The men were dressed in heavy grey ulsters with deep fur-lined collars, and had very thick felt gloves. They marched as if on parade, and their officers were remarkable for their smartness. When they halted for dinner, they found everything ready, and had nothing to do but stack their arms and eat. The peasant women went on with their avocations as usual. In that district, and in the region about Tok Chon, the women seclude themselves in monstrous hats, like our wicker garden sentry boxes, but without bottoms. These extraordinary coverings are seven feet long, five broad, and three deep, and shroud the figure from head to foot. Heavy rain fell during the night, and though the following day was beautiful, the road was a deep quagmire, so infamously bad that when only two and a half hours from Pyongyang, we had to stop at the wayside inn of Anjing Miryok, where I slept in a granary only screened from the stable by a bamboo mat, and had the benefit of the squealing and vindictive sounds which accompanied numerous abortive fights. If possible, the next day exceeded its predecessors in beauty, and though the drawbacks of Korean travelling are many, this journey had been so bright and so singularly prosperous, except for Im's accident, which, however, brought out some of the best points of Korean character, that I was even sorry to leave the miserable little hostelry and conclude the expedition, and part with the Mapu, who throughout had behaved extremely well. The next morning, crossing the battlefield once more, and passing through the desolations which war had wrought, I reached my old, cold, but comparatively comfortable quarters at Pyongyang, where I remained for six days. While the river remained open, 
a small Korean steamer of uncertain habits, the Haryong, plied nominally between Pyongyang and Chemulpo, but actually ran from Posan, a point about sixty li lower down the Taitong, which above it is too shallow and full of sandbanks for vessels of any draught, necessitating the transshipment of all goods not brought up by junks of small tonnage. There was, however, no telegraph between Posan and Pyongyang. No one knew when the steamer arrived except by cargo coming up the river, and she only remained a few hours, so that my visit to Pyongyang was agitated by the fear of losing her and having to make a long land journey when time was precious. There was no Korean post, and the Japanese military post and telegraph office absolutely refused to carry messages or letters for civilians. Wild rumors, of which there were a goodly crop every hour, were the substitute for news. A subject of special interest and inquiry at Pyongyang was mission work as carried on by American missionaries. At Seoul, it is far more difficult to get into touch with it, as, being older, it has naturally more of religious conventionality. But I will take this opportunity of saying that longer and more intimate acquaintance only confirmed the high opinion I early formed of the large body of missionaries in Seoul, of their earnestness and devotion to their work, of the energetic, hopeful, and patient spirit in which it is carried on, of the harmony prevailing among the different denominations, and the cordial and sympathetic feeling towards the Koreans. The interest of many of the missionaries in Korean history, folklore, and customs, as evidenced by the pages of the valuable monthly, the Korean Repository, is also very admirable, and a traveller in Korea must apply to them for information vainly sought elsewhere. Christian missions were unsuccessful in Pyongyang. It was a very rich and very immoral city. More than once it turned out some of the missionaries and rejected Christianity with much hostility. Strong antagonism prevailed. The city was thronged with gesang, courtesans and sorcerers, and was notorious for its wealth and infamy. The Methodist mission was broken up for a time, and in six years the Presbyterians only numbered twenty-eight converts. Then came the war, the destruction of Pyongyang, its desertion by its inhabitants, the ruin of its trade, the reduction of its population from 60,000 or 70,000 to 15,000, and the flight of the few Christians. Since the war there had been a very great change. There had been 28 baptisms, and some of the most notorious evil livers among the middle classes, men shunned by other men for their exceeding wickedness, were leading pure and righteous lives. There were 140 catechumens under instruction, and subject to a long period of probation before receiving baptism, and the temporary church, though enlarged during my absence, was so overcrowded that many of the worshippers were compelled to remain outside. The offertories were liberal. Footnote. The Seoul Christian News, a paper recently started, gave its readers an account of the Indian famine, with the result that the Christians in the magistracy of Changyang raised among themselves eighty-four dollars for the sufferers in a land they had hardly heard of, some of the women sending their solid silver rings to be turned into cash. In Seoul, the native Presbyterian churches gave eighty dollars to the same fund, of which twenty dollars were collected by a new congregation organized entirely by Koreans. I am under the impression that the liberality of the Korean Christians, in proportion to their means, far exceeds our own. End footnote. In the dilapidated extramural premises occupied by the missionaries, thirty men were living for twenty-one days, two from each of fifteen villages, all convinced of the truth of Christianity, and earnestly receiving instruction in Christian fact and doctrine. They were studying for six hours daily with teachers, and for a far longer time amongst themselves, 
and had meetings for prayer, singing, and informal talk each evening. I attended three of these, and as Mr. Moffat interpreted for me, I was placed in touch with much of what was unusual and interesting, and learned more of missions in their earlier stage than anywhere else. Besides the thirty men from the villages, the Christians and catechumens from the city crowded the room and doorways. Two missionaries sat on the floor at one end of the room with a kerosene lamp mounted securely on two wooden pillows in front of them. Then there were a few candles on the floor, centers of closely packed groups. Hymns were howled in many keys to familiar tunes, several Koreans prayed, bowing their foreheads to the earth in reverence, after which some gave accounts of how the gospel reached their villages, chiefly through visits from the few Pyongyang Christians who were scattered abroad, and then two men who seemed very eloquent as well as fluent, and riveted the attention of all, gave narratives of two other men who they believed were possessed with devils, and said the devils had been driven out a few months previously by united prayer, and that the foul spirits were adjured in the name of Jesus to come out, and that the men trembled and turned cold as the devils left them, never to return, and that both became Christians along with many who saw them. A good many men came from distant villages one afternoon to ask for Christian teaching, and in the evening one after another got up and told how a refugee from Pyongyang had come to his village and had told them that they were both wicked and foolish to worship demons, and that they were wrongdoers, and that there is a Lord of Heaven who judges wrongdoing, but that He is as loving as any father, and that they did not know what to think, but that in some places twenty and more were meeting daily to worship, the highest, and that many of the women had buried the demon fetishes, and that they wanted someone to go and teach them how to worship the true God. A young man told how his father, nearly eighty years old, had met Mr. Moffat by the roadside, and hearing from him some good things, had gone home saying he had heard good news, great news, and had got the books, and that he had become a Christian and lived a good life, and had called his neighbours together to hear the news, and would not rest till his son had come to be taught in the good news, and take back a teacher. An elderly man who had made a good living by sorcery came and gave Mr. Moffat the instruments of his trade, saying he had served devils all his life, but now he knew that they were wicked spirits and he was serving the true God. On the same afternoon, four requests for Christian teaching came to the missionaries, each signed by from fifteen to forty men. At all these evening meetings the room was crammed within and without by men, reverent and earnest in manner, some of whom had been shunned for their wickedness even in a city, the smoke of which, in her palmy days, was said to go up like the smoke of Sodom, but who, transformed by a power outside themselves, were then leading exemplary lives. There were groups in the dark, groups round the candles on the floor, groups in the doorways, and every face was aglow except that of poor, bewildered Im. One old man, with his forehead in the dust, prayed like a child that, as the letter bearing to New York an earnest request for more teachers was on its way, the wind and sea might waft it favourably, and that when it was read the eyes of the foreigners might be open, to see the sore need of people in a land where no one knows anything and where all believe in devils and are dying in the dark. As I looked upon those lighted faces, wearing an expression strongly contrasting with the dull, dazed look of apathy which is characteristic of the Korean, it was impossible not to recognize that it was the teaching of the apostolic doctrines of sin judgment to come, and divine love which had brought about such results, all the more remarkable because, according to the missionaries, 
a large majority of those who had renounced demon worship and were living in the fear of the true god had been attracted to christianity in the first instance by the hope of gain this and almost unvarying testimony to the same effect confirm me in the opinion that when people talk of nations craving for the gospel stretching out pleading hands for it or a thirst for god or longing for the living waters they are using words which in that connection have no meaning that there are seekers after righteousness here and there i do not doubt but i believe that the one craving of the far east is for money that unrest is only in the east a synonym for poverty and that the spiritual instincts have yet to be created on the sunday i went with dr scranton of seoul to the first regular service ever held for women in pyongyang there were a number present all demon worshippers some of them attracted by the sight of a foreign woman it was impossible to have a formal service with people who had not the most elementary ideas of god of prayer of moral evil and of good it was not possible to secure their attention they were destitute of religious ideas an elderly matron who acted as a sort of spokeswoman said they thought perhaps god is a big demon and he might help them to get back their lost goods that service was mission work in its earliest stage on returning from a service in the afternoon where there were crowds of bright intelligent looking worshippers we came upon one of the most important ceremonies connected with the popular belief in demons the exorcism of an evil spirit which was supposed to be the cause of a severe illness never by night or day on my two visits to pyongyang had i been out of hearing of the roll of the sorcerer's drum with the loud vibratory clash of cymbals as an intermittent accompaniment such sounds attracted us to the place of exorcism in a hovel with an open door a man lay very ill the space in front was matted and enclosed by low screens within which were korean tables loaded with rice cakes boiled rice stewed chicken sprouted beans and other delicacies in this open space squatted three old women two of whom beat large drums shaped like hour glasses while the third clashed large cymbals facing them was the mutang or sorceress dressed in rose pink silk with a buff gauze robe with its sleeves trailing much on the ground over it pieces of paper resembling the shinto gohe decorated her hair and a curious cap of buff gauze with red patches upon it completed the not inelegant costume she carried a fan but it was only used occasionally in one of the dances she carried over her left shoulder a stick painted with bands of bright colors from which hung a gong which she beat with a similar stick executing at the same time a slow rhythmic movement accompanied by a chant from time to time one of the ancient drummers gathered on one plate pieces from all the others and scattered them to the four winds for the spirits to eat invoking them saying do not trouble this house any more and we will again appease you by offerings the mutang is of course according to the belief of those who seek her services possessed by a powerful demon and by means of her incantations might induce this demon to evict the one which was causing the sickness by aiding her exorcisms but where the latter is particularly obstinate she may require larger fees and more offerings in order that she may use incantations for bringing to her aid a yet more powerful demon than her own the exorcism lasted fourteen hours until four the next morning when the patient began to recover a crowd chiefly composed of women and children stood round the fence the children imbibing devilry from their infancy i was not at a regular inn in pyongyang but at a broker's house with a yard to myself nominally but which was by no means private im generally and not roughly requested the people to move on 
but he made two exceptions, one being in favour of a madwoman of superior appearance and apparel, who haunted me on my second visit, hanging about the open front of my room, and following me to the mission house and elsewhere. She said that I was her grandmother, and that she must go with me everywhere, and, like many mad people, she had an important and mysterious communication to make, which, for obvious reasons, never reached me. She was the concubine of a late governor of the city, and not having escaped before its capture, went mad from horror at seeing the Chinese spitted on the bayonets of the Japanese. She carried a long bodkin, and went through distressing pantomimes of running people through with it. The other exception was in favour of Gesang, upon whose presence Im looked quite approvingly, and evidently thought I did. Pyongyang has always been famous for the beauty and accomplishments of its Gesang, singing and dancing girls, resembling in many respects the geishas of Japan, but correctly speaking, they mostly belong to the government and are supported by the Korean treasury. At the time of my two first sojourns in Seoul, about seventy of them were attached to the royal palace. They were under the control of the same government department as that with which the official musicians are connected. As a poor man gifted with many sons, for whom he cannot provide, sometimes presents one to the government as a eunuch, so he may give a girl to be a gesang. The gesang are trained from a very early age in such accomplishments as other Korean women lack, and which will ensure their attractiveness, such as playing on various musical instruments, singing, dancing, reading, reciting, writing, and fancy work. As their destiny is to make time pass agreeably for men of the upper classes, this amount of education is essential, though a Korean does not care how blank and undeveloped the mind of his wife is. The Gesang are always elegantly dressed, as they were when they came to see me, even through the mud of the Pyongyang streets, and as they have not known seclusion, their manners with both sexes have a graceful ease. Their dancing, like that of most Oriental countries, consists chiefly of posturing, and is said by those foreigners who have seen it, to be perfectly free from impropriety. Dr. Allen, secretary to the U.S. legation at Seoul, in a paper in the Korean Repository for 1886, describes among the dances which specially interest foreigners at the entertainments at the Royal Palace, one known as the Lotus Dance. In this he writes, A tub is brought in containing a large lotus flower just ready to burst open. Two imitation storks then come in, each one being a man very cleverly disguised. These birds flap their wings, snap their beaks, and dance round in admiration of the beautiful bud which they evidently intend to pluck as soon as they have enjoyed it sufficiently in anticipation. Their movements all this time are very graceful, and they come closer and closer to the flower, keeping time to the soft music. At last the proper time arrives, the flower is plucked, when, as the pink petals fall back, out steps a little gesang to the evident amazement of the birds and to the intense delight of the younger spectators. The sword and dragon dances are also extremely popular, and on great occasions the performance is never complete without throwing the ball, which consists in a series of graceful arm movements before a painted arch, after which the gesang march in procession before the king, and the successful dancers receive presents. Though the most beautiful and attractive gesang come from Pyongyang, they are found throughout the country. From the king down to the lowest official who can afford the luxury, the presence of gesang is regarded at every entertainment as indispensable to the enjoyment of the guests. They appear at official dinners at the foreign office, and at the palace are the chief entertainers, and sing and dance at the many parties which are given by Koreans at the picnic resorts near Seoul, and though attached to the prefectures and various other departments, 
may be hired by gentlemen to give fascination to their feasts. Their training and non-secluded position place them, however, outside of the reputable classes, and though in Japan geishas often become the wives of nobles and even of statesmen, no Korean man would dream of raising a gesang to such a position. Dr. Allen, who has had special opportunities of becoming acquainted with the inner social life of Korea, says that they are the source of much heartburning to the legal but neglected wife, who in no case is the wife of her husband's choice, and that Korean folklore abounds with stories of discord arising in families from attachments to gesang, and of ardent and prolonged devotion on the part of young noblemen to those girls, who they are prevented from marrying by rigid custom. There is a Korean tale called The Swallow King's Rewards, in which a man is visited with the Ten Plagues of Korea for maltreating a wounded swallow, and in it Gesang are represented along with Mutang as among the ten curses of the land. Dr. Allen, to whom I owe this fact, writes, Doubtless they are so considered by many a lonely wife, as well as by the fathers who mourn to see their sons wasting their substance in riotous living, as they doubtless did themselves when they were young. The house in which I had quarters was much resorted to by merchants for whom my host transacted brokerage business, and entertainments were the order of the day. Mr. Yi was invited to dinner daily, and on the last evening entertained all who had invited him. Such meals cost per head as much as a dinner at the St. James's restaurant. Noise seems essential to these gatherings. The men shout at the top of their voices. There is an enormous amount of visiting and entertaining among men in the cities. Some public men keep open house, giving their servants as much as sixty dollars a day for the entertainment of guests. Men who are in easy circumstances go continually from one house to another to kill time. They never talk politics, it is too dangerous, but retail the latest gossip of the court or city, and the witticisms attributed to great men, and tell, hear, and invent news. The front rooms of houses in which the men live are open freely to all comers. In some circles, though it is said to a far less extent than formerly, men meet and talk over what we should call questions of literary criticism, compare poetic compositions, the ability to compose a page of poetry being the grand result of Korean education, and discuss the meaning of celebrated works all literature being in Chinese. The common people meet in the streets, the house fronts, and the inns. They ask each other endless questions, of a nature that we should think most impertinent, regarding each other's business, work, and money transactions, and for the latest news. It is every man's business to hear or create all the news he can. What he hears he embellishes by lies and exaggerations. Korea is the country of wild rumors. What a Korean knows, or rather hears, he tells. According to Père Dallet, he does not know the meaning of reserve, though he is utterly devoid of frankness. Men live in company in each other's houses. Domestic life is unknown. The women in the inner rooms receive female visitors, and the girl children are present. The boys at a very early age are removed to the men's apartments where they learn from the conversation they hear that every man who respects himself must regard women with contempt. We left Pyongyang for Posan in a very small boat in which six people and their luggage were uncomfortably packed and cramped. One of the two boatmen was literally down with fever but with one, and a strong ebb tide, we accomplished twenty miles in six hours, and were well pleased to find the Haryong lying at anchor, as we had not been able to get any definite information concerning her, and I never believed in her till I saw her. The Taidong has some historic interest, 
for up its broad waters sailed Kija, or Kitze, with his army of five thousand men on the way to found Pyongyang and Korean civilization, and down it fled Ki Jun, the last king of the first dynasty, from the forces of Wei Man descending from the north. Pyongyang impressed me, as it did Consul Karls, with its natural suitability for commerce, and this Tai Dong, navigable up to the city for small junks, is the natural outlet for beans and cotton, some of which find their way to Nuchwang for shipment, for the rich iron ore which lies close to the river banks at Kai Chon, for the gold of Kermsan only twenty miles off, for the abounding coal of the immediate neighbourhood, for the hides which are now carried on men's backs to Chemul Po, and for the products of what is said to be a considerable silk industry. In going down the river, something is seen of the original size of Pyongyang, for the earth wall on solid masonry, built, it is said, by Kitze three thousand years ago, follows the right bank of the Taidong for about four miles, before it turns away to the north, to terminate at the foot of the hill on which is the reputed grave of its builder. This extends in that direction possibly three miles beyond the present wall. The plain through which the river runs is fertile and well cultivated, though the shining mudflats at low tide are anything but prepossessing. Various rivers, enabling boats of light draught to penetrate the country, most of them rising in the picturesque mountain ranges which descend on the plain, specially on its western side, join the Taidong. Much had been said of the Haryong. I was told I should be all right if I could get the Haryong, that the Haryong's a most comfortable little boat, she has ten staterooms, and as we approached her in the mist, very wet and stiff from the length of time spent in a cramped position, I conjured up visions of comfort and even luxury, which were not to be realized. She was surrounded by Japanese junks, Japanese soldiers crowded her gangways, and Japanese officers were directing the loading. We hooked on to the junks and lay in the rain for an hour, nobody taking the slightest notice of us. Mr. Yi then scrambled on board, and there was another half-hour's delay, which took us into the early darkness. He reappeared, saying there was no cabin and we must go on shore. But there was no place to sleep on shore, and it was the last steamer, so I climbed on board and Im hurried in the baggage. It was raining and blowing, and we were huddled on the wet deck like steerage passengers, Japanese soldiers and commissariat officers there as elsewhere in Korea, masters of the situation. Mr. Yi was frantic that he, a government official, and one from whom the Japanese had to ask a hundred favors a month, should be treated with such indignity. The vessel was hired by the Japanese commissariat department to go to Nagasaki, calling it Chimulpo, and we were really, though unintentionally, interlopers. There was truly no room for me, and the arrangement whereby I received shelter was essentially Japanese. I lived in a minute saloon with the commissariat officers, and fed precariously, Im dealing out to me, at long intervals, the remains of a curry which he had had the forethought to bring. There was a Korean purser, but the poor dazed fellow was nowhere, being totally superseded by a brisk young mannequin who, in the intervals of business, came to me, notebook in hand, that I might help him to enlarge his English vocabulary. The only sign of vitality that the limp, displaced purser showed was to exclaim with energy more than once, I hate these Japanese, they've taken our own ships. Fortunately, the sea was quite still, and the weather was dry and fine. Even Yon Yung Pa Da, a disagreeable stretch of ocean off the Wang Hai coast, was quiet, the halt of nearly a day off the new treaty port of Chin Nam Po, where the mud flats extend far out from the shore, was not disagreeable, 
and we reach the familiar harbour of Chemulpo by a glorious sunset on the frosty evening of the third day from Posan, the voyage in a small Asiatic transport having turned out better than could have been expected. Itinerary Seoul to Koyang, 40 li Paju, 40 li Omok, 40 li Ohurchukkyo, 30 li Songdo, 10 li Ohungsukju, 30 li Kunko Kai, 30 li Tolmaru, 35 li Anshungpapal, 25 li Shuohung, 30 li Hungsho Wan, 30 li Pongsan, 40 li Huangju, 40 li Kurmon Tari, 30 li Chidol Pa Pal, 40 li Pyongyang, 30 li Mori Ko Kai, 30 li Liangyang Chang, 30 li Cha San, 30 li Shouyang Yi, 40 li Hakkai Oil, 35 li Ka Chang, 35 li Huok Kuri, 40 li Tok Chon, 30 li Shur Chong, 30 li An Kil Yung, 20 li Shil Yi, 40 li Mo Chin Tai, 25 li Sun Chon, 35 li Cha San, 30 li Xiang Yang Chon, 40 li An Chin Miryok, 30 li Pyongyang, 20 li Total land journey, 1060 li End of section 32